Greetings, I'm Lindsay Pogue, author of The Savage Earth Chronicles. You are about to listen to book one, The Darkest Winter. This is Elle and Jackson's story and one of my all-time favorites. Out of 30 books that I've written, Jackson is probably my favorite character, so I'm excited for you to dive in. Before I get started, I wanted to alert you that there are ads if you do not have a YouTube premium account, but I promise they won't be too crazy, but please, free book, some ads, hopefully it's a good trade-off. Now, this is a very long book, so it is broken up into two parts, and I will go ahead and link to part two below. So be sure that you like and subscribe, and oh, there are seven books in the series, so if you like this book, be sure that you look in the description for the other books in the series, and as they go up on YouTube, if they aren't already there, I'll be sure to link to them. Enjoy the ride. The Darkest Winter Savage North Chronicles, Book One, an ending world novel, written by Lindsay Pogue, narrated by Sarah Ruth Thomas and Luis Bermudez. Prologue, L. I struggled to open my eyes and discern where I was. Crammed, head throbbing. I could barely make out the windshield as I blinked to focus. If I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times. It's all a conspiracy. The male voice sounded far away, frenzied yet familiar. <laughs> you thought this was a democracy, that we had a say in what happened at this country? Who were you working your fingers to the bone for before the shit hit the fan? You're delusional if you think it was for yourself. My mind spun and cold air nipped at my skin. The voice was laughing, an echo I'd heard many times before, grating and almost hysterical. The radio crackled. Here you all thought I was the delusional one. Thud. Thud. Blood pulsed through my head and ears, gravity pulling on me as I hung upside down. Thud. Thud. You think everyone going mad was accidental? The joke's on you, my friend. The joke is on you. The clawing fear dulled as I tried to remember what happened. I was driving. My arms hung heavy as a biting pain shot up my tendons, sending me back to the cusp of unconsciousness. Wake up, world. Or whatever's left of us. You are not in control. She never were. It was all a smokescreen, and they played you like my Uncle Earl's fiddle. The radio crackled again, and his voice faded in and out as I blinked, registering the shuffling sound beside me. Sophie, I rasped. One boot, two boots, upside down. They were covered in blood. It was not Sophie. I needed to scream, to get out of the vehicle and find the kids. But all I could think about was endless sleep. If you survived the pandemic, it was for a reason. The radio voice looped through my head as blackness consumed me. Welcome to the goddamn apocalypse. Part One. Four months earlier. December 7th. Chapter One. L. December 7th. I couldn't stop my foot from bouncing as Dr. Rothman and I sat in silence. The pipes in the wall clanked as the heat kicked on and off, trying to keep up with the Arctic temperatures seeping into the building. The soft gray hue of the setting sun filled the room, washing over the mahogany bookshelves and mauve carpet. L, Dr. Rothman prompted from her chair across from me. Do you want to say more about your dreams? I leaned back into the couch and picked at the loose thread in the cushion. The thread had been there since my first visit nearly a year ago, and I wanted to cut it for her every visit since, but it didn't seem appropriate. I'm not sure what else there is to say, I told her. It's like I hear things in my room, see a dark form standing at the end of my bed, and I can't move or speak. It's an ominous presence, she clarified. 
not like a guardian watching over you, but something dark. Monstrous, perhaps? Monstrous was a word for him, but I shrugged. It's just a man. Is it him? I peeled my eyes away from the maddening cushion string and looked at my therapist. Her straight black bob brushed against her shoulders as she lowered her brow, awaiting my reply. She was the most patient, immaculately put-together person I knew. But then, I didn't know very many people. I told myself I liked it that way. L? I stared at her. Was it possible to dislike someone and feel gratitude at the same time? I wondered it every time I was in her office. I hated the expectant expression that always creased her brow, both stern and soft, and the way she made me feel beholden to her. I'd made a point to never feel beholden to anyone ever again. But she was different. You requested this meeting today, she reminded me. Yes, I said, clearing my throat. It's him. It's always him. I can feel his presence even if I can't always see him in the darkness. Does he ever move? My hair stood on end, imagining he stood beside me now. I knew how it would feel. A cold sweat, frozen in place, and unable to breathe. Yes, he moves. But he doesn't touch you? Not in my dreams, he watches. I stared at my fingernails, the nude paint chipped from picking at it the minute I got off the ship. I could remember the last time I let him touch me, like it was yesterday. It was as if his skin was still beneath my fingernails, and I wanted to scrub it away. It's like he's haunting me. Dr. Rothman shifted in her chair, the leather protesting as she swung her right leg over her left. You think it's brought on by his recent death, she guessed, drumming up an image of my stepfather, good old Dr. John, all over again. I was more compelled to explain than to agree. Sometimes I blink, and he's still there. Dr. Rothman lifted her chin. L, have you ever heard of sleep paralysis? When a person's caught between sleep and wakefulness? Yes. I said. I've heard of it. I tucked my dark hair behind my ear, uncertain I liked where she was going with this. Then you might know it's common, especially in people with poor sleeping habits or who struggle to get a good rest. You think that's why Dr. John keeps visiting me in my sleep? It didn't seem likely, but then I didn't have a doctorate in psychology like she did. Well... You said yourself, you feel awake, and it feels like he's there, real, and inside your room. She pursed her lips, which meant she was in analysis mode. In sleep paralysis, the inability to speak and move generates fear, naturally, which feeds panic. It's common to hallucinate apparitions, sometimes even hear them. Well, I definitely don't see ghosts or aliens, I said wryly but I had heard him whisper my name in my sleep. The hair on my arms stood on end again, and I rubbed the back of my neck. No, you see something much worse, don't you? I cleared my throat. She got me there. I'd take the boogeyman over Dr. John standing next to my bed any day. The heater kicked on again, and I stared at the vent in the floor, listening to its soothing hum as my mind drifted. I panic, I admitted. I blink like it will make him disappear. But he's still there, like he's really in my room. My heartbeat thumped harder and louder in my ears, remembering. But you've had episodes like this before, with other dark figures who were not your stepfather. Not for a while. Dr. Rothman's mouth quirked in the corner, pleased. So you're enjoying the shooting range then? Of course she was pleased. The shooting range had been her idea. To give me a sense of control in my life. My safety in particular. 
I could practically feel the weight of a pistol in my hand, the strain of my forearms as I pulled the trigger. It was power and control. It was sanity when my thoughts were dark and desperate. Yes, the shooting range has been helping. Until now. Good. What about relationships? Have you explored any since Ben? I snorted. No, I don't think I'm ready for that. The early stages of a relationship were easy. They were mostly physical, and you could be whoever you wanted in the beginning. It was being real with someone I wasn't ready for again. The crumpled brow, the pitying gaze, the unspoken judgment, the self-loathing that followed. Self-discipline is hard for you, Elle. Six months ago, you might have rushed into another relationship, but you haven't. Restraint is a big step. Dr. Rothman smiled this time, big and wide, the way a proud mother might. Maybe she was the closest thing I had to a mother, even if she was probably 35, only 10 years older than me. To a stranger, we might have resembled each other with our slender frames and brunette hair, though she was more like six feet to my five foot seven. What about your letters to your mother? Are you still writing them? Dr. Rothman blinked, waiting. Though I hated to disappoint her, I shook my head. I'm not sure I see the point. She'll never get them. I haven't heard from her since the day she left. I don't even know if she's alive. My mother took off when I was six and never looked back, leaving me and Jenny with the worst kind of devil, one that everyone else adored. My visit wasn't about my mother, though. I got a call from his estate, I blurted, remembering the older woman's voice on the other end of the line. This is Sandy Fields calling for a Miss Eleanor St. James. I'd been playing her words over and over for the past four days, uncertain what to do. Dr. John left me everything. Did he? Dr. Rothman lifted an eyebrow. It was nice to know my stepfather could still surprise her, too. His executor wants me to go to Eagle River to deal with his affairs. I met her blue gaze. Anywhere near Anchorage was the last place I wanted to be. So it's not just the dreams that have been bothering me, I admitted. She was pensive a moment, turning her pen over in her hand before she leaned forward, resting her elbows on her lap. While I didn't expect, nor would I wish, for your past to show up at the foot of your bed, I think it's good these things are moving closer to the surface, instead of weighing you down in a past you can't control, lingering in a childhood you didn't choose. It's your adulthood that matters, right? The now. The monsters from your childhood can only haunt you if you let them, and this is the closing of a huge part of your life. What are you saying? She clasped her hands in her lap. I think the more you try to understand the monsters you've created in your mind, the more you can expel their power over you and move on. Monsters I've created, I repeated flatly. Your stepfather is in the past, and yet he still follows you around. He is one man, a dead man as of last week who has set the stage for all others. You'll never see him again, and yet he's in your life incessantly in all that you do. He's in every man you've met and refused to trust. He's in your dreams at night. While it's natural to internalize the past, it's not healthy, and it doesn't have to be that way. Not forever. John is just a man. A horrible man, but he's only a man and only has the power you give him. While Dr. Rothman's words made sense, it was far from easy to flip a switch and make him disappear, no matter how badly I wished he would. Let me ask you this, she said, and straightened her shoulders. If you saw him standing in front of you on a busy street, what do you think you would do? I imagined him wearing a gray trench coat, with his clean-shaven face and hollow brown eyes. His salt-and-pepper hair would be slicked back without a strand out of place. 
he would smile the same false smirk that always gave his mood away. My stomach turned. You're having a visceral reaction about a dead man. My eyes narrowed on her of their own accord. Good, then you see my point. Feelings tend to govern us, not the mind. Find a way to move on from feeling the way you do because your brain already knows he can't hurt you anymore. Feelings were everything, a warped heap inside me. Fear every night as a child, knowing he was outside my window in the shadows. Or dread, when I could hear him breathing beside my bed and the air shifted as he reached for me. I let out an uneven breath, exhaling the tightness in my chest. Are you going to Anchorage? Dr. Rothman finally asked. I definitely didn't want to, and I wasn't sure I should care what happened to his things. I met her gaze. I'm undecided. Maybe it's time to end this for good, Elle. Even if crawling into an obscure, dank hole of horrific unknown was preferable, I knew she was right. You think I should go? She blinked at me. I figured you'd say that. It's why you came. Reluctant, I nodded. Who knows? Maybe you'll find your monsters are old and shriveled now, she said, smiling. Ha! A strand of hair fell in my face as I sat forward on the couch. That's an amusing image. I tucked it behind my ear again. Dr. Rothman looked at her watch, and though she said nothing, I knew my session was up. Well, that was fun. I stood up with a stretch and grabbed my bag from the cushion beside me. It was old and covered in patches collected from the ports the cruise ship I'd worked on had stopped at over the past four years. All the places I had gone, searching for a life far away. And yet, I always came back. Something unexplainable seemed to tether me to this cold, dark place. Dr. Rothman stood. Go to Eagle River, L. Her blue eyes rested on mine with a subtle command in them. She wasn't saying it as my therapist, but as my friend. I nodded, noncommittal, as the phone on her desk buzzed. She picked up the receiver, and I opened the door to leave. Oh, L? I glanced behind me. Happy birthday. A full, knowing grin engulfed her face, and she winked at me. I hated birthdays. Thanks, I muttered, and with a wave, I shut the door behind me. The hall was long, and I passed a few more offices on my way to the exit before I stepped outside. I folded the collar of my down parka up around my neck. The cold, crisp winter air stung my face and the inside of my nose. Snow lined the sidewalks and the rooftops of downtown Seward, but the harbor glowed with muted lights of blue and orange. Like the bay as the clouds set in, my mind felt foggy. Why did life have to be so exhausting? Begrudgingly, I dialed my sister's number and put the phone to my ear. How long had it been since I'd spoken to her? Months? Nearly a year? I pursed my lips as the phone rang and rang before it went to voicemail. It's JJ. Leave me a message. JJ? I hadn't heard that nickname in a while. But that was Jenny, short and to the point. Typical. It's me, I said uncertain why I'd called her to begin with. Jenny wasn't the type of sister to console or commiserate with. She ran away the day we turned 15 and led a life I knew almost nothing about. I didn't blame her for leaving. I would have gone too if she told me she was running away. But I did blame her for never looking back. I cleared my throat. I'm not sure if you've heard, but Dr. John's dead. He left me the house and, well, I'm thinking about going back for a few days. I glanced down the sidewalk, knowing deep down she wouldn't call me back. Regretting my call altogether, I hung up. Leave it to my identical twin to make me feel perpetually alone. The screen darkened, and I gripped the phone tighter in my gloved hand. 
The ginormous cruise ship at port sounded its horn, and I peered at it longingly for the first time. I could leave with the ship tomorrow, spending the next week calling guests into the studio to take overpriced, choreographed photos that would end up forgotten in a drawer a month down the line. Or I could be well on my way to Anchorage by then, headed to the one place I swore I would never return. Despite the appeal of drifting out to sea, I knew what I had to do. 2. Jackson, December 7th. Come on, babe, I called down the hallway as I swooped the lasagna off the kitchen counter. I nearly tripped on Hannah's favorite polka dot slippers. Luckily, she'd made my favorite dinner, which more than made up for it. It was still warm, and Grandma Ross's recipe made my mouth water just thinking about it, especially coming off 12 hours of patrol with little sleep. The scent had my stomach barking at me. Babe, I'm coming. Hannah sang. Since the end of the first trimester, she had a permanent lilt in her voice, a happiness. Pregnancy, I'd come to realize, suited her, and I couldn't help smiling as I swung the side door open. I kicked it back with my foot as the cold air breezed through. The stack of firewood against the garage was low. Great. The neighbors had their Christmas lights up, and I hadn't even started mine yet. I added that to my ever-growing honey-do list, along with finishing up the crib and starting my Christmas shopping. I glanced at the calendar hanging on the fridge. I still had a solid two weeks left. I'd be fine. Coming, coming, Hannah sang again. Her boots dragged against the carpet as she hurried toward the door. At eight months pregnant, it was more of a toddle than a run, but it made me uneasy nonetheless. Babe, be careful, I told her, nodding to her coat on the rack. And make sure you're bundled up. It feels like it's below zero out here. Jackson, honey, she said softly. I'm pregnant, not nine. With a slight head tilt, I glared at her, eliciting a wink in return. Warm the truck for me, she simpered. I'll lock up the house. I'm on it. Clicking the fob in my pocket, I remotely started the truck. It grumbled to life in the garage as I stepped out onto the breezeway. The front yard was covered in white. It wasn't surprising given it was dead winter, but the streets looked unplowed, just as neglected as they'd been at dawn when I got home. The last thing I needed to worry about was Hannah driving to work every morning on dangerous, unplowed roads, risking an accident and turning our unexpected bliss into another devastating loss. I cleared my throat and stepped into the garage, elbowing the garage opener on the wall. The door groaned and protested open. It smells like a carburetor in here, Hannah grumbled as I opened the back door of the truck and slid the lasagna inside. It's called grease because this is a garage. My garage, I warned her. I have an infuser. I turned to her with breakneck speed. No more lavender, I told her. The garage was the only place left in the house that didn't tickle my nose every time I walked into it. Hannah lifted her chin with feigned offense. Suit yourself. She walked around the front door of the truck to the passenger side. Do you think Kyle and Kelsey will have kids? She asked as I opened the door for her. Um, I have no idea. I took her hand and helped her into the cab. Why? You willing to ignore the fact you don't like Kelsey if she'll give you nieces and nephews? Maybe, she said and settled in with a sigh. Her cheeks were already red with exertion and the cold, and her golden eyes gleamed. She was small, even with a belly double the size of her beer-guzzling Uncle Sal. Kyle would be a good dad, she mused. He's so much like our father. Yes, her brother would be a good dad but not just because he was like his father. Kyle Ross didn't wear his heart on his sleeve like I did, and he didn't hold grudges either. He thought life was too short for that. But he had a perspective many others didn't. His six years in the infantry had seen to that. He'd seen more of the world than he'd bargained for, and if he had kids, it would be difficult for him. 
He, above any of us, knew how precious life was. He'd watched it slip through his fingers more than once, something he only talked about when he'd had too many beers and his heart felt too full. For now, he had a revived relationship with an old flame to navigate, and them moving in together was enough of a hurdle for the time being. Thinking about Ross as a dad, and knowing my own faults, I wondered if I would be a good father. Would I be too tough? Too rough around the edges, like Hannah often teased me? Would I baby her to the point of suffocation since she isn't supposed to exist as it is? I wanted to think I'd be a good father, even if it scared me shitless. Where'd you go? Hannah asked, watching me. I chuckled and shook my head. I was just thinking about the impending chaos. This time next year, we'll have a little girl to pack around with us. Hannah's meditative smile curved into a grin. I knew that look. She had a secret, something I would either love or hate. I crossed my arms over my chest and waited. What is it, Han? Spill. With a trill of a laugh, she dug into her purse and pulled out an ultrasound image. I got it at the doctor's yesterday. I took the image of our daughter with greedy fingers. How could I have forgotten? And you're only just showing me? I turned the image round in my hand. You were exhausted when you got home. I, I didn't want to wake you. You should have, I admonished, admiring her little shadowed ears and her little nose. Holy shit. I breathed. Hannah stared at me, expectant. This is really happening. Yes, it is, she said with a laugh. You said that last time. I know, because sometimes I can't believe it. I would be a father. It wasn't a hope or a wish anymore and felt more real than ever. And I've decided on a name, she whispered. I met her smiling eyes. We'd considered plenty of names in the past, but after three miscarriages, it became harder to discuss, to hope. This time, I wanted it to be up to her. Molly, after your mom. My heart squeezed so tight my eyes burned. But... I cleared my throat. Adeline Ross had made her wishes known the day she found out she was getting a granddaughter. What about your mom? I like Molly, she said simply. My mom will get over it. She brushed the back of her mitten-covered fingers over my cheek. I want our daughter to know about your mother and learn about your culture. I want her to be a part of that world, too. I leaned in and pressed a kiss to Hannah's lips, inhaling her. Burnt amber and, of course, a hint of lavender. My wife was the light I'd found in self-pitying darkness, the one who'd saved me from myself and the bottles of bourbon I'd used to drown myself in every night. She was the woman I most admired, and even in the seven years I'd known her, she never ceased to amaze me. Resting my forehead against hers, I stared down at Molly's image in my hand. Unfortunately, it will never happen. The chances are low. I wouldn't count on it. We'd heard it all, and had our hearts torn to shreds three times in the process. But eventually, we'd proven them wrong. Six weeks turned into the first trimester, which turned into a month from Hannah's January due date and we were finally allowing ourselves not only to hope, but to expect a baby, a family. Molly Adeline Mitchell, I said softly. There was no reason Molly couldn't have both of her grandmothers in spirit. It's perfect. Yes, she said. It is. Hannah tucked a loose hair behind my ear. And you're looking a bit unkempt, Officer Mitchell. I'm surprised your superior hasn't written you up yet. <laughs> he wouldn't dare. I chuckled and handed her the sonogram for safekeeping. But we will be late and he might give me lip for that. Hannah clasped the seatbelt with a sigh. Oh, all right. 
if we have to go. <laughs> Don't sound too excited, I muttered and closed her into the truck. I hurried around to the driver's side, my boots clomping against the cement, and then climbed inside and shut the door, locking us into the draftless cab. You got me all distracted, and now the truck isn't warm. I'll survive, she said, pulling the visor down. She ran her fingers through her long, blonde hair as she eyed herself in the mirror. I feel fat, but not gross fat, she mused. Healthy fat. Chuckling, I backed down the driveway, pulling carefully onto the road. Healthy fat is a good thing, right? Flipping the visor up, Hannah sat back in her seat, settling in for our 15-minute drive toward Ross's new condo on the other side of town. Though, I have to admit the sleeping part of pregnancy is getting more difficult. Only a few more weeks, then you'll really feel sleep-deprived. No, she said. You will, she grinned. But she was right. Between 12-hour patrol shifts and a newborn, our lives were about to take crazy to another level. I turned out of our neighborhood and headed toward the highway. A car passed me, going the speed limit, but on unplowed roads it made me nervous. You should call him, Hannah said, her voice low and contemplative. It was a tone I knew well, and I glanced in the rearview mirror to scour the road behind me. Jackson, I will, I told her. I'm serious. I want your dad to know his granddaughter and be a part of her life if he wants to. I know. I'll call him. I promise. I've been preoccupied with the extra shifts and all the bureaucratic bullshit going on right now. They've been giving us the runaround about all the extra caution. Crime throughout the country is on the rise, you know? Yes, so you told me the last time I brought this up. She reminded me. My dad and I had three obligatory calls a year. Christmas, his birthday, and mine. Other than that, I didn't think about him all that much. I never forgave him for forcing me to leave my Yupik family and heritage behind after my mom died because he couldn't cope. I'll call him tomorrow on my lunch, I promised, and squeezed her hand reassuringly. She squeezed back. Good. In three weeks, I would be the odd man out, me against two girls. I needed to get used to picking my battles and losing them. 3. L. December 8th. Driving to Eagle River was the longest two and a half hours of my life. Olive, my clunky green CRV, made the trip without too much protest, though the ride was anything but smooth. The rattling in the dash bothered me more than usual, but I suspected that had something to do with my anxiety about going home, more than poor Olive herself. Traffic in Anchorage proper didn't help either, and if I was honest, Jenny blowing off my call hurt, even if I should have expected it. I turned onto the frontage road. The not-a-through-street sign wasn't the only landmark anymore. The other was a giant husky head with the big black font around it. Frontier Dog Tours. It was a weather-ravaged sign, but I'd never seen it before, so it couldn't have been more than seven or so years old at most. Inwardly, I chuckled. Dr. John must have been elated to learn he was getting neighbors, a bunch of loud, four-legged ones that would no doubt disturb his morning coffee on the back deck of his secluded, modern ranch house. I didn't think much more about it as I neared the estate. It wasn't a mansion, but it was large and sprawling, just like the land he and my mother built it on. The driveway opened on the left side of the road, and I slammed on the brakes. There was an old Ford pickup in the driveway, the same spot Dr. John's Mercedes used to sit during the summer. It took a split second to remember he was dead, and another second to recall he would never own a truck so old and rusty. Either the sweet-sounding executor, Sandy, was more badass than I thought and had arrived early for our meeting, or I had a different visitor. I wasn't quite ready for either one. Pulling in beside the truck, 
I shifted Olive into park and peered through the windshield at a sight I thought I'd never see again. The house was just as I'd remembered it, with tall floor-to-ceiling windows and an arched roof. Despite the snow, I could even imagine the yard in the summer, perfectly manicured by Bruce, our gardener. I hadn't thought about him in years. He was a nice, retired Navy man who loved to talk about the good old days when life was equal parts work and play, and people tended to their garden for the satisfaction of creating something with their hands instead of paying someone else to do it. He let me take pictures of him so I could practice using the digital camera Dr. John had given me on my 16th birthday. That was a bittersweet day, and I shook my sudden chills away. I opened the car door, bracing myself for the blistering cold. The sky was graying as the clouds rolled in, so I hurried to collect my things from the back and made my way to the front door. Weeks of snow covered the yard, but I knew there were lily beds underneath, one of Bruce's most prized accomplishments. He'd shown me how to garden in a place hardened by permafrost most of the year, and how wood ash mixed with soil added more nutrients, encouraging life in unexpected places. Life is beauty, he told me. I scoffed at it then, but it was Bruce who told me you could see beauty in everything through a camera lens. You could focus on exactly what you wanted and capture it for an eternity. He told me to use photos as proof of what life could really be like. As I stepped onto the porch, I eyed a set of fresh, large footprints in the snow that followed a covered path around the house. Hello, I called. A gust of wind raked over me, coldness seeping into my spine. Hello there, a man called out and stepped around the side of the house. He was over six feet tall, with broad shoulders, a gray goatee, and short hair that stuck out beneath his ski hat. Can I help you, ma'am? He looked me over, eyes shifting from my face to my luggage and back. Actually, I said as he took a few steps closer, I'm wondering if I can help you. I'm L. St. James. This is my house. The words were clunky and forced, even if they were true. The man stopped a couple yards away, close enough for me to notice he had mud on his clothes and what looked like dog hair, too. There was nothing overtly sinister about him, but something was off, something that made the hair on the back of my neck and arms stand on end. His dark, close-set eyes narrowed on me. I was about to ask him to leave when he smiled. You're Dr. John's daughter, aren't you? One of his step-daughters, I corrected, as politely as possible. The man offered me his hand. Thomas Mitchell. I run a dog kennel down the road. There have been several break-ins in the area lately, those end-of-the-worlders with any excuse to steal what isn't theirs. He glanced at the house. I've been checking in on the place from time to time since John went to the hospital. I was glad to hear John hadn't died in the house, even if I knew it was a morbid thought. I wasn't sure I could handle being in the house at all, let alone knowing he'd died there. Thomas shoved his hands in his pockets. I was sorry to hear what happened to him. Yes, well, thank you, Thomas, for looking in on the place. You can call me Tom, miss. I nodded. I'll be here for a few days, so you're off duty. He pursed his lips and lowered his chin in understanding. Very well. I turned for the front door. Will you sell? I looked back at him. The house? Yes, I said, the answer rolling easily off my tongue. I hope to have it on the market within the next couple days. You don't waste time, Tom said with a grin. I admire that. I smiled as politely as I could, but I didn't want to prolong my visit any more than I had to. Yeah, well, I have a cruise ship leaving this weekend in Port of Seward, and I need to be on it. I switched my luggage from one hand to the other and glanced up at the dark clouds. I better get inside and get the place warmed up. It looks like a storm's coming in. It's supposed to be nasty, miss. 
Like I said, I'm right down the road if you need anything. I waved a thank you, and Tom finally turned to head for his truck. As soon as he was inside and backing down the drive, I reached into the pot of frostbitten plants and grabbed the hide key rock Sandy had left for me. With steadier hands than I'd expected, I put the key in the lock. I hadn't been home since I'd bolted on my 17th birthday, eight years ago. Glancing through the windows, into the dark house, I expected to see Dr. John standing in the hallway, watching, but the vast surrounding forest was all that reflected back at me. After a few jiggles of the knob, the latch turned, and I pushed the door open. A waft of cold, stale air hit me, and I lumbered inside with my things. I shut the door, closing myself in the musty house, and let out a deep, even breath as I turned around. It's just a house. The unwanted memories were like photographs I could lock in a box and shove under my bed to forget about. I could do that. Unwrapping my scarf, I switched the entry light on and abandoned my things by the door. First things first, the thermostat. After three steps and a shimmy into the frigid room, I clicked the heat on and the unit kicked to a roar in the attic. It was noisier than I remembered, but it worked. Dr. John always had the best of everything, which meant it was state of the art in its day. Money afforded a lot of luxuries and elaborate charades, like trips to SeaWorld, cruises to the Caribbean, perfect family outings that were all for show. But it also meant everything was weatherproofed, so I could bank on working water pipes too, even if the house had been uninhabited and left to the elements for a few weeks. Heat hissed from the vents in the ceiling, and I rubbed my jacket-clad arms in anticipation of warmth. I was uncertain how to proceed as I peered around the living room. The interior was just as I remembered it, stark and masculine, but precariously clean. The remote was in a black tray in the center of the coffee table, the metal coasters stacked in their holder beside it. The same gray suede couch sat in front of the fireplace with the large flat screen mounted above it. The only noticeable changes were a pair of worn, wool-lined slippers that sat next to the recliner and a set of bifocals resting on a holy Bible on the side table. I hadn't been expecting that. To anyone else, they would be normal items. An old man's glasses left behind. Dr. John hadn't worn glasses when I'd known him, though, and he definitely wasn't reading the Bible back then either. Even the slippers seemed strange, too, like they were too comfortable, too casual for him. Dr. John Tomlin was a man of control and precision. He didn't have time to relax or read a book. He was severe and calculated and always knew your weakness. You want a new camera? Here's what I want in return. Dr. John was an older man to begin with, wealthy and suave all his life, which is probably how he caught my mother in his net. Not that I knew much about her, other than her taste in men had been amiss. But I imagined his back stooping more and more as he turned into a lonely, regretful old man, alone in his big fancy house. Taking a deep breath, I unclenched my teeth and stared at the Bible on the side table. At which point had he decided to leave me everything, knowing how much I hated him, knowing I'd been willing to blackmail him to never have to see him again? Pictures never lie. Bruce had told me that. Then it dawned on me. Bruce had known. A cold, heavy mass pressed against my chest as I took in a shallow breath. Bruce knew. I let the unexpected truth settle in. For the first time, I realized why he asked me so many questions about Dr. John and why they'd been fighting in the driveway the day Bruce left and never came back. Part of me was heartbroken, but elated when Dr. John kept his distance for nearly a year. It was all part of a plan, a deal brokered between them I knew nothing about. My mind swirled with understanding, and I shivered as the house creaked in the howling wind. 
No more shadows, I thought, and switched on the table lamp to brighten the somber afternoon. The watermark on the coffee table caught the light, and I thought of Jenny. She'd purposely left a sweaty glass of iced tea on it one summer. Defiance had been her armor. I hadn't realized it for the longest time. She was a smart mouth, unruly girl that Dr. John learned quickly wasn't worth the risk. She spoke her mind, was loud when he wanted quiet, talked back when he demanded submission. Meanwhile, I was too afraid of what would happen if I challenged him. I never considered the ramifications of silence would be worse. I was the one who was punished for her disobedience, and deep down, I think she knew that. But then, Jenny had never thought much about anyone other than herself. She'd been convinced our mother would never leave us, because moms don't do that. And when I told her to grow up, I think she'd written me off for good. The hardwood floors, brittle from the cold, creaked as I walked through the rest of the house. The kitchen was smaller than I remembered, but much the same. Six chairs nestled around the long oak dining table, with only a single place setting for one. I crossed the living room toward the hallway and hesitated outside the first room on the left. My room. As much as I wanted to keep the door closed, my hand reached for the doorknob and opened it. Somehow, I convinced myself that Dr. John would have turned it into a gym or a guest room after I left, but it was exactly as I'd left it, save for the open drawers and discarded clothes I'd left in my wake. There were no incriminating photos, though, nor a nasty note telling him there were more where that came from. He'd straightened it and kept it clean. His need for control ensured that. The lotions and body sprays that littered my dresser were the same ones I'd left behind. The quilt my mom made for me when I was born, the one that matched Jenny's, was still folded at the foot of my bed. Fleetingly, I wondered if Jenny was right, that there was more to our mom's abandonment than Dr. John had told us. She had always been meek and submissive, so I hadn't been surprised the day she finally broke and disappeared into the night, like an ailing cat slinking away to die alone in peace. I clenched my hands at my sides, my fingers sweltering in my mittens. Suddenly too warm to breathe, I pulled off my beanie and rushed out the bedroom door, slamming it shut behind me. I walked over to my purse and grabbed my phone to dial Sandy. I was closing a chapter, not opening an old gaping wound. I couldn't afford to spiral right now, and I was finished allowing them to have any more power over me. Screw them all, John, my mom, even Jenny. Soon, it would all be a distant memory. 4. L. December 8th. Sandy canceled our meeting about the house because of a sudden cold. To distract myself from a wasted day in my own personal hell, I had a taxi driver drop me off at Taps, a local hangout with cheap drinks and a decent bartender, so said the driver. He was an older man who smelled of cloves and wore a leather biker jacket, which gave him some street cred in my book, even if it was illogical. But his recommendation didn't disappoint. Walking through the creaking door of Taps was like stepping into the past, complete with Formica tabletops, pleather swivel seat bar chairs, and herringbone wood paneling along the back of the bar. The only thing I didn't see was Patrick Swayze, with his flowing brown locks and his arms crossed over his chest, looking pensive and ready to rumble. The jukebox played low in the background, a song with a melodic country twang, but the place was warm and wasn't a dark memory box like Dr. John's, so I stayed. The scent of stale beer and musty wood was the least of my worries. I shrugged out of my coat and hung it on a worn wooden coat rack by the door. My North Face jacket was pretentious beside the beat-up leather one from the 90s, and the trench coat draped beside it. The two men sitting at the bar stared at me, probably thinking the same thing. They nodded at me as I walked in, a bottle of beer in each of their hands. With a quick nod in return, I pulled out an empty seat at the opposite end of the bar, smiling warmly at the bartender. He was an older gentleman, 
with a balding, shiny spot on his head, overgrown beard, and a large beer gut. He smiled back, his face open and bright, like Santa himself. You a tourist? He asked, studying my attire. Other than a long sleeve shirt that covered my curves differently than his, we didn't look all that dissimilar in our jeans and snow boots. I shook my head and pointed to the Jameson two shelves up. Here on business. A whiskey, please. He flipped a highball glass over and poured two fingers full. A whiskey it is, he said with a slight whistle. He placed the glass on a small napkin square and slid it to me. I slid him my debit card in return. You can start a tab. You got it. He turned to the cash register. Thank you. I lifted the glass to my mouth and pretended not to notice the lipstick stain on the rim. Though drinking was never really a vice of mine, I felt almost desperate for it, and with a quick swish of the glass, I swallowed the spicy liquid down in one gulp. I reveled in the trail it blazed from my throat into my stomach and licked my lips. You're a whiskey girl, huh? The bartender's brow crinkled. If I wasn't mistaken, there was admiration in his non-question. I shrugged. By default, it's the only thing my stepdad wouldn't drink. Ah, I see. Amusement curved his lips. Did he? His eyes fixed on me, measuring me up as I pulled out my phone to check the severity of the impending storm. Maybe the bartender had an inkling, since I assumed he was good at gauging people. It was part of his job, assessing if a patron would cause trouble and determining when one more drink was one too many. In a state with freezing temperatures most of the year, where the natural beauty could be equally cruel and terrifying, I assumed he'd seen a lot of desperation in people's eyes in his lifetime. I was probably no different. As I was about to put my phone back in my purse, I noticed 12 unread emergency alert texts. I clicked the first message open. Below the image of a man, it read, Anchorage manhunt for assault and battery charges. I tapped it closed before I could read the rest. I'd been getting more and more notifications lately, and I didn't need to hear about all that shit right now. I was on a mission to forget my problems, not get sucked into the desperate state of the world and humanity, both of which were completely out of my control. There was a reason it took a certain type of person to thrive in Alaska. The Arctic nights could stretch long, and dark thoughts ran rampant. A never-setting sun in the summertime could create just as much disquiet. We lived in a place so far removed from one town to the next, it was easy to get lost in the restlessness. Traveling with the cruise lines helped, even if it was to have subpar conversations and get outside of my head for a week or two at a time. I'll have another, please, I said, running my fingers through my hair. The strands fell down around my shoulders, still not as long as they used to be, but getting there. I'd cut my hair after I'd left Dr. John's house. He'd preferred Ginny and I with long hair, and illogically, I'd kept it short for years after, as though it might help keep him away, until I started seeing Dr. Rothman. The bartender filled my glass again and slid it back to me. I turned it around and around, contemplating what I might do with the money I made from selling the house. Buy a new one? Move away from this place? I actually liked living in Seward. Being here so far from the ocean, was strange. Moisture wasn't heavy in the air like it was in Seward. Eagle River was further removed and cold in a way that made my bones ache at their core and my body stiff. The whiskey, though, I tossed it back, breathing out an invisible fire. Oh yeah, one more of these would do the trick. Looks like they have another update for us, the bartender muttered. The outbreak in the lower 48 had been making the headlines for the past week. A possible chicken flu outbreak from an unsanitary factory, which seemed to happen more and more frequently. With the increasing FDA regulations, I wasn't sure I bought it, even if people around here were starting to get a tad nervous. We imported most of our food, so what was to keep the outbreak from spreading all the way out here? Tugging the elastic band from my wrist... I pulled my hair up into a ponytail and turned to the flickering light of the television. 
I wasn't sure if the heater was cranked up to a hundred degrees or if the whiskey was finally making its way through my veins, but I was growing uncomfortably warm. The bartender turned up the volume on the flat screen. Influenza hospitalization is at an all-time high. Joseph Hillman is in Georgia now, outside of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, awaiting an announcement from the Director General of the World Health Organization, Kenneth Donaldson. Joseph, have you heard anything new since this morning? The screen flashed from the brunette news anchor to who I assumed was Joseph Hillman, standing outside the CDC. He was wearing a measly scarf and windbreaker, and a surgical mask hung around his neck. No, Veronica, there's been nothing new officially reported. The Virginia and Georgia Departments of Health still request everyone stay indoors as much as possible while they continue to investigate the multi-state outbreak of what's said to be an avian flu. Now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is said to be helping them with this, but there's been nothing official reported. We already know they think the outbreak might have started at a chicken plant in western Colorado, but again, there has been nothing officially announced. Any idea why the East Coast would be so affected by an outbreak in Colorado? Have they claimed they are the same virus, or why they've had such difficulty containing it? Joseph shook his head. No, they haven't stated whether they're connected, though there's plenty of speculation circulating. We know there was an outbreak reported last week at two different plants owned by the King Corporation. Forty-two people were initially infected, and only six of them survived and remain in critical condition. Without knowing much more, you can imagine the panic here on the East Coast with so much uncertainty. Veronica's eyes crinkled with apprehension. With all the spreading panic, the CDC seems to be more quiet than expected. Joseph nodded. There's been a lot of vague talk, which makes most of us standing out here wonder if they're still working on their answers. Hopefully, we'll know more after their official statement tomorrow. A gust of wind whipped over him, causing his scarf to flail around his body. Veronica cleared her throat. Has the King Corporation had anything to say about all of this? I had to wonder just how off script she was going. Unfortunately, they could not be reached for comment. The number of sick reported in Wales yesterday were staggeringly high as well. Is it possible it's the same disease? Again, there's no way to know for sure. Joseph looked exhausted and a bit perturbed by her questions, perhaps because he was standing out in the cold, or perhaps it was because he didn't know the answers to very much at all. He switched his microphone from one hand to the other. One thing I can tell you, he started a bit reluctantly, is that, historically speaking, the CDC operates on the basic principle that disease knows no borders. Statistically, this means in today's interconnected world, diseases can be as dangerous as wildfire, spreading from an isolated village to any major city in the world in as little as 36 hours. This information was on their website last week, and as of today, I could no longer find it. Despite his calm and collected demeanor, the reporter's foreboding tone gave his anxiety away, and a shiver shimmied down my spine. If the CDC wasn't providing answers during a rising panic, that probably meant everyone was screwed. The guy at the end of the bar set his beer down with a clank. Thank God we're way out here, he muttered, but I couldn't breathe as easily. The sticky fingers of fear crept over me. Just last week, I'd met hundreds of people on a cruise, traveling from around the world, and my stomach nodded as I considered how many of them could have been sick. Can I get you another? The bartender asked, eyeing my empty glass. Um, yeah, please. I tried and failed, not to wonder how long before a virus like that was out of control and what that would even look like. The name's Terry, by the way he said with a weak smile. Either he could see the alarm on my face, or he felt it himself. L, I said, flashing him a wavering smile back. Terry poured me another shot, heavier this time. It's on the house. Five. L. 
December 8th. My mind was spinning as Terry drove me back to the house. His old truck was loud and rattled over every bump in the road, making my stomach churn more and more as each minute passed. Although I'd had three or four shots, it wasn't until I'd stood up to leave the bar that I realized just how drunk I was. I'd wanted to forget the past night, I slurred. My tongue was heavy and thick in my mouth. I laughed. I think I've accomplished that. Terry chuckled. I think you did, Miss L. He was a nice man, I decided. Among other things, I'd learned that he was very proud of his grandkids from Juno, but wished he saw them more. The headlights flashed on the dog kennel sign that was coming up fast. It's right here, I directed. Terry hit the brakes, thrashing me forward, and turned onto the frontage road. Had I ever been so drunk? I nearly lost the contents of my stomach as he drew closer to the driveway, and I wasn't sure I ever wanted to be this drunk again. As we pulled into the driveway, I thanked Terry for the ride and fumbled to remove my seatbelt. That was fun. We should do it again. But as the words came out, I knew I would never see him again. Here, he said, shifting the truck into park. He was about to climb out and help me when I held up my hand, the passenger door swinging open. I got it. Get home to your wife, I told him. My mouth tasted sour, but I hadn't even thrown up yet. Not that I could remember, at least. I stumbled out of the car. Take care of yourself, Miss L. I flicked him a goodbye wave as I ran as fast and steadily as possible to the front door. The snow was cold as it clung to my face, the wind like sheets of ice against my skin, but internally, I was on fire. My insides rolled and burned, like they were smelted in a cauldron, churning until I couldn't take it anymore. I clung to the porch railing and doubled over. Everything scorched its way up my throat as I expelled it into the hibernating rose bushes. My entire body trembled, and it took everything I had left in me to hold myself upright and not fall to my knees. This sucks. Pulling in a deep breath, I peered out at the driveway. Olive was parked under a thin blanket of snow. Terry was gone, and everything was dark. Despite the sweat dripping down my temple, I needed to get inside where it was warm before I froze to death on the stoop. I fumbled for my keys, using the doorframe to lean against. I couldn't focus. I could barely make my fingers work, and it felt like something rotted inside me. I didn't feel drunk anymore. I felt like I was dying. Minutes passed, or maybe only seconds, before I was in the sweltering heat of the dark house. I slogged into the kitchen. All I could think about was drinking water, but lifting my arm to reach a glass from the cupboard was nearly impossible. I stuck my cupped hand under the faucet instead, sighing with relief as cool water rolled off my skin. Chills immediately followed, then momentary numbness, which was a welcome sensation. Bending over, I slurped the water overflowing from my hand as quickly as I could, but it wasn't enough. I needed more water. My stomach rumbled, my insides twisting into knots, and before I realized what I was doing, I was hauling my ass down the hall and into the bathroom. I couldn't breathe, and tears stung my eyes. I peeled off my suffocating coat and the scarf around my neck. What the hell's happening to me? I switched on the light and dropped to my knees on the tile. I needed to purge every rotten thing inside me if I would survive what felt like pure misery. I retched into the toilet bowl over and over until my insides were raw and cramping with pain. Nose running and eyes too heavy to keep open, I rested my burning cheek on the cold toilet seat. God, I pleaded, kill me now. Six, Jackson, December 9th. I stared at the clock on the dash. It was barely 1 a.m., and I still had another three hours before I got a break. 
My mind was numbing over and I wondered how many more frantic calls I would have to take before my good Samaritan side wore off completely. The long, drawn-out beep of an emergency alert broadcast blared through my speakers, peeling a layer of haze back from my mind. I ran my hand over my face, dreading what came next. I wasn't sure I could take another Amber Alert tonight. The following message is issued at the request of emergency management. Due to the possibility of a viral outbreak, a mandatory quarantine has been issued for all cities in Alaska with 500 or more civilians. Alaska residents, including those in Juneau, Anchorage, and Fairbanks, are asked to stay tuned to television and radio stations for further updates. I blinked out the window at the black morning as the recording repeated. Things had gotten crazy in the past 24 hours, but quarantine? I reached for my phone and dialed Ross. Even if I was certain he would have told me about this if he'd known, he was my superior and would have far more information than I did. The phone barely rang once. Are you hearing this? He said in answer. Yeah, you don't know? No, I mean, the chief said things were worse than they were letting on, but he never said the word quarantine. I stared at the radio, waiting for it to beep again for another emergency system alert that would explain what the hell was happening, not just contribute to the spreading fear. Should we meet up at the PD and... <sighs> Shit, he's calling. I'll hit you up in a sec. Then the line went dead. Could things have worsened so much overnight? It was hard to tell out here, where everything seemed normal, parked at an abandoned gas station on the side of the highway. Normal, except for the paper-thin mask I was wearing as a result of an unexpected fever outbreak. Just a precaution, we'd been told. Out here, the roads were white and desolate like any other winter night. In a matter of hours, I'd only passed a few cars on the stretch between Anchorage and the surrounding boroughs. But that's how the back roads were in a territory where miles of wilderness stretched between one unincorporated town and the next. Chief Gonzalez's request that all units remain on call was justifiable when we thought it was to maintain order due to the spreading hysteria as conditions in the lower 48 worsened. But quarantine meant contagions, not food poisoning and chaos as the rest of the U.S. scrambled to make sense of everything. How had it spread so fast? Or maybe everyone was just finally catching on. The past 12 hours had been a blur of breaking up bloody-knuckled fistfights, responding to car accidents from sick people who shouldn't have been behind the wheel, and catching an arsonist in Sutton that claimed he wanted to know what it felt like since the world was ending anyway. If government officials had downplayed what was happening, they'd risked everyone's health and safety, and I wasn't bionic. Troopers are just as susceptible to contagions as everyone else, and we'd been on patrol for over 24 hours since we'd got the call at the dinner table. My lasagna was still on my plate when we headed to the department for bulletproof vests and masks. I tore the mask off my face and clenched my hand around it. The damn masks wouldn't do anything if a perp was infected and I hit the dash with my fist. It creaked in protest, and the computer screen shook, but I didn't give a shit. There was no way to know if I'd caught the virus in the span of the last 12 or 24 hours, and now... I might pass it on to Hannah when I got home. I scrubbed my hands over my bristly face again. Fuck, I groaned and leaned my head back against the seat. I needed to compose myself before I called Hannah to see how she was feeling. And I needed to figure out where I was going to stay because I wasn't taking my potentially sick ass home until I was cleared. I took a swig of cold coffee, though I didn't need it. My body was already wound tight my adrenaline kicking in. Staring into the darkness, I tried to control my racing thoughts. Regardless of whether or not I was sick, Hannah was in danger if the illness had already spread this far. Molly was in danger. Hannah wouldn't survive if anything happened to this baby. Not after we'd already lost so much and come so far with this pregnancy. Losing Molly would be devastating for both of us, and dread began to burn a hole in my stomach as I imagined the possibility of it. All units, I glared at the radio. 1019 for a 1010 in progress. Lasan Street and Eagle River. Tango 3 is on the way, requesting backup. Collar is advising that there's a 12-gauge shotgun and 2200 on the premises. 
I was only ten minutes away, but for the first time in my six-year career, I hesitated to answer the call. I hadn't heard back from Ross, and I had to make the split decision to respond and risk getting sick or worse, ignore it, and be the cause of an innocent getting injured or killed. Loyalty. Integrity. Courage. Shit. Despite my better judgment, my oath made it impossible to ignore the call. As I reached for my radio, my cell phone rang, vibrating and screaming at me from the passenger seat. Finally. I grabbed it, watching a Dodge Ram speed past me down the highway as I brought the phone to my ear. Ross, what did he say? Mr. Mitchell, this is Nurse Crawford at the emergency clinic. My breath caught in my throat. Hannah, what is it? What's happened? Your wife was admitted 30 minutes ago? The nurse's voice was raspy, like she was winded and distracted. She's in surgery. She was what? I could barely speak through my terror. The baby. Hannah still had a few weeks before she was due. Mr. Mitchell. Nurse Crawford paused, a pause that implied impending bad news. You better get down here. There was a crash on the other side of the line, a commotion of back and forth muttering that drew closer. Take him to room 217, through that door, she commanded, and then the connection was lost. Hello? I shouted into the phone. What the? My mind spun with a million questions as I threw the truck into drive, fishtailing on the slick road as I turned toward the city. A vice grip clinched inside my chest as my worst possible fears became reality. The roads blurred, and I wiped the tears from my eyes as I pressed the pedal down as far as it would go. Hannah would be fine. Molly would be fine. Everything would be fine. I just needed to get there. 7. Jackson December 9th. I barreled through the hospital doors of the emergency room, passing a sea of patients that filled the waiting room, ignoring the stench of body odor as I hurried to the glassed-in front desk. The haggard woman with long, silver hair eyed me from behind the counter, taking in my uniform. Can I help you, officer? My wife, I rasped. Where's my wife, Hannah Mitchell? The woman's dark eyes fell, and she nodded down the hall. She's in surgery, Mr. Mitchell. She had an accident. My knuckles whitened against the counter. An accident? She was supposed to be asleep, warm and at home in bed. I turned for the double doors that separated everything else from the waiting room. You can't see her right now. Officer! I rushed down the hall of the small clinic. I didn't care about the rules, and they couldn't stop me. The hinges of the electronic doors screeched as I burst through, glancing fervently between the three closed rooms to my right. Surgery meant something bad happened, and there were complications. Hannah! I shouted, even if a voice told me she couldn't hear me. Sir? The nurse called. I peered through the window in the first door. An exposed, dark-skinned foot was all I could see but it was enough to know it wasn't Hannah, and I ran to the next. I peered through the second window at the bloodied sheets on the floor. Someone had died in there, or was dying, and when the woman in scrubs moved out of my line of sight, I saw polka dot slipper stained with blood discarded on the floor. Air rushed from my lungs and my heart froze in my chest. A wave of disbelief washed over me taking with it every willful shred of hope I'd brought in with me. Another scrub-shrouded person moved around the table. Blood soaked the sheet covering the mound of her stomach. Sir, I startled. You can't be in here, sir. The nurse tugged on my arm, but I couldn't pry my eyes from Hannah. Was she still alive? Was the baby dead? Sir. That's my wife. I growled, glaring at her. The nurse swallowed. I know, and I'm sorry, Officer Mitchell, but if you want her to live, you can't distract Dr. Fines. Please, she said, gesturing toward the waiting room. 
sit. Her voice was calm and practiced, but I wasn't like all the other husbands and fathers she'd talked to before. That was my wife and my child, and I did not understand what the fuck was happening. You said there was an accident? She gestured toward the waiting room again. Patients were everywhere, blurs and outlines in my panicked haze, and the scent of sickness permeated the building. I know this is hard, and I'll explain to you what I know. Uncertain if I should listen to her, to take even an immeasurable step back, I glanced back inside the operating room at the nurse peering over at me. I sucked in a breath. Hannah needed their attention, and I was only hurting her by causing a scene. Right this way, the nurse murmured and rested her hand on my elbow. The severity of what was happening became a whirling tornado of uncertainty, and tears blurred my eyes as I followed her back out to wait with the others. I listened for the creak of the operating room door and for the doctor to run out and reassure me everything would be okay. But the door never opened, and the doctor never came. In my gut, I knew nothing would ever be okay again. The electric doors swung closed behind us. There was an intruder, the nurse explained, letting go of my elbow. I paled. A what? Someone broke into your home. A looter? Dispatch had been flooded with reports all night. The nurse shrugged. An older man brought her in, uh, Mr. Hutton. Whether it was a courtesy extended because I was a trooper or because I was a distraught husband, I wasn't sure. But the nurse handed me the intake report. Neighbor heard a scream and gunshots, ran next door, and found the victim on the kitchen floor. She was barely conscious and holding her stomach. I'm not sure how long I stared blankly at the paper before I dropped the clipboard and it crashed onto the linoleum. I couldn't read it. I couldn't bear it, not when it was my wife fighting for her life in my house, holding my daughter. I could barely catch my breath. The nurse crouched down for the clipboard. He called 911 when he found her, but there was so much blood, he brought her in himself. Her words were like distant horns, blaring and soft at the same time. They echoed through my head as I imagined Hannah scared and in pain, alone in our home. Officer, the nurse said tentatively. My gaze drifted to her. The intruder shot her in the abdomen. She lost the baby. I stumbled to the side table in the waiting room and lowered myself down. No, I said, shaking my head. Molly's room was nearly ready, and her clothes were already picked out for the drive home from the hospital. The automated doors opened with a click, and the doctor marched out. His face mask was resting under his chin like he could barely be bothered to come out and speak with me as he pulled one bloody glove off, then the other. His eyes were grayed and his jaw was a few days unshaven. I'm sorry there was nothing we could do, he said unceremoniously. I did all I could, but she'd already lost too much blood. He rubbed his temple. Her organs failed, and she didn't make it. His words hadn't even sunk in before the surgeon turned on his heel and hurried back down the hall, too busy to explain anything more. I'm sorry. I heard him mutter again, and then the automated door shut behind him. It was like I'd been pitted and hollowed out. I was a vacuous, abysmal void of incredulity. I just saw her. She'd given me a kiss told me to be safe, and waved as Ross and I had drove to the station. I shook my head, refusing to believe any of it. I'm so sorry, Mr. Mitchell. But the nurse's sympathetic voice was like air to a nascent fire. Oh, God. No, I pleaded and let my head fall into my hands. Hannah wasn't gone. It didn't feel real. No, 
I repeated, standing. I ignored the ache in my bones and instant fatigue. The doctor was wrong. He didn't try hard enough. There was still hope. My legs gave out before I could take two steps, and I stumbled back into the wall. The nurse reached out for me, but covering my face with my hands, I slid down to the cold linoleum. I was an abyss of emotion unlike anything I'd ever felt. Gaping, raw, empty pain, and yet so full and brimming I couldn't catch my breath. I'm so sorry, she said again, but they were just words, sounds with no meaning. Molly, our little miracle was gone. She was supposed to be spoiled, rotten, and perfect. A woman coughed somewhere in the room, and I looked over. An indistinct horde of faces stared back at me. I glanced down at my uniform. My blue fatigues had held meaning once, but I was no longer a state trooper. I was a man whose world had just fallen apart, and my wife and child were dead. I peered up at the nurse. I opened my mouth, but nothing came out. Clearing my throat, I tried again. <clears throat> Can I see her? Of course you... Hey! A man pushed himself off the far wall of the room. He had tattoos on his face and neck and looked like he'd seen better days. I've been waiting for hours. Am I getting this broken arm looked at or what? The clinic was small and couldn't have had more than a handful of staff. The few staff around were bustling in and out the doors and answering phones. I've been here longer, a woman shouted. The man with the broken arm pointed at the nurse, eyes narrowed. I want to talk to management or something. I didn't care about them and their bullshit problems. Sit your ass down, I told him. Wait your turn. He took a step back, but I didn't think it was because of the uniform. He scowled, but said nothing more. I need to deal with these patients, the nurse said softly. You know where to find her. Hesitant, I stepped past her. Mr. Mitchell? I peered at the nurse over my shoulder. I'll give you as much time as I can, but we'll have to wheel her out when we need the room. I continued walking. Somehow amidst the indescribable pain, I could also feel nothing at all. Reluctant to open the door, to see what remained of my wife and daughter, I peered in through the window slat and did my best to brace myself. I couldn't leave without saying goodbye. I wasn't sure I could leave at all, not without her. Lowering my head, I choked out a sob and squeezed my eyes shut before I could bring myself to open the door and step inside. I walked over to the curtain with a ragged breath and pulled it open all the way. A blanket covered Hannah's stomach, and a small, infant-sized shape was wrapped in linen in the incubator beside her. My feet froze where I stood at the end of Hannah's bed. Her face was gray and slackened, not like she was simply sleeping, but like she'd been gone for hours already. Her lips were less rosy, her skin more ashen, and as she lay there, I feared her as much as I missed her. Baby. The word was only air exiting my lungs as I struggled to breathe. Stepping around the bed, I took her cold hand in mine, wincing as I sat down on the stool beside her. I couldn't see her through the tears, but I knew it was better that way as I brought her cold hand to my lips. Hey, you can't leave me. I need you, baby. I sucked in a breath. Last time I saw her, she was smiling, threatening to give me a haircut when I got home. No, she would never touch me, never sleep beside me again. Tears dripped down my cheeks, onto her hand, and down the soft skin of her arm. Another sob burst from my chest, and I rested my forehead against her shoulder. I couldn't do this. I couldn't bear a life without her playful griping and dimpled smile. There was no reason to go on living without her.
8. Jackson. December 9th. The phone rang. Then it rang again, forcing my mind to stir. I wiped the crusted tears from my eyes and cracked my back as I unhunched myself and straightened. I wasn't sure how long I'd sat beside Hannah or for how long I'd wept, but at some point I'd fallen asleep. The fog in my mind hadn't cleared and the nightmare hadn't faded. Hannah was still lifeless in front of me, her fingers cool and stiff in mine, and it all came crashing back down on me. Biting back another sob, I rose to my feet, my body yelling at me to stay with her, to never leave her sight. But I couldn't stay in the operating room forever. It wouldn't be long before the nurse came in to take her from me. What would I do then? And I couldn't leave her exposed like this any longer, undressed and cold. But she couldn't feel the cold, I realized. I stared at the pale skin of her throat, waiting for her to swallow or give me some small sign that somehow she still breathed. That was crazy, though. Her stomach was cut open beneath the sheets. I knew it was. I didn't need to look nor did I want to. I peered up to the clock above the doorway, then blinked and rubbed my eyes as I leaned closer. It was 6.15 in the morning. Five hours? I'd been sleeping for five hours? How had no one come to get me? In the recesses of my mind, I remembered shouting and banging in the hallway that had stirred me from my sleep, though none of it made any sense. Reluctantly, I pried my fingers from Hannah's, hating that it felt like a final goodbye, and dared to look at Molly's body, still swaddled in the incubator. I couldn't bring myself to go over, petrified of what I might find. But I had to, eventually. I needed to get them out of here and lay them to rest. With a steadying breath, I leaned down and pressed my lips to Hannah's forehead. I love you so damn much, I whispered. It was all I could do to grit back another breakdown. The phone continued to ring down the hall, grating on my last nerve as it went unanswered, and then it dawned on me. I had two very important calls to make. Han's mother and father in Hawaii needed to know what happened, and her brother. The vice grip cinched around my heart again and I could barely stand the weight of dread pressing against my chest. How was I going to tell Ross his baby sister was dead? I braced my palm against the wall, willing myself to stay upright. My limbs were heavy with grief and exhaustion, and my mind was a cloud of insecurity. Yet when I pulled out my phone to make the two most heartbreaking calls of my life, I had to be strong. I had never been the strong one, and now... I needed to be their rock. Dragging in a ragged breath, I readied myself to make the call. I thumbed the tears away, like it might actually help, and I stepped into the hallway. When I saw I had no cell service, I felt relief, distress, defeat. I looked at the metal doors, which were open this time, and dropped my hand to my side. Only four people were left in the garage-sized waiting room, but the air smelled foul like sour gym clothes in a sauna. A nurse with a red bun and stocky legs I hadn't seen before attended to an older woman with blood on her forehead, while another woman vomited in the far corner of the room. Excuse, I cleared my throat, voice rusty. I stepped toward her. Excuse me, nurse. What is it? She didn't bother looking up from the bandage she placed on the elderly woman's head. Where's the doctor? Which one? She rose to her feet and tossed a soiled rag into the cart beside her. Never mind. It doesn't matter. Dr. Fine's left for a family emergency. O'Donnell is passed out in the break room sick, and I'm not sure about the others. When she finally looked at me, I could see the sickness in her blue eyes. She looked jaundice, and it wasn't only exhaustion and overwhelm. The nurse was unwell, 
We all were. I could feel it in my blood, sucking out what little life was left in me. The governor's ESA had come too late. I wasn't one for facts and figures, but I knew it only took one person to infect a colony. History had proven that much. Despite its remote outposts and frozen lands, Alaska was no exception. I cleared my throat. My wife is dead, I said dumbly. I'm sorry for your loss, officer. She pushed her supply car over to a little girl sleeping in the last chair and placed the back of her hand against the girl's forehead, brushing a loose curl behind her ear. The little girl inhaled deeply, her throat rattling, but she didn't wake. What I mean is, I continued, she's still in the operating room with the... My daughter. The nurse seemed to finally see me, really register my standing there, and she looked at me. Her name tag had a photo of her, Penelope Hernandez, medical assistant. The doctor said he'd come for her, but he never did. I explained. The nurse rose to her feet, coughing into her shoulder as she surveyed the room. What's your name? Jackson Mitchell. My wife is Hannah Mitchell, and she was in here for a gunshot wound to the stomach. The nurse's brow furrowed with sympathy, and she shook her head. I'm sorry about your wife, she said again, though this time she seemed to mean it. I don't want to lie to you, officer. We're in a small clinic. Our rooms are full. These people have been waiting to see the doctors for hours, and we're short-staffed. I don't see it getting better anytime soon. I'm not even sure we'll be able to function as a clinic for much longer. We're running low on supplies, and there's no one to run anything. Her voice pitched. We've all got it. It's only a matter of time before... Before what? A new, spiraling kind of fear racked through me. She glanced at the TV mounted on the wall. Two news anchors sat behind a desk the camera panning between them. The segment title read, 70 million hospitalized in two days strokes fears in officials worldwide. Some are coining end of days. They're all dying, she choked out. They're not getting better. They say it's the H1N112 sickness. Her eyes scoured my face, waiting for me to understand. But how could I? It had only been hours since I'd fallen asleep. It was happening too fast, and it made no damn sense. People aren't just looting anymore. They're losing their minds. We're all going to die. Hey, I said as firmly and softly as I could. You are not going to die. I said, pronouncing every word. If she was dying, there was nothing to stop me and everyone else from following behind her and freaking out wasn't an option for me, not with Hannah and Molly to tend to. Summoning every shred of willpower that remained, I dug deep for what was left of my calm and collected reserve, and led her to one of the empty chairs that didn't have unidentifiable fluid on it. You're just exhausted. We're all exhausted, I told her and pointed to the television. They will figure this out. We just have to hold on a, a little while longer. The lies were pouring out of my mouth. You've been at this for hours, haven't you? She nodded with a sniffle and blew a strand of red hair from her face. Her blue eyes were red-rimmed. Yes. You just need some rest. I am exhausted, she admitted. I could use a couple hours to sleep. She needed more than that given the gauntness of her face. I glanced at the old woman in the chair opposite us. Her eyes were closed, and her mouth was open. Her chest was rising and falling with each shallow breath. I wasn't sure why she hadn't left. Maybe she had no place to go, or maybe she was too sick. But the nurse wasn't helping anyone by staying. You've done what you can for these people. You should take a break. She nodded in pure defeat as if she only needed someone to give her permission. I only need a few minutes. I'll be okay after that. The nurse rose shakily to her feet 
and looked down at me, still crouched beside the chair. I can't promise your wife and child will get the attention they deserve, she explained, voice level this time. She wiped her brow with a shaking hand. She was ailing before my eyes, and I stood and took a slight step away from her, even though I knew it was already too late. It's not clinic policy. In fact, it's against the law, but if it were me, I would consider taking my family somewhere to be looked after properly, where their bodies will be cared for. Horror replaced the dread and despondency that turned in my gut and inched its way up my throat. You mean take them with me? I imagined holding my dead wife in my arms and the weight of a tiny lifeless baby in my hands. Take them out of this clinic, to God knows where. She coughed again, and this time I felt the air shift between us. The nurse was right. This was the plague, and no one was coming for my family. None of us had much time left. My weakening muscles and fatigue were proof of it. A wave of calm washed over me at the thought. If I didn't make it through the virus, I wouldn't have to go on living without Hannah and Molly. I'm saying... The woman started again, her voice more raspy than before. Do what you want. No one will stop you. She grabbed a jug of water from behind the desk and chugged it down, wiping her mouth with the back of her arm when she was finished. Then she disappeared into a hallway in the back. I peered around the waiting room of borderline corpses. No one was coming for any of them. No one was left to help. We were on our own now, and Hannah deserved better than this. I couldn't stay here, and I wouldn't leave without her, uncertain what would happen to her body or if I'd ever see her again. Spotting an abandoned stretcher from the hallway, I went over to it, grabbed hold, and used it to brace me up in my days and wheeled it into the room where my wife and child lay. I pushed it up beside the operating table, forcing my thoughts of insanity aside as I tried to validate what I was doing. Taking a dead body from the hospital. Two bodies. I stared down at Hannah's beautiful face, remembering the way her golden eyes smiled, even when she was trying to be serious, and the way her eyebrow lifted ever so slightly when she really meant business. I committed it all to memory, praying the day never came, that the memory faded. Then... Clenching my jaw, I gathered her body into my arms and placed her on the gurney. It was impossible to ignore the blood staining the white sheets, so I grabbed a clean one from the cupboard and draped it over her, hoping it would help me forget, but it didn't. When she was on the gurney, I pulled the sheet up higher, covering her shoulders and then her face, and strapped her body in. The significance of what was happening poked holes in the failing armor I grasped onto. I needed to do this. I needed to get out of here. I just needed to be strong a little while longer. Rallying what remained of my fortitude, I turned to the incubator. It was essentially a shoebox housing a newborn corpse swaddled in linen, and knowing it would break the very last pieces of my heart, I reached in and gathered Molly into my arms. I drew her to my chest, holding her for the first time. Fearing I would regret not seeing her at least once, I peeled the layers around Molly's face back. Even if it was only to say goodbye, my hands shook and my lungs constricted as I peered down at her. Her eyes were closed. Her nose was tiny and her cheeks were chubby. She was perfect, tiny, but perfect. She was my daughter the only one I would ever have, and I never got to meet her. Our little miracle. She was probably gone before Hannah could take her last breath. Eyes blurred with tears. I lifted her closer and kissed her tiny forehead. Goodbye, little one. I choked out. Then I placed her in the crook of her mother's arm, wishing I could join them. Tan 33, we have a 5150 at the gardens. Are you still in the area? Sitting in the truck outside my house, I listened to the dispatcher's voice over the radio. 
She requested one unit after the other, and no one responded. It was nearly eight o'clock in the morning, and the sky would be dark for another couple hours still. The snow had let up, though. I glanced around at the quiet street. Unit 33, come in. Over. Hands shaking with rage and vision blurred with tears, I pulled out my cell phone and dialed Ross. I'd never heard back from him. I didn't know if he was okay, and even if he were, he wouldn't be for very long after I gave him the news. I squeezed my eyes shut and told myself to prepare for the worst, so I was glad when the call went straight to voicemail. I tried Hannah's parents next, my fingers pulling up their number without thinking much more about it. It needed to be done. It was that simple. The call went straight to the operator. We're sorry, your call cannot go through. Please try your call again later. All units, the dispatcher's voice came through the radio again, but I tuned her out, dropped my phone on the console, and forced myself to open the driver door. Hannah deserved more than this. She needed to be at peace, and I needed to be the one to make that happen. Body stiff and my mind not nearly numb enough, I got out of the truck, welcoming the seven-degree Fahrenheit wind chill that accosted me. Trudging through the snow to the other side of the truck, I braced myself to take Hannah and the baby in my arms once again. Hannah's body felt heavier than before, my legs less steady, my strength drained from me with each step toward the house. But still, I hesitated at the stoop, staring at the door handle. The last time I carried her through this door, we'd just bought the house and had spent our last ten dollars cash on burgers from Bud's in Celebration. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. I could almost smell the scent of her amber perfume mingling with french fries. I wouldn't walk into an empty house this time. There would be blood, probably signs of the struggle, and there would be evidence and clues. For the first time, my sadness was overshadowed with rage, and a small, minuscule part of me bloomed with optimism and retribution. As Hannah grew heavier in my arms, I ignored the churning in my stomach at what was to come, and turned the unlocked handle and stepped inside. Fleetingly, I knew I needed to thank Mr. Hutton for doing what he could to save Hannah, and I would ask him what information he had that would help me in the process, if he was even still alive. I bit my lip and peered around the living room. It was trashed, but the flat screen was still there. So was the computer on the desk. My cop mind inventoried everything as I walked over to the couch and laid Hannah's body down, the baby with her, and my muscles felt an instant reprieve. I unfolded Hannah's favorite blanket from the back of the couch and placed it over their bodies. The scanner in the bookshelf against the wall went off, and amidst my numb mind, I heard another 5150 call, and the victim being DOA, and that's when I made the connection. Blinded by a frenzied understanding, I headed down the hallway straight for the bedroom. The blue comforter was perfectly made, and nothing was out of place, save for my gun locker, which was shot open. My 12-gauge and 22 were missing. A few bullets were strewn on the ground, but the boxes of ammo were gone. Whoever broke into my house was willing to leave a pregnant woman for dead just to have them. I kicked the locker with a roar and pounded on the wall so hard my fist went through it. The pain replaced the hurt for a single second, but it was enough. I cursed. I kicked. I wailed. The intruder was someone who knew I was a cop and would have guns. They had to have known. I stomped back down the hall, so close to the edge I could feel myself teetering between recklessness and all-out fury. I would find the person who did this, but I wouldn't kill them. I would do something much, much worse. But when I saw the bloody skid marks in the kitchen and a lifeless male form, my feet would no longer move. My breath caught in my throat. A tuft of red hair tumbled across the tiled floor on the wake of my footsteps and I eyed the man's knotted, shoulder-length hair and torn long sleeve shirt. I flipped him onto his back, his brown eyes open and glazed over, his cheeks lined with dry blood and a fingernail slash. It was Charlie, a man who lived a few houses down and owned a tree service I'd inquired about a few years back. He had a bullet wound in his chest. She'd fought back. Hannah had told me years ago she'd never remember the code to the gun safe, 
because she would never use it. I wanted her to be able to protect herself, so I put a revolver in the most obscure, accessible place I could imagine, the top shelf in the pantry. I strode across the kitchen, feeling a strange sense of relief, and I opened the floor to ceiling cupboard. The gun was gone, the cloth it was wrapped in, discarded under my boot. The revolver hadn't saved her life, but it had given her a fighting chance. The images came fast and hard. Hannah's surprise in seeing him, her fear and inevitable pleas as she covered her belly, and her determination to protect our child until her dying breath. Alone, with no husband to protect her, she'd given him hell and took him down with her. Insurmountable pride and regret filled every inch of me. Then came anguish. I kicked Charlie's body, shouting and cursing him until I couldn't hold myself up anymore and fell against the side of the fridge. The guns were gone, but the door was unlocked and anyone could have taken them. Even Mr. Hutton might have, if he were smart. Tremors shimmied up my leg and rattled the retribution loose. Hannah killed him, and in doing so, she took the revenge, holding me together. I couldn't punish him because he was already dead. Impending recklessness and despair circled me like vultures waiting to feast. I'd done so well because of her. I'd become the man she saw in me the first day we met. But I hadn't been here to save her, and without her, I wasn't strong enough to be the man she'd want me to be now. I climbed to my feet, stepping through the blood as I reached for the handle of tequila in the cupboard above the fridge. I couldn't get the cap off fast enough before I brought the bottle to my lips, heavy and full as it was. I was a drunk, and I'd always be one. I think those were my dad's words the day I swore I'd never confide in him again. I took one swig after another, desperate to numb the pain until I could no longer breathe and had to stop to catch my breath. The bottle hung at my side my heart pounding in my chest and the familiar warmth of liquid oblivion coursing through me. A small voice somewhere told me I should call Ross again, or try to find him. But he was probably dead or sick and would be soon. I flicked on the porch light and stared out at the backyard covered in snow. The only thing visible aside from the fence was the spruce where Hannah had asked me to hang a swing. It'll be perfect in the spring and summer. I can rock her back and forth by the garden. I hadn't had the heart to tell her she never had a green thumb. The scanner continued to click and buzz incessantly in the living room. I took another slug from the bottle, then another. I drank until my throat was raw and it felt like I'd burned the sickness stewing inside me away. Then I turned back to the couch where Hannah lay. Did I bury her in the frozen ground or sit with her until I drank myself to death? Ross wasn't around to ask. I was alone. When the scanner went off again, I set the tequila down on the table with a clunk and pulled the radio off the bookshelf, smashing it over the back of the dining room chair to silence it permanently. Taking another swig from the bottle, I let the fear and sorrow overwhelm me until I could no longer see through body-racking sobs and a veil of tears. I had a long night ahead of me, followed by an excruciating forever. 9. L. December 10th When I stirred from the fathoms of a dreamless sleep, my body ached and what felt like a furnace burned in my core. My veins were like tunnels blazing with fire. The floor creaked somewhere in the house and my murky thoughts sharpened as my eyes flew open. It took a heartbeat to remember anything beyond the ache in my abdomen, tender from retching. My throat was raw and sweat covered my skin. But despite all of that, my body felt renewed alive in a way it never had before. I stretched, waking my taut muscles from hibernation. The pale blue promise of morning crested over the treetops, breaking up the dark shadows outside my bedroom window. It must have been nine or ten if the sun was rising, unless it was sunset. I wasn't sure how long I'd been out, but I recalled the bar and shots of whiskey. Big mistake. I sat up with a groan, my head throbbing a little, and peered around my old bedroom. 
That was not how I'd seen the night playing out. I wasn't even sure what day it was. It was as if I'd been asleep for ages, and yet my body felt like it had been only a matter of hours since I'd lurched over the toilet, puking my insides out. The floor creaked again, somewhere in the living room, and louder than before. Dr. John's face flashed to mind, but I pushed it away. I heard the sound of a shoe scuff, loud and heavy. Another creak. Someone was in the house, and I braced myself for them to appear in the hallway outside my open door. Trembling and weak, I held my breath and climbed as quietly from the bed as I could. The rug was stiff beneath my bare feet, the cold air brushing over my warmed skin. I stopped as the floorboard shifted beneath my feet, but there was no noise to follow, and no one appeared in my doorway. What were the chances it was Sandy Fields? She had a key. Or was it a random robbery and they didn't know I was here? I thought of the faces at the bar and the men who might have followed me home. The kitchen door leading out to the garage creaked open and I heard a male voice muttering. It wasn't Sandy Fields in the house. Heartbeat skipping from a thud to a full-on sprint, I scoured the morning shadows for my phone. A cold wave of dread washed over me when I saw my pants on the floor in the hallway, phone sticking out of my pocket, discarded in the craze of my fever. Shit, I always did that. I told myself it would fall out of my pocket one day into a toilet bowl and I would be sorry, but not as sorry as I was now, knowing someone was in my house and it was so far out of reach. I stopped just shy of the doorway shoring up my nerve to rush out and grab it before the intruder came back into the house. I could hear him rifling through the garage, looking for something. He was loud and careless, and I was thankful. I knew exactly where he was. I peeked around the doorframe. My pants were only a few feet away. If I didn't grab my phone now, I might not get another chance. Exhaling, I dropped to my knees and crawled out into the hallway, praying he would stay in the garage a few minutes longer. I reached for my phone as a tall man with broad shoulders stepped back into the dining room, the threshold creaking under his weight. He was facing my direction as he peered frantically around. I didn't dare move. Where is it? He growled and knocked an empty water pitcher off the table. The sound of shattering glass filled the house as it hit the ground. My chin trembled, trying to see who it was in the morning shadows, uncertain why it mattered. I might have survived the fever simply to die at the will of a stranger. As if something suddenly occurred to him, he lifted his head, facing me fully, and headed right toward me. I swallowed a whimper, uncertain if he'd actually seen me. Then he stopped mid-step, and I saw the recognition on his face. You, he shouted, it was Thomas, the neighbor, only he was a menacing version whose eyes rounded and he seethed when he spat my name. Where did you hide it? I need it, now! I ran back into my room and slammed the door shut. My hands shook, my eyes blurred with fearful tears, and my mind screamed at me to do something as I glanced around the room. Thomas's footsteps were heavy and quick behind me, and without a chair to bolster beneath the doorknob, and the dresser on the other side of the room, I scrambled to find a solution. I yanked the metal curtain rod off the wall just as he barreled through the door. Get away from me, I shouted, ramming him in the chest with the finial on the end. He stumbled back, but then kept coming toward me. Give me his medical bag, you little bitch, he ground out. It's in his bedroom, I shouted. It was a lie. I didn't know where the hell it was or if Dr. John still had one. You're lying. I jabbed him with the finial again, but it was like he couldn't feel it, each blow only knocking him off balance for a millionth of a second before he was lunging at me again. Desperate to hurt him enough to pass, I rammed him in the stomach and then the chest until he tore the rod from my grip like he was unfazed and I was nothing more than an annoying wasp. I ran for the lamp on the side table, ripping it out of the wall and threw it at him. Thomas stumbled back this time, 
onto my bed, and I ran past him, gripping my phone in my hand and praying I could put enough distance between us to use it. I'd only taken a few steps before something solid slammed into the back of my head, and I fell to the ground, a smarting pain shooting down my neck. Everything around me swirled, and I winced as my skull began to throb. The vision of Thomas was a blur as he gripped hold of my shirt and rolled me onto my back. He wrapped his hands around my neck, making me gasp and brought his nose within inches of mine. His hot breath pressed against my face as he shouted, only I couldn't make out the words. They boomed and blared, but his grip was too tight. My body began to burn so intensely I thought I might implode. I gulped for air and hit my fists against his arms and face, but it was pointless. His grip was ironclad, crunching my windpipe, and my vision began to gray. Thomas was killing me. The heat was alive inside of me. It blazed and flickered against my skin, trying to get out as he smashed my head on the hardwood floor. This could not be my end, dying at the hands of a man in a place I swore I'd never return. I hadn't gone through years of therapy to come back and die in this godforsaken house. Resolve turned to hardened clarity, and I used every ounce of energy flickering inside me and lunged for Thomas's throat. Every muscle in my body lit like fire, coursing with an unbridled strength I'd never felt before. Every cell was alive and pulsating as I clutched his neck in my hands, unable to stop myself from squeezing. I was a forge of red-hot hatred, and tears stung my eyes. Fire burned in the tips of my fingers, and my body shook with a fury that scorched away every lingering fear. Screw you, I choked out, half in shock as I felt the power in me surge. Thomas let go of my neck and hit at my hands as I squeezed tighter, grew stronger. The fire inside stirred, blooming in the depths of me, and I felt it leave my body with a final squeeze. Thomas's eyes widened and bulged. His face reddened and his tongue fell from his mouth as he let out one last silent scream. As he gurgled his last breath, I shut my eyes. My muscles deflated as the last of the energy flowed from my fingers. Then I curled into a ball and cried. I peeled my eyes open to the brightness of day and stared up at the taupe ceiling. My head was pounding, but my body felt lighter. The heaviness was gone, so was the heat. Jolting upright, I saw the dead man wilted beside me. Thomas's eyes were still open, his mouth was agape. There were burn marks the shape of fingers around his neck, and I clasped my hands over my mouth and scurried backward until I was flush against the wall, shaking. He was dead, and I had killed him. I stared down at my trembling hands. What had I done? What could I do? Tears filled my eyes as I tried to bite back the impending sobs. I'd never killed anyone before. I had ended a human life with my hands. I turned my palms over, scouring them for burn marks, fisting my fingers, searching for the fire I'd felt consume me. Every fiber, every inch. It was impossible. And yet somewhere deep down, I could still feel it writhing inside me. I looked at Thomas again, emotions clamoring through me, exacting whatever pieces of my sanity were left. Fear, regret, confusion, relief. He was going to kill me, and I'd killed him first. I killed him. My fingerprints were seared around his neck to prove it. Staring at my hands, I tried to understand. They were just hands with fingers, like they'd always been, and they were unscathed. I glanced from the burn marks on Thomas's neck to my hands, remembering the euphoric release as the fire, scorching within me, leached from my fingertips. Then I turned to the side and retched. 10. Jackson. December 10th. 
There was movement in the darkness, a rustling, a jolting. My mind stirred as my body shook. No, I was being shaken. I smelled the stench of decay before I registered the blunt fingertips at my waist and my eyes flew open. A hulking form crouched beside me, tugging at my belt. What the fuck? I jerked away, my body stiff and sore as I reached for my holstered gun, but it was too late. It was already in the man's hand. I can't, he muttered through chapped lips, peering down at the gun in his shaking hands. What? I scrambled back as he tightened his grip on the Glock. His blonde hair was matted to the side of his head, his body covered in a sheen of sweat. Put the gun down, I told him. Put it down. Even in a liquor-induced coma, I could find my voice. Sir, put it down, I said more calmly, but my insides were screaming, my muscles were weak, and my head was throbbing. I willed myself to focus. You can have anything you want in here. You want more guns? I'll get you more guns. The man shook his head, tears streaming down his ruddy cheeks. He looked no older than I was. I can't, he cried. He aimed the barrel at me. I'd had a gun pulled on me before, but never my own. Never had I been so close. I could see the yellow flecks against the blue in the eyes of my assailant. I just can't. His eyes met mine with finality. I can't stop it. I can't stop any of it. He gripped the gun more firmly. I swallowed the bile rising in my throat. He would kill me. I didn't need the virus to kill me or to drink myself to death. The lunatic sitting on my living room floor would do it for me. I'd wanted to die, and now I was getting my wish. Even so, my instinct was to flee, to talk him down and save my skin. I lifted my hands, no longer stupefied, but afraid. You don't want to do this, man. His gaze shifted from the gun to me. He looked through me. I have to, he wheezed. The saliva was white and gathered in the corners of his mouth, and he was ill, unlike anything I'd ever seen. It's the voice, he cried, making me jump. I have to. Put the gun down, man. I'm a state trooper. Bad things will happen if you shoot me. The man laughed, the sound reverberating through the house, vaguely reminding me how empty the place was. How cold. There's nothing you can do, he said. Before I could process anything else, he pressed the pistol beneath his chin and pulled the trigger. I doubled over and covered my ears too late against the ear-splitting bang. Shit, I hissed, blinking as the room spun and the sound reverberated through my body, concussive and visceral. Heaving out a breath, I grabbed the gun from his slack hold and slid it across the room, backing away as fast as I could. I stopped only when my back slammed into the wall and I blinked. I stared at the dead man on my floor and ran my hand over my face and through my hair. Brains splattered the wall, brains and blood dripping onto the floor. I'd seen gunshot wounds and fatal motorcycle accidents. I'd seen what an overdose looked like, puke and needles and blood. But this was different. This was my home. This was my life. And bile rose up my throat faster than I could scramble to the door. I was barely on the porch when I doubled over and hurled everything out over the railing. The tequila burned my nose and throat. My muscles twisted and my eyes watered as I heaved out a steadying breath. What the fuck just happened? I wiped the moisture from my eyes and spit the remnants of vomit from my throat as I sat down on the porch step. I dragged a chest full of air into my lungs, then another, and stared out at a world of white. The snow had stopped, but not before the roads were piled high and abandoned. My street was eerily quiet. The neighbor's front door creaked open and shut with the breeze. There was no residual noise from the overpass ten blocks down, no engines roaring in the distance or horns honking. There were no birds chirping. I peered up at the leafless trees that lined my street. It felt as though I was the last person left. Chills trickled down my spine as gray daylight filtered through the clouds. 
I glanced at my truck in the driveway and did a double take. It was beaten to hell. The windows were smashed and the side paneling was dented, like someone had come at it with a sledgehammer. Gritting my teeth, I rose with achy knees and retreated back into the house, prepared to shoot the man on the floor again, just for good measure. That changed the instant I stumbled and stopped beside Hannah's covered body. Part of me needed to remove the blanket to prove she was still there, but I hesitated. Hours of oblivion had come at a price. I had no idea how much time had passed or what it had done to her. What would she look like? Worse wasn't how I wanted to remember her, but the part of me desperate to discover it was all a dream couldn't resist. As I inched the blanket back, her dappled skin sent my pulse racing and my heartbeat thrashed in my ears. I dropped the blanket again. I couldn't do it. I couldn't look at her. But I couldn't move her body either. Where would I take it? What would I do with it when I got there? Unsteadily, I began to pace. Two break-ins. Too many deaths. The world was silent and the news was right. It was the end. It was the fucking end. And I needed protection. I needed answers, too. Where was Ross? Where were Kelsey and my dad? I couldn't be the only one left, even if the world seemed to be standing still. I stared at the dead body on the living room floor. Even if the madness was following me everywhere I turned, I couldn't be the only one left. I looked at the body in the kitchen. If I did nothing, soon it would be impossible to stay. Forcing my mind to forget the hangover or sickness, whichever it was, I went to the closet and pulled out a set of sheets. Not the Egyptian cotton ones that were Hannah's favorite, but the old ones I used to have in my old apartment that we never used. I covered the man in the living room first, unable to stomach the hole in his head, then covered the rotting man in the kitchen. In a matter of hours, our home had become a crypt, a lonely, condemned house, and I couldn't stay here anymore. I grabbed what was left of the tequila, walked to the sliding glass door, and peered out at the backyard. This is where Hannah would want to rest. I took a long pull from the bottle and set it down again. Uncertain where I'd left my phone, I headed to the bedroom for Hannah's on the charger on the bedside table. Seven missed calls from Ross. The tension in my neck eased slightly, and I almost laughed. The son of a bitch might still be alive. I clicked his number to call him back, but it went straight to voicemail again. I hung up and called again, then again before I finally left a message. Ross, if you're alive, I need to talk to you. I'm at the house. You should come. My throat swelled with regret. At least call me back as soon as you can. Biting back the tears, I exhaled a ragged breath. I hope you're okay, brother, I said. Then I hung up. Hastily wiping the tears from my eyes, I called 911 to report the bodies on my living room floor, but the line only rang. I tried the police department next, the menu giving me too many extensions, none of which worked, before I ended the call and strode back out to the living room. My wife and child were dead on my couch. Two intruders were rotting on my floor, and I was running out of time and options. Imagining Hannah and Molly in a hole in the ground shredded me, but I would do what I had to. I would find a place to take the bodies, clean up the house, and then I would bury my family in the backyard. After that, I would drink myself into oblivion and find Ross if I hadn't heard back from him by then. 11. L. December 11th. Oh, I missed your calls. I'm sorry, but look, I know you're going to look for me, but don't, okay? I'm not well. Just don't come to Whiteley, okay? It's not safe. I'd missed a call from Jenny somewhere between the bar and waking up shaking and half naked on my bedroom floor after crying myself to sleep. Every ounce of energy had been drained from me, just like Thomas's body, still crumpled beside me on the floor when I'd opened my eyes. It hadn't been a nightmare. 
I stared at my closed bedroom door, chewing on the broken skin on my bottom lip. Don't come to Whiteley. Ginny's message was eerily calm despite her being sick, perhaps on the verge of death. It made me think she might be okay. I was okay, wasn't I? I thought of Thomas's burned neck and studied my hands for the hundredth time. I was alive, anyway. I pushed the growing hysteria as deep down as it would go. There was a logical explanation for all of this. My hands were still normal, my fingers wiggling and my skin unchanged. I could almost convince myself the night of terror was only a hallucination caused by the fever, that it hadn't actually happened. Or maybe I was just losing my mind. It wouldn't be that surprising. Yet, when I cracked open the door, Thomas was still there. A lifeless mound I couldn't bear to see, covered by a blanket. I shut the door again, staring at it. I could feel it inside of me still. The fire, moving around like some foreign being was crawling beneath my skin. Only it was electrified, an incessant dull hum. Squeezing my eyes shut, I exhaled. Jenny was my focus, not what partial memories lingered from my fever-induced haze. The sound of an explosion emanated from the television in the living room, and I abandoned my useless pacing outside the bedroom door to watch the news footage. The afternoon gray filtered in through the windows and filled the house, still in disarray from the morning. Video came in last night, the male voiceover explained. Chief Gonzalez of the Alaska State Troopers says the lack of police force in such a remote, expansive state has always been an obstacle, making the average response time outside of the city between 15 and 30 minutes. But this, the camera swept up and down a cluttered downtown street, eerily devoid of traffic. Two vandals wearing black clothes and Halloween masks ran in and out of the frame, between buildings and around abandoned vehicles. And here is viewer footage from somewhere in the Government Hill neighborhood. The screen cut to suburbs where an abandoned car in the middle of the road was covered in an inch of snow, with the shape of a body still inside. Please be advised, this is unedited and possibly disturbing footage, the news anchor said, his voice grim. The images changed from one neighborhood to the next. Viewer discretion is advised. Another video flashed onto the screen, of a house across the street being filmed through the window. There have been gunshots inside for the last 20 minutes. I don't know if it's Jim or Barbara. They've always been nice people. The woman's voice cracked, and I leaned forward, holding my breath as I closely watched the house cast in dying sunlight, uncertain what would come next. My heart thumped once, then again, and then a gunshot and flash of light lit the screen. I jumped where I stood and covered my mouth. Oh my God, the woman behind the camera whimpered. I don't know what's going on over there. The footage shook as she broke into a coughing fit. I called the troopers, but no one's come yet. I keep thinking it's too late. I mean, what do they keep shooting at? She cleared her throat, her breaths asthmatic and shallow. The lights in the room flashed on and she squealed. Turn the lights off, Eddie. They flicked off almost immediately, and a little boy whined. Go back into the room. Close the door. Go. The camera whirled as she hurried around, coughing and shepherding the boy into the hallway, until she went back to the window, coughed, and refocused with another shallow breath. My husband took our car to work this morning, and I haven't heard from him since. She sniffled. The troopers have to come. They have to, right? The little boy began to cry in the background. The woman cursed, shrieking for him to be quiet before the video went black. Footage has been sent into KTUU from around the city, and while some Alaskan citizens are trying to flee, others are preparing to hunker down and wait it out. A man in a hockey mask flashed on the screen. We knew it would come to this inevitably, he said, severe as he rested his elbows on his knees. He leaned closer to the camera, peering around at a storage room I couldn't make out. You'll get supplies and prepare for the worst if you want to survive. No one is coming for us. We're on our own. 
It's the end of the 21st century as we know it. Suddenly, the man's eyes widened with excitement. Survival of the fittest! After a hoorah and a fist pump, the screen went black. Finally, a cell phone recording scanned a large room in what looked like a hospital, overwhelmed with sickness. The number of dead worldwide is unknown, but official reports claim more than half of the United States is infected. The Coast Guard is blockading all ports to prohibit further spread of the deadly virus. Since the governor's ESA on Tuesday, I clicked the television off. There was nothing left inside of me to throw up, and every clip was the same. Each one made the dread knot tighter inside my stomach. Each new face and disturbing story was a blaring taunt that if the fever didn't get me, someone else likely would. I got it. We were fucked. And I had to figure out what I would do before I let it all implode and fear prevented me from getting to Ginny. She was all I had left, and she was in Whiteley. My sister needed me. Glancing at my bedroom door, I told myself that Thomas was dead. There was nothing I could do about him. Not anymore. And if I continued to wait for 911 or someone to arrive, it could be too late for Ginny. I walked to the French doors facing the deck and stared out at the world shrouded in white, the grim sky promising a storm. Whatever I decided to do, I had to keep going. If I stayed here much longer, I might not be able to leave. When Dr. Rothman encouraged me to return home, I don't think she'd expected this. Was she even still alive? I hoped so. She never wore a wedding band, but I hoped she wasn't completely and utterly alone, like I was. Except for Jenny. Whiteley was only a few hours away. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't at least try to make it to her. Decision made, I plopped down on the couch and pulled on my boots. Her living in such a small, remote town had to have some advantages. Maybe it meant the fever would pass quickly, and by tomorrow night, Jenny and I would be passed out on the couch, bored out of our minds and watching black and white movies like we used to. My heart ached with hope, even if I knew full well that wasn't likely. It took only a few minutes to pack my things strewn around the living room, but I knew I'd need what few clothes I had. Donning my scarf and parka, I flung open the front door. The instant I saw old Olive covered in snow, I knew it would be impossible to get to Whiteley if I didn't have a better vehicle. I peered over my shoulder at the garage door. Dr. John used to have a Bronco, one that rumbled and grumbled like it could take on anything. Turning on my heels, I headed across the house, wheeling my small luggage behind me. Relief eased the tension in my shoulders when I saw the old Bronco was still inside. I snatched the only keys on the hook beside the door and stepped down into the mess Thomas had left in search for the medical bag. I had no idea what he'd wanted it for, but he was crazed enough to try to kill me in order to get it. Stepping over the hammer, nails, and different sized screws strewn across the ground, I clutched a corner of the car cover and flung it up and over the Bronco. It was just as mean looking as I remembered it. The black paint sparkled, even in the dingy garage light, and the mud tires looked like they could chew up anything that came their way. I almost thanked Dr. John for such a glorious, unexpected gift. As I walked around the front of the Bronco, tugging the cover the rest of the way off, I debated calling the police again. But it was clear they weren't coming. Not soon, anyway. Not after what I'd seen on the news. I opened the driver's side door and paused. I might have had good intentions going to find Jenny, but after what I'd seen on TV, other people clearly didn't. And I hadn't spent the last year with Dr. Rothman working on my needlepoint. She'd helped me work through sexual abuse, abandonment, being victimized, and all the crap that fell in between. I wasn't going to forget all of that now. Peering through the passenger side window, I stared at Dr. John's gun safe against the farthest wall. Like most Alaskans, he enjoyed his seasonal hunting trips. And how stupid would I be to go out there into the madness without a way to protect myself? I could use a gun, even if I hoped I wouldn't need to. My feet didn't wait for me to contemplate any of it. 
I had no idea what I would find in the safe, but if there was anything inside, I would take it. I expected to find his old shotgun and some bullets, maybe. If I was lucky, he'd have a handgun in there, too. I spun the combination lock, assuming his tendencies hadn't changed, and I was right. One perk of having twin stepdaughters, Dr. John didn't have to choose which birthday combo he'd use. When the door creaked open, I let out a breath of relief. His 20 gauge stood tall, shiny and clean, but it was the smaller case and ammo box that made me smile. I set the gun case on the work table and flipped it open to find a Glock 17. A sigh of relief escaped my throat and I squeezed my eyes shut. I closed the gun case and walked back to the Bronco, snatching the box of ammo along the way. My day was getting better already. 12. Jackson. December 11th. I regret to tell you that as of midnight on the 10th of December, over 80% of the world's population has been reported or is assumed dead. It is estimated that the death toll will continue to climb. This news is devastating, I know, but all is not lost. I broke the rest of my Ford's busted window out as the president yammered on. Her voice, more white noise against the bone-chilling wind, turned what few parts of me weren't marinated in tequila to ice. Maybe another drink would remedy that. I glanced at the bottle belted in the seat next to me, making a mental note to stop at the store at some point to grab some bourbon, my trusty old friend. Moving the bodies and cleaning the blood from the house was a haze. Good. I had blood-stained hands as proof it wasn't just a horrific dream, and that was enough. Some of us are surviving. This is how we will fight our enemy, by not giving up, by being resilient and resourceful, by surviving. We are not a species that will go out quietly, so I task those of you who are still alive with one essential purpose. Live. Shit. I swerved around a Nissan stopped in the middle of the road that seemed to come out of nowhere. I'd only seen two other cars in motion, and with vehicles scattered everywhere, some abandoned to others' mausoleums, it was easy to forget that someone else might be on the road, or that I wasn't actually the last person alive. I blasted through a red light and turned onto Elmore Road. The American and Alaskan flags flapped half-staff in the oncoming storm as I drew closer to the police department. I might have been drunk, but I wasn't stupid. I knew that the instant I decided to step out of my police vehicle, especially one battered to shit that looked stolen, I was probably barbecue. To anyone inside, I'd look either crazy in my blood-covered uniform or like a threat. And it was clear the world didn't care about the rules and repercussions much anymore. Everything was falling apart. The world had fucking lost it. I had fucking lost it, laying Hannah and Molly to rest in their grave. I pulled the truck to a stop out front of the building and hesitated to get out. Not because I cared what would happen once I did, but because I feared what I would find inside. An empty place with no sign of Ross or any other familiar, friendly face still breathing. I thought of the inconsolable man hovering over me when I awoke. How many others were like that? Was anyone I knew still alive? It didn't feel like it. Ross's townhouse had been empty with no signs of a struggle and no note. The APD was my last hope. Unbuckling the tequila, I lifted what remained of the contents and took a gulp. I wasn't quite drunk enough to start spiraling yet. I took one pull, then another, eyeing the darkened windows for signs of life. On any other Friday, I might have stopped by to harass Ross, still stuck in his office, filing reports and making follow-up calls to eyewitnesses and bereft families. Today, I just prayed he was there. I pushed the driver's side door open and stepped out of the truck, my jacket catching in the wind. The afternoon was darkening to evening, and soon there would be only a whirl of white. The longer I stood there, the more quickly my buzz diminished. Unclipping my pistol from my belt, I slowly made my way toward the front door. Footprints were visible in the snow, coming and going from the entrance, though it was hard to make heads or tails of them packed on top of one another. 
My gut told me someone was inside, but I would find out for sure soon enough. Aiming my Glock, I pulled the door open and stepped inside, then swept the room to my right. An acerbic scent took me back, followed by a growl that reverberated from down the hall behind me. Drop the gun, asshole! A familiar voice warned. With an audible breath, I smiled. Does your mother let you talk to her with that mouth? I turned around, ecstatic tears in my eyes. Jackson, Jesus! Ross barreled over and wrapped his arms around me. You're alive, you lucky son of a bitch! He breathed. He took a step back as his shadowed blue eyes scoured my face. Where have you been? I asked. I tried calling you back. Ross shook his head and put his hands on his hips. He was still suited up in his blues like me, and he looked haggard, also like me, but other than the dark circles under his eyes and some scruff, he looked like the same old Ross. He wasn't senseless, just sleep-deprived, and I would have wept if I had any tears left in me. I had been passed out of my office up until about an hour ago. I woke up to Drago's nose in my crotch. He glanced at the German shepherd licking my hand. My phone's in my truck, I guess. Probably dead. He shook his head. His brow quirked with uncertainty. I've been a little out of it the past couple days. I wasn't sure I was going to get through that fever. It's all sort of a blur. I peered down at the dog sniffing my boots. Where's Calvin? I asked. Drago never left his partner's side. No clue. On patrol, at home, dead. He shrugged, his confusion a relief after wondering if I'd ever see him again. I don't remember if he was here when I stopped in to puke my brains out or not. He looked squarely at me. There are bodies in the back. Dimitri, Steph, Barnes. I was moving them out of their offices when Drago growled at you coming in. I figured I should cover them up or... He shook his head. I don't know what to do with them. I don't know what we're supposed to do. He nodded to the break room. Have you seen the news? I shook my head. I didn't need to see the news. I'd seen enough with my own eyes to know we were up shit creek. A soundless police department with blinking overhead lights and the scent of bile in the air was only a reminder. I turned it on to another ESA saying we're fucked and to shelter in place. What the shit is that going to do? I stood quietly and listened as he processed what I already had. Ross crouched down and ran his hands over his buzzed head, scrubbing and scrubbing until I thought he might rub his scalp raw. Then, he stopped and peered up at me. The quarantine came too late. We might be up here in our own piece of winter wonderland, but all those ships coming in every day, all those tourists, that shit is spread like wildfire. He walked to the phone at the reception desk and pounded on the keys as he brought the receiver to his ear. Shelter in place, my ass. He grumbled something else and shook his head again. I've tried calling Kelsey a hundred times in the last 20 minutes. I need to go to Fairbanks and check on her. She's staying with her mom. I have to know if she's all right. Then you should go, I told him. It was the only thing that would give him peace, and maybe he'd be luckier than I was. Waiting with his ear to the phone, he peered at me through dark eyes that were rimmed with red and swollen from too much sleep. I knew his question was coming. It was only a matter of time and I averted my gaze. He slammed the phone down when there was no answer, weary, and stepped back around the desk. His eyes narrowed and he scratched the side of his face, slack-jawed and staring at me. Then he leaned closer and sniffed. Are you drunk? His eyes landed on the blood on my sleeves, like his relief in seeing me was beginning to fade away and he was finally seeing me for the first time. He stared at my untucked lapel and scruffy face. My hair was shaggy compared to his, but then it always was. I was a rebel that way. I don't know what else he saw, but his back straightened and his jaw clenched. I went by your house that morning, he said, hesitant. After we heard the report, I wanted to check on Hannah, but she wasn't there. No one was. Only a body. I watched with bated breath as his memories from before the fever fell back into place. I checked the regional in Providence. She wasn't at any of the hospitals. I shook my head. No, she wasn't. 
Where's Hannah Jackson? He croaked. Where's my sister? My chin trembled as I grappled with the words. She's gone. 13. L. December 11th. Traffic was fine leaving Anchorage, until the highway took me right over downtown, where the shipyard barricades brought traffic to a complete stop. I stopped behind the biggest mass of cars I'd ever seen. The Coast Guard had done what they said they would and blocked off the port of Alaska. I could see the barges and tankers docked as I drove around stopped vehicles on the overpass. Shipping containers were suspended in midair, abandoned. And yet with all the congestion stretched out in front of me, everything was strangely still. Traffic was a gridlock. Very few officials manned the barricades below. A few flares flickered in the dying daylight. I rested my elbow on the door, rubbed my temple, and heaved out a sigh. I was never a patient person, but this was excruciating. I was stuck in a sea of taillights and white puffs of air streaming from tailpipes. No one was moving. I peered longingly at the other side of the highway. There was no traffic. No one was trying to get into the city. Everyone was trying to get out. I was tempted to bust through whatever barrier was covered by the snow and continue south. The Bronco's heater hissed, and the fuel gauge sunk to less than half, and I still had 50 miles until Whiteley, according to my phone's GPS. Honking would do no good, and waiting wasn't an option. Leaning over the passenger seat, I strained to see down at the Corolla in the next lane. A woman in the driver's seat had her head back on the seat rest. Her eyes were wide, and her mouth was gaping. I blinked. Swallowed, I sucked in a breath. Then, prying my eyes from the second dead body I'd ever seen in my life, I looked out at the sea of vehicles. This wasn't a traffic jam. It was a graveyard. I didn't know how many of the drivers were dead or just slow to catch on, like me. But I wasn't going to sit among them a second longer regardless. I glanced around feeling like a rebel as I contemplated what to do next. Whether I backed up or found another way off the overpass, I would be breaking a dozen laws. But then I'd already committed worse than reckless driving today. Shifting the Bronco into four-wheel drive, I cranked the steering wheel left and inched my way up the median. The Bronco protested in the thick, unmanned snow, but I was up and over it in seconds. Fleetingly, I worried I would get pulled over and would have to pay a massive fine I wouldn't be able to afford. Or worse, I'd be arrested and Jenny would think I'd never tried to come. But the further I drove without sirens and troopers to stop me, the faster I went until the city was lost behind me and the highway opened up with only a few cars parked on the roads. None of them moved. I'd known things were bad, but I hadn't expected the world to be stopped all around me. Was anyone alive on the roads? I couldn't bear to look, so I kept my eyes forward as I hauled ass to Whiteley. The Coast Guardsmen at the docks might have been the only other people alive other than me. While that didn't seem logical, nothing much did anymore, and I tried not to think about any of it. Between getting to Jenny and failing to ignore the deep burn in my blood, my thoughts were plenty occupied. I flexed my hands on the steering wheel. Minutes went by, then what felt like hours. Finally, I turned onto the frontage road toward Whiteley. I half expected them to glow red through the quilted fabric. No matter how much I tried to tell myself it was a freak accident or twisted memory, the fire was back. I could feel it stirring in my veins, bubbling up from somewhere I couldn't fathom. My nostrils flared. I gritted my teeth. I steadied my breathing. I'd done everything I could to push the burn away and write it off the first time. I wanted it to be part of the fever, a fluke nightmare with some rational explanation I was too incoherent to remember. I took a deep breath in, held it, 
then exhaled the tension coiling in my arms and shoulders. As the Whiteley Tunnel came into view ahead, I realized it was all that was left between my sister and me. I glanced up at the sky and the black clouds settling in. I didn't know what I would find in Whiteley, but I couldn't go back in the oncoming storm. I wouldn't go back. Entering the tunnel, dimly lit by blinking lights, I followed the one-lane road under the mountain. It was the only way to get to the secluded city. To tune out my escalating panic, I clicked the radio on, hoping for more news about the lower 48. I needed something else to think about. I needed news about a cure or where people were retreating to for safety, something to give me hope. Maybe they discovered it was all an elaborate hoax, like Orson Welles' radio broadcast of War of the Worlds, which had caused a widespread panic. I turned the dial, wading through one static-filled station after another. Enemy has swept through every nation, attacking discreetly, killing indiscriminately. Eyes wide, I looked from the road to the familiar female voice on the radio. We lost thousands before we even knew we were under attack. Many have already fallen, and many more will fall. But we cannot give up the fight. I nearly forgot to breathe as I processed what she was saying. Under attack? Was the president saying she thought it was chemical warfare? I considered Russia and Iran, but neither made sense. The outbreak was worldwide. Millions of people were dying. No, billions of people were already dead. Over the past century, through technological achievements, we made our world smaller. We made the time it takes to communicate across oceans instantaneous, and the time it takes to travel those same routes nearly as fast. We made our world smaller, and in doing so, we sowed the seeds of our own destruction, a global pandemic. I gripped the steering wheel more tightly, grateful for the dull light at the end of the cement tunnel. If the president was alive, that meant she had a plan. She would figure something out eventually. I just had to stay alive and find Jenny in the meantime. I pressed my lips together. My sister would be on the other side of the tunnel. She had to be. Survive. Thrive, the president continued, urging listeners to pray for guidance. Learn from our mistakes. Let the world remain big. And most importantly, live. The broadcast petered out and static returned. I scrambled for the volume. Shit, that couldn't be all. I turned the station dial maniacally, trying to find something else, more information, anything. What were we supposed to do next? I glanced furtively between the road and the radio. What the hell are we supposed to do? I shouted at the president. A bank of snow threatened to block the end of the tunnel, but I could see Jenny's complex a few miles in the distance, ugly, towering, and ominous, yet somehow a beacon. I plowed through the snow, shifting the old Bronco into four-wheel drive again. I wasn't taking any chances. But just as I was through the mound of snow, I ran over something, and my head crashed into the window. Shit! I hissed, cupping my ear. I slammed on the brakes as my ear rang with pain, shooting into my scalp, and through the tears burning the backs of my eyes. A car was abandoned on the side of the road, but I ignored it. Growing more desperate and angry by the second, I gritted my teeth and drove faster. I needed to be out of the car and off the damn road. Jenny and I would figure out what to do after that. She was always the problem solver, even if I didn't agree with her solutions most of the time. I followed the road around the side of the snow-capped mountain, going faster than I probably should have, and ran over another bump. This time, however, I was more prepared. I braced myself and maneuvered around the ones I could see in the growing darkness, listening to static as the radio continued to seek a clear channel. Then the static broke. When I heard the scratchy, high-pitched wail of the words highway and hell blare through the speakers, I immediately dialed past, 
Glad to know KWHL was still playing their adequate end-of-day soundtrack for survival inspiration. But the only other station that came in was the president's speech, her words looping the same as before. She offered no solution. There was no safe haven. I switched to AM, praying there was someone, anyone else broadcasting. I scanned over Mozart's serenade number 13, assuming it was a schedule set, or they might have broadcasted something more pertinent to the situation we were in. I scanned and scanned, finally stopping when I heard a man's animated voice bursting through the speakers. I held my breath to listen and prayed for good news. You heard it from me. It's like I've been saying. They don't want you to know what's really going on. It's all part of the plan. The end of days wasn't just some biblical story. It was part of a master design. His enthusiastic laughter made my skin crawl. Naysayers said I was crazy, but what do you think now? <laughs> I hate to say I told you so, but I did. I told you so. They'll tell you there are safe places to go, but can we really trust them after all of this? I don't. I switched off the radio. The last thing I needed to do was listen to the ranting of someone crazier than I was. I didn't allow myself to even consider that his words might have been true as I parked the Bronco just outside the apartment building next to an SUV covered in several days' worth of snow. I peered up at the ugly, looming high-rise in the middle of picturesque Alaska. There had to be a hundred rooms at least, but only a dozen windows were lit up while the rest remained ominously dark. Jenny's warning boomed back to life. Don't come to Whiteley. Whiteley was well known in Alaska. It was a city under one roof and all that was left of the abandoned military base after a big earthquake in the 60s. It was a hamlet, happily perched on Prince William Sound. The PW Tower housed 200 plus residents, doctors, elected officials, and fishermen alike. Though Whiteley was a place of renowned beauty, it also bred ghost stories and strange disappearances, making it one of Alaska's most famed and intriguing oddities. Cut off from the rest of the world by a single road that wound beneath the mountain, Whiteley seemed the perfect place to hide away until the outbreak blew over. Yet I wondered if I wasn't making a dire decision by going in. The longer I sat in the Bronco staring up at it, the more uncertain I became. What if there were others like Thomas? What if there were others in there like me? Regardless, it needed to be done. Pulling my cap down over my ears and zipping up my jacket, I opened the gun case I'd set on the floor and pulled out the pistol in a full magazine. I stared at the Glock momentarily, wondering if I was being paranoid. I didn't want to scare people by walking in there with a weapon, but after Thomas and the news reports, I couldn't take any more risks than necessary. Inhaling a steadying breath, I told myself this was what I needed to do and pushed open the driver's side door, shoving the pistol in my waistband as I braved the cold. Mountains surrounded the town, barely the size of an Anchorage city block, and abandoned army barracks stood like watchmen on either side, black gaping mouths and eyes where windows and entrances used to be. A cruise ship was anchored at the pier, and I had a sickening suspicion being a port to the Alaska Marine Highway would not work in this town's favor. My footsteps moved more quickly, and in a rush to get to the front steps, I tripped in the snow and fell to the ground. My knees collided with the frozen cement, my palms following. Ugh! I growled, letting the sting settle a bit before I pushed myself up off the ground. The building's exterior lights barely illuminated the darkness as I climbed to my feet. There was only so much a girl could take in a 24-hour time frame, and I was losing my grip. I kicked the lump in the snow, my foot colliding instantly with an unyielding mass, and my ankle twisted at contact. With a silent gasp, I drew back my leg, stifling a maddening cry, then froze. Stripes. I could see colorful, delicate stripes, and I leaned closer. I brushed the snow away 
and screamed. A hand, a glove-covered hand. Stumbling back, I scanned the sporadic white mounds on the ground, understanding instantly. I darted inside, desperate to separate myself from the frozen wasteland of dead, and I slammed the door shut behind me as quickly as the hinges would allow. I stared out at the bodies like they might suddenly move. They were frozen, and logically, I knew they would never move again, but that didn't make me feel any better. Squeezing my eyes shut, I placed my palm on my chest, desperate for it to stop racing, and turned toward the building's interior. Hello? I called, glancing around the stark, drab walls. The place was dead quiet, save for the papers taped to the wall that settled back into place in my wake. Hello? The building felt similar to an old office building, but there were no bustling receptionists wearing too much makeup, and there was no droll elevator music playing from the overhead speakers. I wasn't sure what I smelled, something musty and yet faintly sweet, like an overripe banana, and the cold that clung to my skin turned hot with fear. The fluorescent lights flickered overhead. The pipes in the walls clanked. I pulled my beanie off as the warmth of the building pressed against me like a heated blanket. The doors shuddered in a gust of wind, but I heard no one. While I assumed I was in the lobby, there was no reception desk or directory for reference. There was nothing to denote it was the entry of the building, save for a corkboard with flyers on the left wall just before the elevator and directional signs hanging from the ceiling. I took a step closer. The word stairs was painted over a door, offset to the right. Offices were denoted to the left, mercantile to the right, and long tunnels stretched in both directions. A building like this had to have a managerial or administration team of some sort, and that's who I needed to speak with if I was going to find Jenny's apartment. A phone rang in one of the offices down the hall, so I followed the arrow left. No one's alive. The thought taunted me as I broke into a run. Someone had to be alive. They were calling. I ran faster, my ankle smarting with each step. Light poured out of an open office door into the dimly lit corridor, but the phone stopped mid-ring as I stopped in the doorway of the mayor's office. Hello? I hedged in the doorway. A woman with a mahogany red ponytail slept with her hands folded under her head on her desk. Her head turned away from me. Tentative, I stepped inside. She had a loose, sleeveless blouse tucked into pressed pants, tight around her waist, and a clipboard with a list of names rested on the desktop beside her. The heat inside me swirled, and I tried to catch my breath as my heart beat faster and faster. J.J. St. James was on the top of the list. A line was struck through it. Jennifer June St. James. Did the line mean she was dead or better? Most of the people on the list would have had a line through their name if it meant they were dead, wouldn't they? If billions of people were dying, almost all of them would be crossed out. I stepped closer and reached for the clipboard slowly, so not to startle the woman I prayed was sleeping. Ma'am, I whispered. The scent of vomit hit my nose just as I saw it pooled around her face, and I jumped back. Her eyes were open to slits, but I saw their discolor and knew what it meant. My insides twisted. I barely caught sight of her nameplate before I ran from the room, right into a sign on the wall I hadn't noticed before. The overheads flickered, casting the paper in a light show of shadows. Big, bold red letters were scribbled on it. Q3. On a normal day, I wouldn't give it a second thought, but one word screamed in the back of my mind. Quarantine. Sweat was slick on my upper lip and beneath my layers of clothes. The building was suddenly sweltering. I peered down the hall at the stairs that would lead me to Ginny. I didn't want to find out where Q1 and Q2 were or any other quarantine that followed, so I decided to take my chances on the 10th floor. That's where she lived, even if I didn't know which apartment. On wobbling legs, I lunged into the stairwell. I took the steps two at a time, 
ignoring the sting of my sore ankle. Ginny! I shouted, forcing myself to focus as the harrowing realization I might be the only one alive in the entire building overcame me. She was better, just like I was better, and if Ginny was anywhere, she would be in her apartment, not down some dark hallway that housed bodies I wasn't sure I could bear seeing. I knew she wouldn't be able to hear me ten stories up, but I called her name all the same. The sound of my voice, the sound of something, putting me more at ease. Jenny! I yelled again. She'd complained in one of our infrequent calls about moving her things up ten floors, but having never been there, the apartment number escaped me. Her reclusiveness had always bothered me, but only now did I realize how bad it had really become. Up and up I went, climbing each floor of the tower until I thought the stairs would never end. I finally reached the tenth floor and flung the door open, wheezing as I gasped for air. Jenny! My voice was barely a whisper as I scanned the hallway. There was a corridor to the right and one to the left. Thighs screaming with fatigue, I veered to the right. I had to start somewhere, and I would pound on every door until I found her. Jenny! I shouted, inhaling the stale, hot air that permeated the floor. It didn't smell overripe like the floors below, which flared my hope. I knocked on the door of the first apartment. Hello? Is anyone there? When I heard no movement, I pounded on the next. Jenny! It's Elle! Is anyone in there? I couldn't bring myself to say alive. I'm looking for my sister, Jenny St. James. I pounded harder. Hello? I sprinted to the next apartment. The door wasn't latched and opened as my knuckles grazed it, but no one was inside. The fact there was no body made me hopeful. They could have gotten out of here before things had gotten too bad. Jenny might have gone with them. As hopeful as the thought made me, tears blurred my vision as I reached the next apartment. Hello? I rasped, voice weakened by desperation. Jenny, it's me. If she wasn't answering, she was likely dead. If she'd left, how the hell would I ever find her? I tried the knob, but like most of the others, it was locked, and I moved on. I knocked on 1005 and 1006, then moved on to 1007 and 1008. Somebody! I yelped as the hysteria crept in. I peeled off my jacket, my skin feeling like fire. Was I the only fucking person alive? I pounded on door 1010. Hello? Sweat beaded my brow, and my lungs pulled maniacally at whatever air they could get. I was hyperventilating, the panic swarming me like a cloud of bees blocking out the last rays of the sun. I couldn't breathe. I leaned back against the wall and covered my face with my hands as the sobs tore out of me. Thomas's face flashed to mind, along with the scorch marks on his body. The corpses I'd seen outside, the sea of cars, all of it drowned out any semblance of hope. What was I thinking coming here? I didn't care about my hands anymore or the churning burn inside me. I couldn't do this alone. As my legs gave out, a door creaked open down the hall. I stilled, and my head popped up. I blinked and glanced around. Hello? I wiped the tears from my eyes and held my breath. A girl, probably 17 or 18, stuck her head through a doorway. Her strawberry blonde hair pulled up in a long ponytail. Oh, thank God. I ran over to her, forgetting how crazed I must have looked. Her eyes shifted to the gun tucked in at my hip, and she slammed the door shut. No, please, please don't shut the door. I need to find my sister. She lives on this floor. Jenny St. James. Please, you're the only person I've seen. I knocked stubbornly, desperate. Do you know her? She had to, right? They all lived in the same building. They were all neighbors. She's my twin. She looks just like me. I shut my eyes, pressing my warm cheek against the cool door, praying she would open up. 
Please, I whispered. I need your help. The door creaked open, stopping where the chain lock ended. Oh, thank you, thank you. Do you know where Ginny lives? The girl's blue eyes narrowed on me, assessing me. Then, they softened. JJ lived there, she rasped, and nodded to the last door at the end of the hall. I rushed to the apartment, wishing for a miracle. The door was unlocked, but it wasn't until I opened the door that I registered the girl's words. Lived. It's where JJ lived. Tears dripped down my cheeks as I stepped inside. Jenny? The light was on, flickering like the lights in the hallway, and there was blood on the kitchen floor. I gasped. No. I scoured the rest of the apartment, rushing to the bedroom where a sick person would sleep. But her queen-size bed was disheveled and empty. The oak dresser across from it had nothing on top to gather dust, and the flat screen mounted on the wall was turned off. The only thing in the room was a side table, a wrought iron lamp with a black shade sitting on it. I walked back into the living room and stared at the black suede couch and white walls with only a large, silver-framed mirror to adorn them. I stepped closer to the coffee table, half expecting to see a ring in the tan wood from where she always set her cold cups down without a coaster. But there was no ring. Everything in the apartment was crisp and clean and sparse, which wasn't Jenny at all. She was a whirlwind and a mess, and for the first time I was grateful for it. This wasn't Jenny's house. JJ was not Jenny. It was all a huge mistake. As I allowed myself to hope, I saw a loaf of gluten-free bread on the counter, blackberry jam, and an open butter dish. It was Jenny's favorite snack when we were kids, the sweet and the salty with a little crunch, and she was allergic to wheat. All I could do was stand there, motionless, and my mind adrift. Blood splattered the counter, soaked into the grout around the tile. I'd known she was sick, but we were twins. She was supposed to be fine. But then I realized I wasn't fine. Something was wrong with me. The virus was still inside me, alive, likely eating me from the inside out. Maybe this time tomorrow I would be dead too. My gaze caught on a single photo hung on the fridge. I stepped closer. It was us. Its edges were well-worn and discolored. We were young, probably ten or so based on the tie-dye t-shirt I was wearing, but I didn't remember taking it. Stepping over the blood, I pulled the photo off, the magnet clanking to the ground. The floor creaked, and the girl from next door stepped into the doorway, arms wrapped around her middle. Her legs were exposed in her boxer shorts, half covered by an oversized sweatshirt, and she looked as scared and miserable as I was. Do you know where she is? I asked. The girl blinked, her shoulders heaving as she gripped her middle tighter. I stepped closer, desperation clawing inside. Have you seen my sister or not? I asked her. She nodded, her chin trembling. They took her away on a stretcher. I forced myself to utter the words. To quarantine? The girl lifted a petite shoulder and licked a tear from her lips. I don't know. You don't know? Did she go to quarantine or not? I bit out. I don't know! She barked back and wiped her nose with her sleeve. I never saw her again. My mom told me to stay upstairs and not open the door or leave this floor. She made me swear. I nodded because it didn't matter. I'd seen the list. Jenny was on it, her name crossed off. It was clear what it meant, and there was blood everywhere in her kitchen to prove the rest. Where did your mom go? I asked, daring to hope she might still be alive. The girl shook her head. She was helping people from the cruise ship on the first floor. I've been calling her, but she hasn't answered. The unanswered call. She's the mayor, 
It was only a half question, and my chest tightened before she could even answer. The girl's red-rimmed eyes widened, and she stepped closer. Have you seen her? She asked. Reluctantly, I nodded. The hope in the girl's eyes blurred with tears, and she choked out a sob. She's dead. <laughs> my mom's dead. I didn't answer her. I didn't have to. Her mom was dead. So was Jenny. I didn't wipe the tears away as they poured down my cheeks. My heart broke for me and for the girl, for the mother who had kept her daughter safe, even if she knew she wouldn't make it herself. The girl doubled over, barely able to catch her breath, and I wrapped my arms around her, pulling her against me. She grabbed my shirt, clasping on like I was all that held her upright, and in my sister's apartment, as the world crashed down around us, we cried. 14. Jackson, December 11th. I stood at the sliding glass door in my kitchen, staring into the night-shrouded backyard with my arms folded over my chest. The porch lights lit the snowflakes drifting through the air, falling to the cold earth, where the garden would have been in spring. Hannah's stone-covered grave was marked as my mother's had been in her village the day she was buried, a sentimental offering of peace resting between two top stones. I felt strangely closer to my mother as I stared at them. For my mother, I'd left a fishing pole, the one she'd helped me make from a willow branch and reed grass when I was six. For Hannah, I left my wedding band wrapped in a pair of polka-dotted baby socks. Do I look like the kind of girl who would date a drunken stranger from a liquor store? I could picture Hannah's lifted eyebrow and tilted head perfectly. She could scold me with a single look, and the day we met was no different. Defiantly, I wanted to reach for the wine bottle on the table and guzzle it down. Maybe if she were angry enough with me for falling off the wagon, she would come back from the grave and give me a ration of shit. Drago yawned, and I looked back at him as he stretched from his spot in my recliner. I was just happy someone was using it. Shoving my hands in my pockets, I stared at the wine bottle again until my eyes were so blurred and wet I couldn't see its silhouette anymore. The toilet flushed in the bathroom down the hall. The door opened, and I thumbed the tears away. Ross walked into the kitchen. His shoulders were slumped more than before, and he nodded to the wine bottle. I figured you would have chugged it by now. I wouldn't blame you. I glanced at the photo of Hannah and me pinned to the bulletin board. She would. I told him. My hair was longer in the photo. It would have been down to my ears if it wasn't so wild in the wind like hers was. Blonde locks whipping around us. The sun was out, and we were both smiling as she leaned in to kiss my cheek. The wind threatening to blow us away. I almost smiled, but it ached too much. I didn't figure you were a wine drinker anyway. Ross muttered. I'm not. Someone gave it to us a while back. I told Hannah she could have some, it would have been fine, but she never drank it. She never threw it away either. I remember when she told me she'd met the guy she would marry at a liquor store and that you were a drunk. No, he shook his head. Her exact words were functioning alcoholic. Ross looked at me with shimmery blue eyes. I told her she was fucking crazy. He picked up the bottle and turned it over in his hands. Why do you think she kept it? I stared down at my hands, trembling as the remaining liquor left my system. To remind me how strong I am, I said. But my voice was paper thin. She was standing in line at the liquor store. I told him, remembering her paisley purple bandana wrapped around her head, blonde hair disheveled, and a dozen woven bracelets that looked handmade around her wrist. She was such a hippie. I mused, but I wanted her especially when she glared at the cashier who told her she couldn't use the bathroom unless she was a customer. I looked at Ross. You know what she said? I can imagine. He wiped a tear from his eye, unable to look at me. I can pee on your floor instead if you want me to. Even in the cloudy darkness, her smile shined through. I wanted her smile to be real. I needed it to be. Ross clasped me on the shoulder 
and took a deep breath. You'll get through this, he told me. You and I both will, okay? With Ross standing there, the thought almost seemed possible. I peered back at him, seeing the fear in his eyes. He didn't know what awaited him in Fairbanks. Kelsey might be alive or she might be dead. She may not want to leave her mom. Everything was still so uncertain. He sniffed and wiped his nose with his sleeve. Leave it to women to make us weep, right? Closing my eyes, I could almost feel Hannah standing next to me, her hand on my shoulder. She'd want me to take care of Ross, for us to take care of each other. I picked the bottle up off the table, opened the back door, and threw it against the back fence as hard as I could. Unexpected relief flooded me as it shattered. It was gone. I'd made a choice for her, and now I could move on. If you don't hear from me right away, give me a few days to see what's what, Ross said, thoughtful. I'll at least call you by then, and we'll figure out what to do. I understood why he had to leave, just like he understood why I had to stay in Anchorage to check on my dad. But it didn't make his leaving any more comforting. I better get on the road. He grabbed his jacket and lifted the satellite phone. I'll call you. He tucked the handheld CB radio under his arm. Or I'll try you on Channel 7. I nodded. Worst case scenario. This is the worst case scenario. I pointed to the sat phone clutched in his hand. If I don't hear from you, I'll come to Kelsey's mom's in Fairbanks. Ross shook his head sharply and glanced around the house. I could imagine him mentally ticking off all the reasons we both knew we shouldn't stay in the city longer than necessary. No, don't come to Fairbanks. If something happens, I held my hand up. I shut the fuck up, Jackson, and listen to me, he commanded, knowing exactly what I'd say. If something happens and you don't hear from me, you don't stay here either. I'm not staying here, I said, peering around at the tainted memories. I can't. Go to my house, stay as long as you want. He pulled his keys from his pocket and handed them to me. I know where the spare is if I need it. His keys felt strange in my hand. My Tacoma is in the garage. Use it if you need it. I'll take my work truck. We knew nothing about the virus or what was happening to the rest of the world. We were alive, but for how long? A thousand things could go wrong from now to tomorrow, and we were only dancing around them. I'll head northeast, I told him, staring up from his key ring. If I don't hear from you, I'll head to the back country, somewhere away from this place. Ross nodded. Leave me a note, a crumb trail, whatever the hell you have to do. I'll find you, he reiterated, even if I have to wait for the snow to melt. That was months from now, but he was right. The roads were getting worse, and we still had months of winter left. I shoved his keys into my pocket. Bravado aside, we stood in silence a moment, me imagining the impending days of uncertainty. Ross was all I had left. Well, wish me luck. He exhaled, long and deep, then swallowed thickly. He hadn't uttered the words aloud, but he worried his wife was dead. Why else hadn't she figured out a way to get a hold of him, or answered her phone, or her mother's? Be safe, brother, I said, pulling him in and wrapping my arms around him. You too. Tell the ornery son of a bitch I'm glad he's okay when you see him. I nodded, because I wasn't sure what else to do, and whistled for Drago to follow us as we walked out to Ross's truck. It felt like a knife ripped at my gut with each step. I didn't have a good feeling about this. He and Drago climbed into the patrol truck. Ross waved for good measure, then they drove away. Shoving my hands in my pockets, I stared at my lifeless street and walked back into the house. It was time to say goodbye to this place and to my wife for the last time. 15. L. December 11th. Hands braced on the sink. I stared into the mirror, not so much looking at myself, but staring straight through. At nothing. At everything. A blur of an angry, resentful past and terrifying, uncertain futures. So much of the past had been awash in regret and bitterness. And what was it all for? I thought my problems before were bad, but this... 
What was the point of surviving if everyone else was dead? Sophie wasn't dead. Why? And why wasn't I? What made us special? I stared at my white knuckles, gripping the edge of the basin. I knew what made me dangerous, but how I'd gotten this way was the unanswered question. I covered my face, smiling like a lunatic. What the hell is happening to me? Heaving a sigh, I dropped my hands and studied the calfskin gloves I'd raided from Ginny's top drawer. I was able to touch Sophie without hurting her when I'd had my snow gloves on. I'd held her against me, too lost in my own grief to realize the danger I was putting her in. While I was determined not to allow the slip again, not until I knew what was happening to me, the gloves gave me a temporary buffer, and that was about all I could ask for. It hurt to think about it. My head, my body, everything ached from crying in Thomas's attack. I'd done my best to ignore it, but under the weight of everything, it grew more difficult. I needed sleep, a lot of it, but that would have to come later, too. Mind throbbing, I dug through my bag for the emergency ibuprofen stash in my coin purse. I laughed silently to myself. Emergency was a word for it. I unlatched the coin purse and fingered through a few coins clinking around, but I didn't feel the pills. Damn it. I leaned down closer to the light to see inside. I'd taken them already, I remembered. I'd needed them after Thomas slammed me onto the wood floor. Shit, I hissed, borderline desperate. I was close to throwing the coin purse across the room when a beige piece of paper inside the pocket caught my eye. It was Ginny's riddle. I'd forgotten about it until now. What people said about twins was true. Even if Ginny and I were never close, there was a connection between us I couldn't easily explain. I knew when something was wrong, even without her telling me. Just like I knew the envelope was from her the day I received it with no return address, before I even opened it. I unfolded the discolored corners and reread the words that seemed familiar at one time, but they still made no sense. The sound of silence will set you free. In the silence, there I'll be. Jenny had never been sentimental, so I knew it was a song lyric or a riddle she wanted me to figure out. So, the note you sent, is it a riddle I'm supposed to figure out or something? She laughed but it wasn't with humor. Yes, have you? Have I what? Figured it out yet. The quiet will liberate me? Is that a threat? Maybe morbid song lyrics? No, she said, but her amusement faded. Keep it until you figure it out, okay? We're not nine anymore, Jenny. I don't have time for riddles. Don't throw it away, Eleanor. Her sharp tone wasn't entirely surprising. She was the dramatic of the two of us, always had been. But there was a tinge of panic in her voice that I hadn't expected. Why not? Because, El, just don't. Figure it out first. Promise me. For all of her theatrics, I was always the gullible one. And even though I knew she was probably playing with me, there was still a peak of uncertainty I couldn't shake. What if I don't want to play? I asked. It was our first year of college, me at a community college, while she miraculously got into a university in Juneau. With what money, I didn't know. Dr. John had cut her off the day she ran away. Waitressing tips barely paid for my books. Or maybe it was all a lie. I'd never visited her at the university, I only remember she used it as an excuse to never visit, just like I used school as an excuse to stay away. L, please, just keep it, okay? At least until you figure it out. What if I never figure it out? Then keep it forever, she said. I stared at the words, churning them over in my mind. I'd do some Googling later and play her game. Fine. I agreed, 
But if it's something stupid or some prank, I swear I'm sending you a box of dead spiders in the mail, and you'll never know when it's coming. Jenny hated spiders. She sobbed whenever there was one in her room, dead or alive. Okay, she said easily, which meant it must have been a good riddle if she would risk my wrath. I'd never figured the riddle out. I'd put it in my purse that day, got too busy with flunking school, and eventually forgot about it. The floor creaked in the adjacent room, and I stilled. L? Sophie's voice was soft and hesitant in the living room. Yeah? I pulled my sleeve down and wiped my nose. I hadn't realized I was crying. Can you come here for a sec? There's something you should see. I ran my fingers through my loose hair, resigned to look like hell since I was living in it. Uh, yeah, give me just a sec. Okay, I heard Sophie's retreating footsteps and let out a breath. What the hell was I going to do now? I couldn't leave Sophie, but I couldn't stay here either. I stared at my reflection, like it would somehow produce answers, really seeing myself for the first time in, well, I wasn't sure how long. Days, nights, they all blurred together, incoherent, tumultuous moments that bled from one memory to the next. My eyes weren't just green, but looked sickly and swollen. The shadows beneath them made my cheeks hollow. When was the last time I'd eaten anything? Clearing my throat, I grabbed a rubber band from my purse and tossed my hair up, then turned on the faucet. I didn't wait for it to get warm. I didn't want it to get warm. I reveled in the chills that rose on my arms and neck as I splashed cold water on my face, the jolt I needed to pull myself together for a while longer. After my face was dry, I tugged the gloves over my deadly fingers and abandoned my things in the bathroom for the time being. Stomach rumbling with hunger, not nausea, I made a mental note to raid Jenny's cupboard sometime soon. I didn't bother closing the door behind me as I walked to Sophie's apartment. There was no one left but us. Or so I thought. I stopped in her open doorway and stared at three new faces. A small boy and a girl, maybe six and nine years old, sat on the couch. Their pajamas were filthy, and they wore their coats zipped to the collar like they couldn't get warm. Sophie handed them both a glass of water, which they eagerly accepted. She then held out a glass to the older boy, a Latino kid with dark hair and features, crouched over a tablet in the recliner. Sitting on the edge of the seat, his fingers frantically tapped on the screen. They were kids, and they were alive. If there were five of us, there were likely others. The world didn't feel so unrecognizable knowing that. Hello, I whispered, leaning against the door jamb. I offered a tentative wave. Four sets of eyes shifted to me. The little girl with ratty brown hair and wet eyelashes blinked at me. Her nose was pink and her chin quivering. The little boy's eyes were red and his cheeks flushed, but he only stared at me, uncertain. That's Thea and Bo, the elder boy said. I'm Alex. His eyes narrowed on me, but his features eventually softened. Have we met? I shook my head. I don't live here, I told him. But you might have met my twin sister. I glanced between the three of them. I'm Elle. We thought we were the only ones left. Thea blinked at me, curiosity lifting her brow. Bo, older and less curious, continued to study me, clearly distrusting. Alex is in my class. Sophie explained as he continued to swipe at the tablet in his hand. I had a dozen questions to ask them, but as the little girl sat there shaking, I knew it wasn't the right time. So I stuck with one question only. You all know each other then? Thea shook her head as Sophie tucked a blanket around her. He found us, Thea whispered, wiping her nose on the palm of her hand. I handed her a tissue from the box on the coffee table. More questions continued to swirl. Found you? 
Thea's head bobbed as she blew her nose. She looked around, uncertain what to do with the used tissue, and finally offered it to her brother. Here, I said, stepping closer. I'll take it. Thea handed it to me tentatively, staring at my gloves. I was about to pull my hand away when she dropped the Kleenex in my palm and then slurped down half the glass of water. She licked her lips when she finished, inhaling to catch her breath. Have the three of you been sick? I asked, unable to resist. Have you had the fever? Yeah, Alex said, groaning as he lifted the tablet up and moved it around, like he was trying to get a signal. What about you two? I asked. Have you been sick? The need to understand was gnawing at me. I'm worried we might still be contagious. We've been sick, Bo finally said. First me, then Thea. Then mommy. Bo elbowed her, making her grimace. Damn it, Alex grumbled as he set the tablet on the coffee table, scowling at it. There has to be a way to get news. The internet's been in and out all day. Sophie said. The cable for the TV isn't even working anymore, but you can keep trying. I peered around her apartment, noting the sweeping landscape photos that donned her walls and the lack of family photos. Growing up in a house I wished had less family photos, I tended to notice those things. I stepped up to a cluster of frames beside the television, seeing a little Sophie with leg braces on and a miserable fake smile on her face. The mare was pretty, if a little severe, with the same blue eyes Sophie had and red hair that was much darker. Sophie's father had the blonde hair, was tall, and definitely younger than Dr. John, even if there was something similar about him. My stomach grumbled, and I flushed. We have cheese and crackers, Sophie said. She glanced from me to Alex, who shook his head, then to Thea, who nodded happily. I like cheese and crackers, she chirped, suddenly a little less afraid. Bo looked at his sister. It was the same look I gave Jenny when she said something out of turn, like Bo didn't want to impose, or maybe he wasn't sure if he could trust Sophie yet. I like cheese and crackers too, I added with a smile and patted my tummy. And I'm starving. Finally, Bo looked at Sophie and nodded as well. Yes, please. I'll help you, I said, following Sophie into the kitchen. Alex? Sophie stopped short. There are coloring books in my desk in my bedroom. Will you grab them for me? The colored pencils, too. She nodded to the kids, then into the dark room behind him. Alex stood, hesitated before he went into her bedroom, but flicked on the light. I saw the cutting board leaning against the wall beside the microwave and grabbed it as Sophie pulled out a block of cheddar cheese from the fridge. Like Jenny's, the galley kitchen looked out into the living room, only Sophie's was remodeled with new, expensive stainless steel appliances. My dad is a chef, she explained. Was, I guess. I'm not sure if he's okay or not. Is he here in Whiteley? She shook her head. He was on a yacht in Barbados, last I heard. Her voice trembled, and I wrapped my arm around her shoulder as she tried to stifle the tears back. I'm fine, she said. No, you're not, I told her. None of us are. You're allowed to be sad and worried. She nodded, but brushed her tears away and put the brick of cheese on the cutting board. I hope you like flowers, Alex said, setting the books and pencils on the coffee table. Sophie cleared her throat. There might be games in the closet, she said loud enough so Alex could hear her. I can't remember if my mom took them down to the classroom already. I handed her a knife from the holder. Thanks, she said, voice quiet. She was fair-skinned and willowy, but though she looked fragile, she was strong. I already knew that much. She could have been curled up on her bed still, sobbing hysterically. Alex found them in the Heston building, she whispered and nodded toward the kids. I had no idea what the Heston building was. Is that a bad thing? 
It's the ruined army bunkers next door. That structure that looked legitimately abandoned during my drive in. It didn't even have glass on its windows or functioning doors. I frowned. What were they doing in there? I have no idea. Her voice was low, but pitched. Alex thinks they watched their mom kill herself. I'm not sure I buy it, though. Why not? Al, their mom is Katie Gunderson. She was my teacher. She would never do something like that. Ever. I've known her for years. Sophie dropped the knife and braced herself against the countertop. Her glassy eyes shifted to the living room. Why would she take them out in a blizzard and make them watch something like that? It doesn't make any sense. I knew that look. I'd felt it many times. Sophie was beginning to spiral. I think, I started, uncertain what exactly I should say when none of the pieces fit together or made any sense. I think we need to prepare for the possibility that those of us who have survived the outbreak will never be the same. Sophie's eyes narrowed on me. What do you mean? I mean, do you feel different? I hedged. Her brow furrowed deeper. If I wasn't careful, I would scare them. Hell, I was petrified. Like how, exactly? She asked in complete bewilderment. If Sophie's reaction was anything to go by, she definitely didn't have what felt like dragon's breath simmering under her skin, and I pushed that knowledge away to dwell on later. Grasping for words, I shook my head. Just tired, exhausted. Maybe your teacher was sleep deprived and didn't realize what she was doing. You've seen something like this, Sophie said. She was clearly observant too. I crossed my arms over my chest and leaned my hip against the counter. Yeah, I guess. Sort of. Is that how you got that bruise on your jaw? Alex asked, stepping into the kitchen. I straightened, my gloved hand going to the side of my face. I hadn't noticed a bruise. Look, Alex said, changing the subject. He set the tablet down in front of us. There are reports about people losing their minds. They thought people were acting out of fear. But this man survived the virus, and when he woke, he set everyone else in the hospital ward on fire, dead or alive. Kids, women, children. An effect of the fever, I realized. He shrugged. It's speculation. I skimmed over the article, grateful Alex covered whatever image was beneath his hand. But, Sophie shook her head. Why would she take them out there, wearing only their pajamas and their shoes? Was she trying to freeze them to death or something? He shrugged. Why would a doctor who paid gobs of money to go to school to save people's lives suddenly decide to kill them? So some of the survivors are insane? Sophie gasped. Yes, I wanted to tell her. Thomas had proved that much. Alex leaned in. I think their mom tried to push them out a window. My gaze flashed to the kids. They muttered quietly as Bo helped Thea with her coloring page. I saw her body and the fear in their eyes. It outweighed the sadness. Like maybe they weren't sure she was dead and that she might come back or something. Bo wouldn't say anything more. Those poor kids, I murmured, and pulled the crackers out of their sleeve to place on the plate. It was clear that sickness was no longer the enemy. It was whatever had been left in its wake. We have to be extra careful, I told them. Sophie shifted from one foot to the other. What are we going to do? Just stay here forever? We can't stay here, Alex said. There's a gym full of bodies. It's only a matter of time before... We just... We can't. The quarantine, I remembered. There's a post about this place in British Columbia. Alex tried to show us, but the internet connection was lost again. Shit, he muttered. Scratching his buzzed head, he sighed. It's a gathering place in Hartley Bay. Hartley Bay? I glanced between them. It's supposed to be safe, 
he explained. But I wasn't sure I believed it. That was easily a thousand miles from us, unless one of them knew how to captain a ship. I'd visited once for a photo shoot. It was very secluded and on the ocean, much like Whiteley, which scared the shit out of me. The quarantine might not have been necessary if there hadn't been a horde of people from the cruise ship to complicate things. Hartley Bay would be a place where boats from all around the world could sail into if they wanted, madmen and survivors alike, seeking a safe place to stay. Unless Hartley had extreme measures in place, there would be nothing to stop them. The lights flickered and Thea shrieked. It's fine, Bo admonished, and Sophie handed me a piece of cheese. Then Alex walked into the living room to deliver the plate of food. The cheddar was like candy on my tongue, and my stomach wanted more. I cut another piece off the block for Alex and then myself, while Sophie lit a candle on the center of the table. The backup generators came on this afternoon, she explained. We're used to the power going out here. She looked at Alex, then at me. But once the fuel is gone... I leaned my elbows on the counter and rested my head in my hands. The crippling question of what now inched its way in, settling nicely next to fear. There's tons of posts online about holdouts throughout the country, Alex said, and I admired the optimism in his voice. Around the entire world, but nothing close enough we can get to. Alex showed me the list. A place in the San Juan Islands in Washington, an army base in the lower 48, two places in Canada, Greenland. The list went on, but Alaska wasn't on the map. Canada's the closest, Alex said. If we can get there, we might have a chance. I wasn't sure who this kid was exactly, but I admired his bravery and his grit. I didn't, however, know if we were ready to take a road trip to Hartley Bay, me and four kids. How do we know we're the last ones left in the building? I looked at Alex. There have to be others if we're still alive. I waited for him to say something about his parents or for melancholy to shadow his gaze. We looked for their dad, Alex said, peering out at the kids. He wasn't anywhere I could find him. I'd bet there's no one else left in this building. They would have found us by now. Deep down, I knew he was probably right. I'd been calling and shouting, and no one had heard me. Sophie sniffed and put the cheese back in the fridge. Her mom was still down there. Jenny was down there somewhere, too. Sophie covered her face with her hands and stood in front of the fridge, the door hanging open. Alex looked at me, his green eyes wide. Her mom, I mouthed, and pointed down to the first floor. His face fell, softened, and he cleared his throat. We'll find a way to say goodbye, he promised, and hesitantly rested his hand on her shoulder. Before we leave, we'll figure out a way. Something occurred to him, and his eyes flicked to Sophie's stomach. He leaned in. Are you okay? She met his eyes, and he glanced down at her stomach again, pointing. My heartbeat thudded to a stop, and I stepped closer. Are you pregnant? I whispered. Sophie's face flushed and her hands went to her stomach. Slowly, she shook her head. No, it's, I'm not. It was a false alarm. She brushed past us and tossed the dirty knife in the sink. I glared at Alex. I thought you guys were just friends. We are, I mean, I guess we are. His eyes widened as he registered my implication. It wouldn't have been mine, he groused. We met for the first time on Monday. I just moved here. And yet, somehow, he knew she thought she was pregnant. I was curious, but had more important concerns. I needed to figure out what we would do. What I would do with two teenagers and a couple of kids. Alex nodded to my gloves. You cold or something? I fisted them at my sides. It's a germ thing, I lied. I told myself they wouldn't know any different. I was a stranger to them anyway. 
but I felt bad all the same. I might have been a stranger to Sophie six hours ago, but now I wasn't sure what we were. Survivors? Orphans? All of us were both, and we all needed somewhere safe to go. I smacked my fist on the counter. The Coast Guard! Brilliant, Alex said, pleased. What about them? I eyed him skeptically. He was strangely collected in all of this. What were you doing outside? I finally asked him. I eyed him closely. Where have you been all this time? His features hardened and he straightened his shoulders. I needed to get away from my uncle, Jimmy. He wasn't what you would call a stand-up guy. He pointed to his fat lip. He hit you? Sophie's question was more of an incredulous rasp than a whisper. With a shoe, he grumbled, his cheeks reddening. Look, I don't know what happened or when. He looked at Sophie. We got into an argument and I took off. I needed air. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up in a warehouse, which, trust me, was better than his shithole apartment. Alex met my gaze almost defiantly, like he was waiting for me to ask him more questions. But I could see he was hiding whatever confusion and fear he had beneath his stoic exterior. I knew that facade. Stay busy and focused. It was the only way to keep your shit together. I nodded, a silent forfeiture of prying questions. So, the Coast Guard? He prompted. There's a blockade at the docks in Anchorage. We could head back there, see if they're still set up. They'll know what to do. There were a few of them when I was headed this way. They'll likely know more than we do. I nodded reassuringly, convincing myself it was a good plan. That it was a solid plan. Perhaps our only plan. They're our best option. All of us? Sophie asked. Her eyes darted between me and Alex. I would assume, I guess, that's up to you guys. I glanced out at the two smaller children. I didn't know the first thing about parenting, but I knew I was all they had at this point. We'll leave notes for their parents, in case their dad comes back, but I can't leave them here, whether you both stay or not. Sophie looked down at her hands, fiddling with a piece of plastic cheese wrapper. We could leave a note for your dad, too. Alex told her. I didn't want to push her, even if I knew it was our only real hope of finding safety and answers. Sophie needed to decide what she would do on her own. We all did. Yeah, I'll do that, in case he survived and comes home. She could barely speak the words. While I'd lost an estranged sister, she'd lost her entire family. Mull it over, I told her. You have time. If my body odor was anything to go by, we all could have used showers and fresh clothes. We need to get some rest. Alex and Sophie nodded. I stared in at Thea, curled up against the arm of the couch. We leave tomorrow then, when there's a break in the snow. Decided and relieved there was a plan, I grabbed an overripened twig of grapes from the bowl on the counter and decided a shower was exactly what I needed to wash away the fog of the day. Oh, I turned around and touched Alex's shoulder. He jumped back, like I'd electrocuted him, and I pulled my hand away. My heart raced. Sorry, I... Are you okay? I eyed the fabric of his long sleeve to make sure I hadn't singed him. I hadn't felt a surge or burn, not like I had before. Alex's eyes narrowed on me, transforming his expression into something wary. Yeah. I'm fine, but I could practically hear the gears grinding in his head. I cleared my throat. Bring any weapons you have, I added quietly, just in case. What makes you think I have any weapons? I wasn't sure if I'd offended him or if he was just being cautious after whatever had just happened, but he sounded affronted. Because you're a guy and you live in the wild state of Alaska, I assumed you'd have a weapon. A baseball bat or hockey stick, maybe? He lifted his chin. 
I'll find something. Sophie watched us, just as confused as I was at whatever had just happened. But I didn't want Alex to think I was a threat, so I headed for the door to give him some space. Where are you going? Sophie asked. You can stay here if you want to. I shook my head. Thanks, but I'm going to go shower, then raid my sister's closet. I didn't come prepared for the apocalypse. 16. Jackson. December 11th. I was used to dark roads and snow flurries, but tonight was more ominous than most. I couldn't shake the feeling there was more to come. More than the gut-wrenching loss and dead bodies. More than fever and the end of our reign on the food chain. The foreboding hadn't gone away when I found Ross at the PD, and it worsened when he drove away. The radio stopped scanning, and the static cracked. This is a broadcast from Hartley Bay, British Columbia. I frowned at the radio, uncertain how Eagle River was picking up a signal from so far away. We've established a safe haven for survivors. We have food and water, plenty of generators and fuel, at least for now. We have military equipment, including a naval ship and plenty of soldiers who are more than capable of defending this place. It was a not too subtle warning to looters and lunatics. Smart. We welcome survivors who are willing to work hard to gain back some of what we lost. Community, protection, and hope. If you have applicable skills that will help us get this place up and running as efficiently as possible, we need you. Until things get straightened out, assuming they ever will, we're all we've got. We'll broadcast daily if possible. Using my blinker out of habit, I turned down the frontage road that led to my father's place. A safe haven was a nice thought, even if I knew it would fail. Too many strangers, especially scared ones, would be difficult to manage, and I didn't trust anyone. Not anymore. Eagle River was a city community in the municipality of Anchorage proper, but you'd never know it out here where the spruce trees lined to the Chugach foothills. A place in the middle of nowhere would suit me much better than a salvage city. I clicked the radio off as I passed the only other estate nestled on the left and continued toward his property. The instant I saw the lights on in his house, I grew hopeful, then wary. If he was alive, he might not be the man I remembered. Then something a lot like guilt snuck up on me. If my father was dead, all the arguing and distance between us over the years would become a heavy regret. I turned Ross's Tacoma off and peered around the yard. It was the same as I remembered. His truck was in the drive, covered in what looked like a few days' worth of snow, but that wasn't surprising. He was ornery, but he wasn't stupid. If he'd watched the news at all, he'd have stayed inside. His newer, craftsman-style home was nestled in a copse of trees, a hamlet far enough away from town that he felt removed, and his dogs had room to roam. His huskies were everything to him. I'd always told myself I was just glad he had something in his life, even if he'd pushed his family away. Or was I the one who'd pushed him away first? I shoved the driver door open and tugged the hood of my jacket over my head as I climbed out. I'm not sure when cold shoulders turned into an irreparable resentment, but I figured if anything could bring my father and me back together, it would be the end of civilization. Shoving my hands in my pockets, I trudged through the unshoveled snow up the path to the front door. The wind had died down, but the cold had seeped in, and my sore muscles ached in protest. Even getting out of the shower before I'd left had been a chore, and while the alcohol was gone, the sickness still lingered. I could feel the pressure of it behind my eyes and in my bones. Or was that exhaustion? The motion light flashed on, and I braced myself for a slew of barking huskies, but they never came. In fact, they were strangely quiet. I glanced from the lit window of the living room back to the shadows of the kennels. My dad loved his dogs, but seven inside the house seemed excessive even for him. Curiosity winning out, I bypassed the porch and headed around the side of the house to the kennels. Through the light and shadows of the motion light, I could see two of the kennel doors open and discolored snow inside. My footsteps ceased as I slowly reached for my gun. I peered around the yard. Something was definitely off, but I took a few steps closer to the gate. I noticed blood in the snow first. Then I saw the dog's foot, then registered the outline of it. It was covered in a layer of snow. Heart suddenly racing, I scanned the rest of the kennels. Some of the dogs were still in their houses, but all of them were dead. I peered around the yard as chills trickled down my back. 
This didn't feel right. My dad wouldn't have killed them unless something bad happened. I crouched down beside the last dog, brushing off the snow. There was a bullet hole in its gray and brown head. Its body was frozen, and it had been dead for some time. I picked up a spent rifle casing. For the first time, I wondered if the dogs, if all animals, were affected by the virus just like humans, and if they'd turned, my dad would have had to kill them. I stared at the dogs. It didn't make sense. I wasn't sure why, but I didn't think rabid, crazed animals was the reason they were dead, especially not with half of them still in their beds. Gun in hand and dread awaited anchor in my gut. I hurried as quietly as I could up the steps to the back door of the house. Either a crazy fucker had been here or my dad had lost his mind, and I wasn't taking any chances. The back door was cracked open, and gripping my gun tighter, I slowly pushed it open. For the first time since I'd woken to my intruder, the fog around my mind lifted and I stepped inside. My palms were sweating. My heart was pounding. I had no idea what I would find. I swept the kitchen, resisting the urge to shout for my dad. The living room was messy, but it didn't look torn apart. His desk had a few files strewn on top, but they weren't rifled through. His sparse leather furniture was as it should have been, the pillow on the couch still molded to the shape of his head. My gut churned as I registered the silence. Each footstep seemed to echo as I made my way into the bedroom. The flannel bedding was balled up, but he wasn't in it. The top drawer of his dresser was open and I walked over. Socks. That's all it had. It was a hiding place, I realized as I noted the small key stuck in the lock of the gun cabinet. It was empty. I flipped the light in his bathroom on and stilled. Everything in the medicine cabinet was strewn about the countertop. The drawers and cabinets under the sink were open. The cleaning products, towels, and toilet paper were pulled out. Comet was sprinkled on the floor. The first aid box was open and gauze and cleaning pads littered the ground. Dad had been searching for something, maybe to try to save the dogs. I ran through the house and back into the cold. The motion light flicked on again as I ran toward the garage. There were footprints in the snow I hadn't seen before. They were smaller than mine, but not by much, and I'd know the outline of his moccasin slippers anywhere. Snow covered some of the footprints, but there were still enough to follow the trail. Some of them came and went from the house, but those along the kennel fence line were deep and overlapping, like he'd been pacing back and forth. I followed them in circles until I noticed a few veered off toward the woods. I grabbed a flashlight from the truck and followed them. The tracks were hot and cold, but like illegal poachers in the spring, I could sniff out a trail when I was looking for one. When I saw my dad's Winchester was half buried in the sparse shrubbery a few feet ahead, I knew I was on the right trail. He'd shot his dogs, tossed his gun, and he was headed toward the neighboring property. As the puzzle pieces began to fit together, I dreaded what they would amount to. What the hell were you doing out here? I muttered and grabbed the rifle. Even through my gloves, my fingers were cold and numb. I hadn't dressed for a trek in the snow, and my body was beginning to protest. Pulling the rifle strap over my shoulder, I shined the flashlight in front of me and trudged deeper into the woods. I considered turning around to grab another layer from my truck when I saw the neighbor's house through the trees. The windows were dark and the garage door was open. Given the uncertain circumstances, making my presence known would probably get me killed more than it would save me, so I shut my flashlight off and crept closer in the cover of darkness and thin veil of falling snow. A vehicle was parked in the driveway out front, a small SUV that looked like it hadn't been moved in days, maybe longer. It was late and the unlit windows could have meant whoever lived there was sleeping or dead. I hugged the shadows on the side of the house and peered into the garage. Without moonlight, I could barely make out the outline of a heap on the floor. I flicked the flashlight on. It was a discarded nylon car cover. An open gun safe against the far wall caught my attention and I stepped inside the garage. Some of the boxes from the shelves were sideways and upside down on the floor, and what looked like the contents of a toolbox were scattered across the floor, around the workbench. Someone had been looking for something in here, too, and I had a feeling that person was my father. My footsteps echoed as I walked over to the gun safe. A shotgun stood inside with a box of 12-gauge shells that belonged to it. Whoever it was, they hadn't been looking for a gun. I ran my fingers over the strap of the Winchester, hanging against my back. He hadn't needed a gun, or he wouldn't have discarded his own. Or maybe 
he'd been looking for a different type of gun. I crouched down to the shelves near the bottom. A box of 9 millimeters and an empty magazine were tucked in the corner, but no pistol. I glanced at the door to the house. Someone could have it inside, but why leave the shotgun? I stared back down at the car cover. Or someone took it with them when they left. I wondered what reason my dad might have had to take the neighbor's car. I clicked off the flashlight again. I would find out soon enough. I walked to the door and tested the handle as quietly as I could. It wasn't locked. Hoping this wasn't some elaborate trap, I creaked the door open and peered into a dark dining room and connecting living space. There was no movement inside and no sound other than the refrigerator kicking on and off. Hello, I said, lifting my gun. I aimed it through the doorway. I'm Officer Mitchell. I'm a state trooper. If anyone is in the house, please step out with your hands up now. I waited with bated breath. There were no creaking floorboards or mutterings I could hear. I am armed and entering the house. Do not shoot. I cursed myself the instant I uttered the words. A crazy bastard wouldn't give two shits if I wanted them to shoot me or not. I had no choice. I needed to know why my dad was still here. I stepped further in, gripping my gun tighter with every step as I swept the living room. The air was frigid inside, a good indication no one was home, or alive, at least. Shadows played with my eyes, and the living room was ransacked. The closet was torn apart. Books were pulled from their shelves. Everything looked expensive, down to the fake plant in the corner of the dining room. They were wealthy, whoever they were. I stopped outside the first door in the hallway, the only one that was visibly closed from where I was standing. Sidling up against the wall, I reached for the knob. Hello? I tried again with no answer. Dad? I twisted the handle and pushed the door open, stepping inside with my pistol held out in front of me. A human form covered with a blanket lay at the foot of the bed. The sheets and comforter were thrown back. A lamp was broken on the floor. There was a curtain rod on the ground in front of me, and drapes in a heap against the wall. There'd definitely been a struggle. I turned and headed down the hall to the next room. There was an office and two other rooms, each with four poster beds and matching furniture that had been untouched. Other than a hairbrush with dark long hair in it resting on the vanity and in the bathroom, there was nothing in there that seemed out of place either. The house was empty. Lowering my weapon, I flicked the hall light on and stopped in the doorway of the first bedroom. The unease writhing inside told me it was my dad underneath the blanket. The trail had only led one way. I bent over and grabbed the fleece blanket. Like a band-aid, I pulled it off. Thomas Mitchell lay underneath, his eyes closed and his mouth partially open. Blood covered his jeans and stained his flannel shirt, and his damn moccasin slippers were dirty from trekking through the snow. Pop. I swallowed the swell in my throat and crouched down beside him. The light from the hallway was all I needed to see he'd been dead for at least a day. I'd known the chances of him surviving were low, given so few people had woken up from the fever. But finding him in the fetal position, abandoned in a stranger's house, was heart-wrenching. My eyes burned as I stared at the old man he'd become without my realizing it. Talking on the phone was one thing, but I hadn't seen him in nearly three years. Like some of the others, he'd survived the virus only to lose his mind afterward. By the looks of it, he had been killed in self-defense. The room was torn apart and someone had covered his body with a blanket. A gesture of remorse and fear, not pride or malice. A part of me felt guilty for not getting here sooner. Even if I knew, it would have prevented nothing. Spotting the shadows on his neck, I leaned closer. There were burns. I clicked on my flashlight and studied the strange markings. As my mind turned with possible scenarios, all I could think was that they looked like handprints. The thumbs overlapping around his Adam's apple, the rest of the fingers gripped around the back of his neck. Even then, it didn't make sense. Unless the person's fingers were on fire, which was impossible. The finger marks were smaller than a man's, thinner than most too, and I could see the bruised impression of fingernails. I glanced around the room again, seeing it differently this time. Photography hung in frames on the walls, and an array of books filled a large case next to me. There were toiletry sprays and mists on the dresser, a pink jewelry box in the corner. 
and a bra stuck out from under the bed. A teenage girl had done this. It didn't add up. Pop. I breathed, staring back down at his neck. What happened here? 17. L. December 12th. Snowflakes hit the windshield as we made our way down Seward Highway. The storm that had come in overnight kept us cooped up in the tower for longer than I'd hoped, but it gave me and Alex time to clean the mare's office of bile and the scent of rot. We draped the mare in a blanket so that Sophie could come in and say goodbye. I didn't dare touch the body, though. Despite the past few days, it was still difficult to be around death, and the virus was still dangerous for all we knew. It not only left bodies in its wake, but insanity and perhaps impossible, inexplicable things, even if I was the only one who seemed to have experienced it. Who knew what it could still do to us? I glanced at Sophie in the rearview mirror. She stared out the window into the darkness. On a normal Saturday night, she'd probably be home having dinner with her family or out watching a movie with her friends. Instead, she was grieving for her mom and praying for her dad. He'll see the note, I told her. He'll come find you if he's alive. She didn't respond, but I didn't expect her to. There was a slim chance he was alive, an even slimmer chance he'd make it back home or find her if he did. Getting from one part of the world to another seemed impossible now. Alex turned in the passenger seat to look back at Sophie and the kids, dozing to sleep beside her. For having been only recently introduced to Sophie, Alex was attentive, more than I would have expected. The past few days changed a lot of things, though. Under different circumstances, had my sister's death been peaceful, I would have gone in search of her body to say goodbye and lay her to rest properly. I would have stayed to mourn instead of running away as fast as I could to find refuge. But our reality was gruesome and wicked. The smell of the quarantine areas made it nearly impossible to stomach. I knew she was dead. I didn't have to see it. Mostly, I couldn't bear to see what had become of her and have to remember her that way. How are you doing? I asked. Alex put on a brave face, something I could tell he was used to doing. But the end of the world meant even the toughest would break eventually. He rested his elbow on the windowsill and his hand on his head. I'm fine, he said, but it wasn't convincing. It's okay if you're not, I told him. This is... Insane, he looked at me. That's an adequate word. Alex bit the side of his cheek and shook his head. Honestly, I feel like something is wrong with me for not caring that my uncle is dead. I'd felt the same way when I heard about Dr. John. It doesn't sound like you were very close, or that he was all that great of a person. No, he definitely wasn't. He only took me in to collect as much money as he could before I turn 18. He glanced at me. I'm actually surprised he didn't step up the day my mom died. At least he would have had a better couch for me to sleep on. I'm sorry, I said. About your mom, I mean. Alex readjusted his seat, clearly uncomfortable with the conversation. So, I changed the subject. I won't ask you how you know, but I'm glad you could hotwire the pilot. I grinned. Alex's gaze flicked to me, and he scratched the back of his neck. Sort of comes with the territory. What territory is that? Hanging with the wrong crowd. When you move from family to family, you don't have time to make the good kind of friends. Dr. John used to tell me horror stories about foster kids getting shuffled through the system and the terrible families they had to live with. When I was younger, I thought whatever my life was with him, it was better than the alternative. It wasn't until I was older that I realized half of what he told me was to keep me close. Well, I sighed. I think it's safe to say your street smarts will come in handy now. Lucky us. His mouth quirked in the corner. Yeah, maybe. 
We passed a sign for the city a couple miles out. I've never been to Anchorage, Sophie whispered. Not really, anyway. No? Alex looked back at her. Don't worry, you're not missing much. Sophie continued to stare out the window, though it was too dark to see anything. We drove straight through from Fairbanks to Whiteley. I thought about the photo I'd seen of her in leg braces. She was like a porcelain doll in so many ways, from her pale, freckled skin to the quiet hesitance in her voice that made her seem just as fragile. But beneath her mild manner stirred something more. I saw bits of my old self in her, a willpower she just hadn't discovered yet. Sophie unfurled a blanket and covered herself and the kids. Want me to turn the heat up? I asked. I was so warm, I hadn't thought to turn it up very high. I'm okay. Sophie snuggled deeper into the corner of the door. I stared out at the white road that stretched in front of us. Only a few more minutes until we had more answers and safety. We just had to get there. Everything okay? I glanced at Alex. His gaze was a hot iron on the side of my face. He stared at me a few seconds longer. I think so, he finally muttered. My gloved hands tightened on the steering wheel. Were you, um, uh, able to get any rest along with the others? He nodded noncommittally. A little. Alex leaned back in his seat, finally focusing somewhere else. I've been thinking about what that guy said in that message from Hartley Bay. He'd heard the radio broadcast yesterday in a final attempt to glean more information after the internet petered out completely. Being in Alaska, it was hard to say if it was because of the frequent snowstorms or the lack of manpower to maintain the stations. What about it? I asked. They have military, food. We'd be safe there. Maybe, I told him. But getting there won't be easy. I pointed to the thick snow in the roads that prevented us from going more than 30 miles an hour. Even with four-wheel drive, it would take forever to get there. I'm not saying we can't or shouldn't, but I think we should check with the Coast Guard first. The truth of it was, Hartley Bay would be our only other choice if the Coast Guard fell through, and I couldn't think about that with only an hour of sleep and four other people to take care of. Yeah, I hear you. Maybe there's another broadcast. Alex leaned forward and turned on the radio, to static at first. Then he pressed seek. Conspiracy! A voice thundered on the other side. I've been saying it for years and I'll say it again. It was bound to happen. You give the government too much power and they'll abuse it, just like they've done in every war since the dawn of time. Not this guy again, I muttered as Alex turned the volume up. They use us to fight their wars because we're expendable to them. This virus only proves it. Why else wouldn't they have found a cure? Why else would so many of the very few of us who have survived be out of their goddamn minds? I'll tell you why, he continued. It's all part of their plan. It's just another genocide. Only this time it's disguised as a plague. Sophie sat forward, gripping the back of my seat. Do you think it's true? Alex shrugged. Maybe. I mean, it could be. All the lunatics out there now, the radio voice continued. If they weren't crazy before, they surely are now. And what better way to get rid of the rest of us than trial by fire? They want to see who will survive, because it's survival of the fittest, and that's who they want. The strong, the mighty, they're... I clicked off the radio. Hey, Alex grumbled. We don't need to hear this, I told them. Who is that guy? Sophie's voice was barely a whisper. I shook my head. I have no idea, but he's clearly cracked. My seat trembled as Sophie clung to it tighter. What if he's right? She'd already been through enough for one day. I didn't need the psycho on the other end of the radio adding to her nightmares. What if he's not? I asked, glancing back in the mirror. 
He's just stirring the pot. We have enough to worry about right now. We don't need to add his conspiracy theories to the mix. The government could do something like that, Alex said, and it wasn't a question, but a legitimate concern. I'm just saying, they could do a lot of things. They have done a lot of things. Things we don't even know about. Yeah, but all governments around the world? I asked. They wouldn't be able to agree that the sky is blue or that the earth is round out of spite, let alone plan a mass genocide of the entire world. I leaned back in my seat and let out a heavy breath. He's just a loon trying to scare everyone. It's working, Sophie muttered. Exactly, which is why we don't need to listen to it. It's not helping anything, and I'm not worried about the world. I'm worried about the five of us. He's a conspiracy theorist. He said it himself. And we can't get distracted with what-ifs and maybes when we're trying to figure out what the hell we'll do here in this moment. Alex wanted to argue with me, but gratefully, he didn't. I was exhausted, and we'd been through enough for the time being. I couldn't handle another heap of bullshit quite yet. We just have to stay focused, I murmured, mostly to myself. See what the Coast Guard have to say. Did you see that? Alex sat forward in his seat. I peered through the falling snow toward the exit as we drove closer. One light flashed, then another. It was a roadblock at the Brayton Drive exit, and I slowed. It's the Coast Guard. Sophie pointed to a man in a Humvee at the roadblock. Cars were stopped along the turnoff, but the engines were off. The Coast Guardsman was the only person I could see. He was there, living and breathing. I wasn't sure if I wanted to cry with joy or hold my breath. I followed the path in the snow toward the coned-off area where the man was parked and brought the pilot to a stop. He climbed out of the Humvee and hurried over, looking a bit worse for wear. He was unkempt, his uniform was tattered, and he was underdressed given the weather. Then again, it had been a long night for all of us, I couldn't imagine what the Coast Guard had been dealing with. I rolled down my window as he drew closer. Evening, miss. He tried to smile welcomingly, but he blinked and shivered in the snow. I'm Petty Officer Donahoe. It's been a while since I've seen a car. You're a welcome sight. His grin widened, and a flake of snow caught in his mustache. So are you. I nearly laughed with relief, I couldn't contain my smile. We were just in Whiteley. It's not good, I said quietly. Officer Donahoe shook his head. No, it's not. None of it is. We're rounding everyone up at the bus depot by the trooper detachment. Just take this exit here and head to Tudor Road. He pointed down the turnoff. You'll see the signs. But what's happening? I asked. Does anyone know? I mean, how much danger are we still in? He smiled and held up his hand. I know you've got a lot of questions, miss, but there's protocol and all that. They'll fill you in when you get to the station, he reassured us. I nodded, but was anxious for answers and reluctant to move on until I got some. Thank you, I muttered, even if I had a feeling they'd been tight-lipped about it. Even in chaos, they won't tell us what we need to know, I said, rolling up my window as I pulled off the highway. Especially in chaos, Alex echoed. Did you see his hands? I glanced at him. What do you mean? They were practically blue. He didn't have gloves on. He was sitting in his truck before we pulled up, Sophie said, though it sounded like she was searching for reassurance. He didn't need them in there. We all stewed in silence as I headed into the city. It was huge and sprawling compared to Whiteley, and yet it was eerily still, just as it had been when I stopped on the overpass. It was difficult to imagine there were any survivors at all. But again, we were alive, so there had to be others. Spray-painted signs and cones marked the turns to the bus depot, and I felt a strange sense of excitement the closer we drove. The officer said there were others, 
and seeing them would help it feel a lot less like we were the last five people on the planet. Turning at the last sign, I pulled into the parking lot. It was filled with cars, just like I'd hoped. To the right of the bus depot was a complex of industrial buildings, and I could imagine all of the offices bustling with what city officials and lawmen and women remained as they scrambled to figure out what to do with all of the survivors. I pulled into a vacant spot at the edge of the lot and shut off the engine. We'd finally made it. I unclipped my seatbelt, but none of the others moved. I glanced back at Sophie, staring out the windshield toward the bus station. What's wrong? What will happen when we go in? Sophie asked. Are they going to separate us? Alex looked back at her, then at me. In my excitement to get answers and find a sense of community again, I hadn't thought about what would happen to us after. I turned in my seat to face them both. I won't let them separate us. They have no reason to. It was a true statement. I had no idea what protocol would be, but I would do everything I could to make sure we remained together, for now at least. I looked Alex in the eyes, seeing the fear I knew all too well in them. As far as I'm concerned, I'm your only living relative, all right? He nodded. There was no getting around the fact that our lives would change again once we knew what was going on, and how the Coast Guard were instructed to handle all of this. But we needed to know, so we could start to move forward and have some semblance of closure. I looked at Sophie, waiting for an agreement. All right, she finally said. We stick together, I whispered. We don't split up, not until we know what's going on. I nodded to the kids. Let's wake them up before we freeze to death out here. Sophie unbuckled Thea's seatbelt as I turned forward once again to gather myself. We were here. We were safe. We would have answers and protection. The kids would have protection. Alex climbed out of the passenger seat and opened the back to help with Bo. We're here, bud. Time to wake up. I got out of the car and pulled the pistol out from under the seat. The Coast Guard didn't need to know about my gun until they found it for themselves. Sophie watched me as I shoved it in my waistband and pulled my shirt and coat over it. Just to be safe, I said, flashing the most reassuring smile I could. I grabbed my wallet from the center console, then I shut the door. Someone had already tried to kill me, and now I had four humans to protect. The way things had been going, I didn't think anyone could blame me for being prepared. I'm still tired, Thea whined as Sophie bent down to zip her jacket. I know. We'll get to sleep more soon. She took Thea's little mittened hand in hers, and we headed around to Bo and Alex on the other side. Together, we walked toward the bus depot building. Stick together, okay, you guys? I looked specifically to Thea and Bo. We're a family if anyone asks. Bo's head tilted uncertain. That way they'll keep us together, I explained. They both nodded. Is this where the police are? Bo asked. He hadn't spoken all that much since they'd showed up at Sophie's, but his voice was wary enough to know he was worried about something. I don't know, I told him, but there will be people here who can help us. Bo peered at the domed-like building, but said nothing else. The five of us walked briskly through the snow, toward the entrance. The wind was biting cold, even if the snow was only falling intermittently. The depot was large and surrounded by a parking lot, one luckily big enough for everyone to park. As we approached the large, glass double doors, I'd expected to see hordes of people standing inside. Instead, people were sleeping on cots lined up against the wall, and the main floor was practically empty. When we walked through the doors, only a few people milled around on the other side of the building. They seemed more like passengers waiting for a late-night bus than survivors seeking refuge. The ticket counter was empty and dark, clearly unused. There were no Coast Guardsmen hustling around or radios crackling in and out, and it didn't smell right either. A scent I couldn't quite put my finger on lingered in the air. 
There was nothing here. No stock of food or water. There were no EMTs or even a buzz of worry. Just a dozen or so people sleeping and a few others talking on the other side of the room. Hold up. I held up my hand, and we stood at the entrance as the door came swinging shut. Something didn't feel right. It was hard to tell if it was the fire inside me roiling, or if it was fear of what I couldn't see or sense. Stay here, I whispered. Oh, Sophie reached for my arm. I'll be okay. I looked her in the eyes and offered her a reassuring smile. I could feel the fire in my fingers, hot and aching, and I knew if anyone in here would be okay, it was probably me, even if I feared finding out either way. Alex, I said, glancing at the car. If anything happens, you start that thing again and you get everyone the hell out of here. His dark eyes were wide, but he nodded with understanding. Turning on my heels, I walked swiftly toward the two men at the other end of the room, whose faces lit up when they noticed me approaching. I glanced at a frantic woman, pacing back and forth in front of someone sitting in a chair against the furthest wall. The pacing woman's clothes were wrinkled, and she looked a little worse for wear, but I felt the same way. At least she was alive, and she had someone with her. Maybe the place was a funneling station, and they would tell us where to go from here. I walked toward her, curious what she knew. The two men a dozen yards away eyed me, but I wanted to talk to her. She wouldn't still be here if she didn't feel safe, and woman to woman, she would be straight with me. Excuse me, I said, stopping beside her. Ma'am, excuse me. I raised my voice, noticing the woman with a short, dark bob that sat in the chair across from her. Finally, the pacing woman noticed me and looked up, hurrying toward me. Hi, I'm Al, I offered, forcing a smile. I wondered if this was a situation where pleasantries were expected. Um, where the hell is everyone? Oh, the woman grinned. There was a flicker in her shimmering eyes that lit the deep lines of her face and the dark circles under her eyes. Aren't you pretty, she said, like I was a five-year-old girl. Just like my sister. Excuse me? You're just like my sister, Trish. She nodded behind her with an unnerving smile at the woman in the chair. Hurry, come say hi. Her foul breath hit me in a wave, and I had to turn my face away. Whatever apprehension I'd been feeling flared to a blaring alarm. Come on. She waved me closer to her sister, unmoving from where she sat like she couldn't be bothered to stand. You'll love her. We're just sitting down for tea. But as I drew closer, the hair rose on the back of my neck and arms, and my footsteps, along with my smile, faltered. Her sister's eyes were painted on, her legs and arms crossed and unmoving. Her sister wasn't her sister at all. She was a mannequin. I stumbled back. Come, the woman said, tugging on my arm. You'll love her. I yanked my arm away, glancing between the crazy woman and her giant doll. Shaking my head, I turned on my heel. We're getting out of here, I said, loud enough the kids would hear me. Fear darkened their faces. Now, I told them. Where are you going? The two men behind me said, but I didn't stop to chat. I knew they were following behind me. Sophie and Alex turned the kids towards the exit as the door opened and the officer from the Coast Guard stepped inside. You made it, he announced. No, I stopped behind the kids. We're leaving. I grabbed Thea's hand. Let's go. Donahoe raised a gun and aimed it at me. No, no, I don't think so. I gripped Thea's hand tighter, nearly crushing it. I told you it's been a while since we've gotten anyone new. You can't leave so soon. He said it apologetically, but I could see the delight in his eyes. 
I took a step back and bumped into a hard body, then spun around. The two men were right behind me, the five of us surrounded by three men, one with a gun. Letting go of Thea's hand, I nudged her closer to Sophie and the others behind me. Let us go, I said with false bravado, and pulled the pistol from my waistband. And I won't shoot your friend. I stepped as close to the wall as I could so I could see the three of them and aim the barrel at the tallest man who looked like he could do the most damage, especially since he was the closest to us. Like he could read my thoughts, the tall one smirked, and a wave of chills washed up my spine. I will kill you, I promised him. The kids scooted up beside me. I could feel their warm bodies and hear their whimpers. The men must have taken me half serious because they stopped a few feet away. Kill who? Ted? Donahoe asked. Meh, you don't want to kill him. Then Kathy here, having her little tea party, will get all worked up. And trust me, that's no good for anyone. I glanced from Kathy, creeping closer, to Ted, watching the way his eyes sparkled with excitement as Donahoe carried on beside me. All of their clothes were dirty, but Donahoe was in uniform. And even Ted wore a neon vest, like he worked for the city, or maybe the Coast Guard, too. Regardless, they were definitely insane, with zero desire to help us. Maybe not good for you, I seethed, my gaze shifting between the two lascivious men who were getting their jollies off watching us fidget in fear. But one of you will be dead, and I'd be okay with that. Look, lady, you kill one of them, then I kill one of you, Donahoe said. Capiche? My gaze darted to him as Sophie gasped. His gun was aimed at her chest. Then Ted grabbed onto Thea, pulling her into him, and she screamed. Let her go, I shouted. One gun was pointed at Sophie, and a lunatic had Thea. You won't hurt them, I blurted, praying it was true. They wanted us for something or they wouldn't have tricked us into coming here. They could have killed us on the road if that was their intent. Donahoe shrugged, correction, we don't want to hurt you all, at least not yet. The meat's more tender if we don't. I nearly dropped the gun and had to steady myself so as not to stumble back. I glanced around the room, realizing the people on the cots were either dead or they weren't real, just like Kathy's sister. I couldn't tell which with the blankets covering them. This place wasn't a funneling station. It was a corral, and they'd herded us here like cattle. But, you know, killing you now or later, it doesn't really matter much. Either way, we get what we want in the end. Sick motherfuckers, Alex growled, and Sophie had to grab onto him as he took a step forward so that he didn't get himself killed. Bo trembled against my leg, grabbing hold of me and crying for his sister. What are you waiting for then? I asked, trying to keep them talking while I formulated a plan. I could kill Donahoe, who had the gun, but I wasn't sure the others didn't have a weapon they weren't showing me. It would be stupid of them not to, and Ted had Thea. What do you want? I'll take you, Ted said, leaning in as close as he dared with my gun still pointed at him. Thea's cries turned into screams again, and Kathy hurried closer, shouting nonsense in reply. It's like she wasn't even human anymore, but a starving wildling needing to feed. Shut the kid up, the other man growled. Shut them up, shut them the fuck up. He pushed Kathy away and she fell onto the ground. He kicked at her, like she was a dog he had to teach a lesson, and she whimpered like one too. A gunshot rang through the building, piercingly loud, and we all ducked instinctively. Donahoe fell to the ground, writhing in pain, and I aimed my Glock at Ted's chest as he stood in temporary shock, watching as his friend collapsed to the ground. I pulled the trigger. Ted fell to his knees, then I shot him again for good measure, as another shot rang through the air, taking the lunatic beside him down, dead with a single shot. The doors on the other side of the building flew open, 
and Kathy ran out into the winter night, screaming. A man came out from behind the ticketing area, one I hadn't seen yet. My gun shook in my hand as I aimed it at his chest, adrenaline whooshing through me. I will not hurt you, he said slowly, carefully. His voice was low and reassuring, but I wasn't sure I trusted it. He held up his hands so I could see them, and his gun. Had he not just shot two of the men who were threatening to eat us, I wouldn't have believed him for a single second, but I lowered my gun, registering the kids, crying in a human ball on the floor. Frantic, I spun around. Alex and Sophie covered the two children, all of them with their hands over their ears and tears streaming down their faces. Donahoe was crumpled in front of the door, barely breathing, but he wasn't dead yet. The man with the gun stepped closer. He was huge, with broad shoulders and dark features, like most Inuit descendants. He would have been fearsome had I any time to think about it before he trained his pistol on Donahoe. Cover your ears, he told us. He looked at me and lifted an arched eyebrow. And look away. He nodded at the kids. I covered my ears, but was unable to look away as he shot Donahoe in the head. The gunshot echoed through the building, and I waited contentedly as the dead man's chest fell for the final time. 18. L. December 12th. Even with a flannel blanket wrapped around me, I was still shaking. I'd shot a man. I'd gone from never hurting a living soul to killing two men in a span of 48 hours. I massaged the incessant pounding in my head, desperately trying to keep it together, until I knew more about our mysterious new friend. His house was shabby chic with a touch of glam, which I hadn't expected. It felt normal, which was nice for a change, and the warm scent of vanilla hung faintly in the air. Books and folded maps were stacked on the side table next to the plush leather chair across from me in the living room and a satellite phone lay on top. Our host hadn't said much, but he was clearly capable. After the bus depot, we'd followed him back here. After he told us to eat whatever we wanted in the kitchen and pointed to the bedroom upstairs, he'd disappeared outside, and I hadn't seen him since. Thea moaned in her sleep, and I peered down at the pallet of blankets Alex and Sophie had made for the four of them on the floor. It turned out they hadn't wanted food or space. They were only concerned about not being separated from each other. They craved warmth and needed rest, which outweighed any apprehension they'd had about being in a stranger's house. I watched the four of them, bodies rising with rhythmic sleep. The sound of their soft snores made my eyelids begin to droop, even if my mind was a muddied mess. The front doorknob clicked and opened, and our generous host stepped inside. It seemed silly not to know his name, but there hadn't been a good time to exchange pleasantries. A bottle of amber alcohol sloshed in his hand as he stopped in the entry, staring down at the kids camped out on his living room floor. Safety in numbers, I whispered. He glanced at me, huddled in the corner of the couch. Then he looked at the flicking candle beside me. I left the lights off, like you said. I hope the candle is okay. I prayed it was. I hated the darkness. I saw the matches above the fireplace and... It's fine, he said, and glanced around the room, like he didn't recognize it, or maybe he just didn't know what to do with himself now that it was inhabited. He stepped over Sophie's feet, sticking out from beneath her blanket, and he shrugged off his coat and tossed it on the stairs. His quiet reserve and fortitude made me think he might have been a trooper or military. I don't want to risk anyone noticing the lights through the drapes, he explained. The candle's fine. He claimed the leather seat beside the unlit fireplace. His stubble seemed thicker in the flickering shadows, his features harder and more mysterious. I understand. I wanted to be invisible, too. I pulled the blanket up around my neck. You can turn the heater up, he said, eyes shifting to the staircase. We might as well use it while we've got it. It's okay, 
I told him. I wasn't cold. I wasn't sure I would ever be cold again at the rate my insides were burning. But the blanket brought me comfort, and I gripped it tighter. How much longer? I asked. It was one of the many questions on my mind. Until the power goes out, I mean. He let out a breath and stared into the empty hearth. A couple weeks, maybe less. Between the storms and lack of maintenance, it won't be long. I'd assumed as much, and even though I dreaded the day, I was too exhausted to care. What were you doing at the depot? I couldn't help but ask the question that had been stirring for hours. He finally looked at me. I was at the trooper outpost across the parking lot getting this file of maps and saw you drive in, he said, nodding to the folder he tossed on the floor by the side table when we'd first arrived. They're going to help me plan where I'm heading next. I see. My voice was barely a whisper as what now blared like a bullhorn in my head. I had planning to do too, and I didn't even know where to start. At least we were safe for the night. Thank you, for everything, I said. It's hard to trust strangers right now, but you've been very kind. He looked at me, and just as quickly he glanced away. You've used a gun before? Oh, uh. I sunk lower into the couch. Yes, but not like that. The weekly practice had been for self-defense, but shooting at a target downrange was nothing like staring down at a human being that would never breathe again. It'll get easier. It already is, I thought aloud. The gratification I felt, knowing Thomas or Ted could never hurt or frighten someone again, made me sick to my stomach. Killing people wasn't something I wanted to be easy, yet part of me hoped it would continue to be. He studied me a moment, the candle flickering as I let out a deep breath. You're holding yourself together pretty well. I wasn't sure if it was a skeptical observation or a compliment. I laughed, if a little hysterical. I'm waiting for it to all catch up with me. I leaned my head back on the cushion and stared up at the ceiling. I had a mini breakdown earlier, but I think I'm due for another. Only one so far, he said wryly. In the last six hours, I smiled at him. His amusement faded and his gaze shifted to the bottle in his hand. It was bourbon. He hadn't opened it yet, but he gripped onto it so hard his knuckles were white. You're lucky then. He turned it around in his hand, eyeing it like he wasn't sure he really wanted any. Drinking was definitely one way to deal with the world ending. I'd done that already and woke up with glowing fingers. I figured it was best not to tell him that part, though. What happened tonight is only the beginning of whatever comes next, I said. It will get worse before it gets better. Yep, he drawled, and I watched the battle inside him end. The demons won, and he shut his eyes and took a long pull from the bottle. I'm El, by the way. He pulled the bottle from his lips. Jackson, he exhaled, and rested the bourbon in his lap. He glanced over at the kids. Are they all yours? I shook my head. We met last night. I peered down at Alex, curled up in a ball of blankets, sleeping like he hadn't in days. Bo was sprawled out beside him with his mouth open, snoring softly. But I guess they are now aren't they? I realized aloud. They were the only survivors I found in Whiteley. It already seemed so long ago, as my mind grew fuzzy with warmth and the promise of sleep. My sister was gone, but they were there. Jackson stared at me, but I didn't take it personally. It wasn't even at me. He was staring through me, at a memory that made his permanent frown deepen and his knuckles whiten again. He was disappearing to somewhere dark inside his mind before my eyes. This is a nice condo, I said, trying to reel him back in. I had a hard time imagining such a mountain of a man living in a place like this. 
It's way nicer than my apartment in Seward. Jackson pulled his gun and holster off and set it on the floor next to his pile of maps. It's my buddy Ross's place. He nodded to a framed photo on the wall behind me. It was two troopers in uniform, Jackson holding a graduation certificate. A woman with wavy, long blonde hair smiled between them, her arms over their shoulders. She's pretty. Is that your wife? Jackson stared at the photo so long I didn't think he would answer. Then he looked away. His sister. My wife. My mouth opened, and I blinked dumbly as I tried to think of what to say. I'm sorry, was all that escaped. Ross went to check on his wife. I see. I hated to ask, but I couldn't help myself. Is she okay? I assumed I knew the answer, but I still hoped that maybe she'd made it. More survivors would make it seem like there was actually a chance everything would right itself again. Jackson shrugged and took another drink from his bottle. He was supposed to check in today. He picked up the satellite phone. You know as much as I do at this point. Aside from the soft slumber of sleeping children, the room grew silent. It was clear Jackson wasn't sure he'd hear from his friend again. If he survived the fever and he's a trooper, I'm sure he's fine, I tried to reassure him. But it was clear Jackson didn't want my sympathy. He preferred the bottle to conversation, and if his friend coped like he did, it might be days before Ross cared enough to check in. I'm sure you'll hear from him soon. Jackson's eyes cut to me. So, you're an optimist then. He smiled with feigned amusement. I wanted to see a full, real smile. I could imagine it was wide and welcoming. Big guys had a way of surprising you with their big hearts, even if it seemed unlikely, as Jackson brought the bottle to his mouth again. No, I said, I'm not generally optimistic. I'm one of the most miserable people I know, but... I squeezed my glove hands into fists beneath the blanket, knowing I had to be, or I would lose my mind. But? But I have to be as positive as I can. For them. I nodded to the kids. So, here I am, trying to be optimistic. Jackson studied me more closely than before his brow furrowing before he leaned his head back in his chair. So, he exhaled, from Seward to Whiteley to here, huh? I was taking care of my stepdad's estate. He died recently. I'm sorry. Don't be, I told him. I'm not. He was a monster. I ran my fingers through my hair and pushed Dr. John from my mind. There were worse things out there that could hurt me now. I went to his estate in Eagle River, planning on selling it when all of this happened. I knew Jenny was sick, so I went to Whiteley after that, hoping I would get to see her again. I stared at the flickering candle flame. She was already dead. Jackson took another swig of his bourbon before he stared quietly up at the ceiling. My father lived in Eagle River, he said then was contemplative for a few deep breaths. He had a mushing business for the tourists up near the mountains. Cold, hot fear lapped up the back of my neck, and the fire inside me pulsated in tandem with my heartbeat. He was a musher, I whispered. The son of a bitch loved his dogs more than his own kid. He lost his mind, though. At least, that's what I think. I glanced back up at the photo of Jackson in his uniform and the certificate he held in his hand. Jackson Mitchell. Thomas Mitchell. Tall and broad-shouldered, just like Jackson. Though Thomas had lighter skin and hadn't looked like an Alaskan native. I saw Thomas looming in the doorway all over again, felt him grabbing onto my neck. Your mother? I hedged petrified to know the answer. She died a long time ago, with my baby sister in childbirth. His head turned to the side. You know, it was the strangest thing. The way he died. I can't get it out of my head. Your dad? What do you mean? 
Someone strangled him. I could feel my fingernails digging into my palms through the gloves. How could you tell? I know what bruises around a neck look like, and you'd have to be strong to crush a man's throat with your bare hands. Only bruises? Jackson's hard-set eyes fixed on me. Would you think I was crazy if I told you I think it was a woman who killed him? I cleared my throat this time, the heat of the room and the low burn inside practically eating through me. I wasn't sure how my cheeks weren't on fire. I guess a woman could be that strong, I said. But the thing was, I wasn't that strong. There was no way I could have done that under any other circumstances. But what makes you think it wasn't a man? He held up his large hands, twice the size of mine, and wiggled his fingers. Small hands, he said, and fingernails, but there was something weird about it. My thoughts stilled. Burn marks. He shook his head. I've been trying to figure it out. Of course he was, because what had happened was impossible. And somehow, the only decent adult I'd met since I'd woken up after puking my brains out was the son of the man I'd impossibly killed with my bare hands. This world is unrecognizable now, I rasped, trying to breathe through the lump in my throat. Jackson needed to know it was an accident. It was self-defense, and I had no choice. His father would have killed me. As a trooper, Jackson might have understood. But as a son? I couldn't bring myself to tell him. I didn't want to risk him throwing out the kids. And I wasn't ready to figure this survival thing out on my own. And how did I explain the fire without scaring them all? The thought hadn't escaped me that maybe they should be scared. And maybe I should be alone. Tears burned my eyes and escaped the brim of my lashes. Just as quickly, I tried to wipe them away. Jackson cleared his throat. Are you okay? I shook my head. I wasn't okay. I was probably losing my mind, like the other crazy people running around the city. And it was only a matter of time before I did something to hurt one of the kids, the way I'd hurt Thomas. I covered my face and tried to hold back the smothering despondency. None of this is going to be okay. Thankfully, Jackson wasn't a man of many words, and he stood up, his boots making the floorboards beneath the carpet creak. I heard the glug, glug, glug of bourbon sloshing into a cup. Then it clinked quietly against the coffee table. In case you need it, he said, and his footsteps retreated up the stairs. I waited until I heard his bedroom door shut before lifting my face. A mug full of bourbon sat on the coffee table in front of me. Jackson had no idea who was sitting in his house or who he'd saved. As the kids continued to sleep, I stared into the candle flame and cried my eyes out as silently as I could. 19. Jackson. December 13th. I woke to the sound of the heater clicking on, and the scent of something savory and sweet filled the air. I peeled my eyes open and blinked up at the ceiling. My head was a spinning punching bag, and I felt just as beaten. The bed squeaked as I rolled over. I'd passed out between listening to Elle's intermittent sniffles and the ticking of the clock on the guest room wall. I glanced up at it. It was nearly noon. Pushing myself up, I peered down at the quarter-empty bottle of bourbon beside the bed. It could have been worse. I could have downed the entire thing and been non-functional today. But I had a trip to start planning. One without Ross. I heard a clang downstairs, which meant an intruder was stealing the silver, or the kids were still in the house. I half expected them to be gone when I woke up, but I knew they had nowhere else to go, especially since the Coast Guard wouldn't be any help. Grabbing my boots from the floor, I pulled them on, ignoring the laces. I wasn't awake enough for that. I climbed to my feet, grabbed the bottle, and opened the door. Whispers filled the air and footsteps pattered against the tile floor in the kitchen. Another pot clanked and my stomach gurgled as I inhaled the aroma of bacon. I tried to remember the last time I'd eaten. I raided Ross's bathroom for deodorant, washed my mouth out and splashed cold water on my face before I headed down the stairs. 
It was weird waking up in his house, and yet, it felt oddly comforting, too. At least I'd slept, really slept for the first time in days. The living room had been cleaned up and looked just as Kelsey had left it, save for my things around the leather chair. The pallet of blankets was gone. The fancy pillows were put back where they'd been on the couch. It was like Elle and the kids had never been there. He's coming! One of them hissed, and the little girl scuttled out of the way as I turned into the kitchen. The narrow space was filled to capacity. The younger ones were putting plates on the table, their wide eyes peering up at me. The teenagers were behind the stove, the boy flipping a pancake while the girl drained bacon grease into a mug. The only one missing was Elle. Morning, the older girl said, setting the grease pan in the sink. She was shy or scared. I didn't blame her for either. I hadn't looked human for a while now. I stood dumbly in the doorway. Morning. I'm Sophie, and this is Alex. Then she nodded to the kids. That's Thea and Bo. We wanted to make you breakfast as a thank you for letting us stay here last night. That's unnecessary, I said as my stomach rumbled again. But thanks. Wow, that was a big one, Thea said with a giggle, staring at my stomach. She couldn't have been more than six or seven. This is your seat right here. She pointed to the chair at the head of the table. It was Ross's spot during family dinners. I pulled the chair out and sat down as Alex brought over a plate of pancakes. Sophie followed with the platter of bacon. They all wore clean clothes and looked refreshed after their ordeal at the bus stop, more than I could say for myself, and they were more animated than I could ever be in the morning. I was about to ask where Elle was, worried she might have thrown in the towel after her internal battle last night and left the kids with me when the front door opened and she bustled inside. She was wearing a black down parka and beanie and held up a frozen can of orange juice concentrate. Look what I found, she said, divesting her jacket. Yay, Thea clapped. It's her favorite, Bo grumbled in explanation. They were definitely siblings, but as for the others, I doubted it. Elle draped her jacket on the back of a dining room chair and handed the can to Sophie, who was already pulling out a pitcher. Where'd you find that? I asked, wondering if she'd walked all the way to the store just for juice. Her cheeks reddened, and she shoved her hands in the back pockets of her jeans. I, um, raided the neighbor's freezer. Well, that was clever, seeing how they no longer needed it. She cleared her throat. I made coffee. You want a cup? Please. Black? Definitely. I need all the help I can get this morning. Thea set an empty glass next to my plate. Is it because you drink so much? Thea, Sophie chided. I almost smiled. Yeah, kid. Something like that. My mommy drank a lot, too. I think that's why... Thea, Bo shouted at her. Thea's lips pursed and she glowered at him. All right, Elle said, setting a cup of coffee down in front of me. Let's wait and argue after we've had breakfast. Sticking her tongue out at her brother, Thea blew out a breath as she climbed into her chair. Thanks for the coffee, I said as Elle pulled out a chair beside Thea. Of course, she cooed as she took a drink from her own steaming hot mug. Thea eyed her, clearly disgusted. I don't drink coffee. It smells bad. Good, I told her. It puts air on your chest. Her eyes widened. Really? I shrugged and lifted the collar of my thermal shirt, pretending to peer down at my chest. I'd say so. He's teasing you, Bo told her. You're so gullible. Nuh-uh. Yeah, huh Bo, Thea, Alex interrupted before they could go another round of back and forth. Take a pancake and a piece of bacon and pass them to Jackson. I helped Thea lift the plate of pancakes as her little arms shook, and I took one before passing it along. Everyone settled into an uncomfortable, close-proximity silence. That was the worst kind. I took a gulp of my coffee and watched everyone's eyes darting around at one another. The only one who seemed oblivious to the awkwardness was Thea. She picked up her glass of orange juice and slurped it down. Only when it was half gone did she come up for air. It's really good, she gasped and licked her lips. I'll bet. It wasn't until I took a bite of bacon that I thought to say the same thing. 
I shoved the rest of it in my mouth without ceremony. I like a lot of butter on mine, Bo said, and he put a small piece on Thea's pancake and helped her spread it around. I hadn't realized kids were such good buffers, and as difficult as I thought it might be to have them there, I appreciated that they were, too. I hope you like bacon and pancakes, Elle said. We didn't want to wake you to ask. I do, but I'll eat anything, I told her. Something my wife always appreciated. Eyes flicked to me and the room grew quiet again. The sound of forks and knives clanking louder in the void of conversation. Desperate for a distraction, I cut into my pancake. It was the first time in days, excluding my brief talk with Ross, that I had been around people. And even if it made me feel uncomfortable, I was strangely grateful for it too. This is great. Thank you. Do you want syrup? Sophie held up the container. I glanced up at her and shook my head. No, but thank you. I forked a piece of buttered pancake into my mouth and decided I missed food more than I thought. I didn't mean to snoop, Alex said. But I saw the maps in your file of the backcountry. Are you leaving the city? We heard about a safe place in Hartley Bay, Sophie added. Is that where you're going? I shook my head. I'm thinking about Whitehorse. Elle took a sip of her coffee. What's in Whitehorse? She glanced away as she set her mug down. I could hear the hope in her voice, but it was misplaced. There was nothing there for them. Not like in Hartley Bay, if what I'd heard about it was true. I glanced around the table at expectant faces. A place far removed from all of this bullshit, I said, forgetting the youthful ears at the table. A lodge I've been to before, out in the middle of nowhere. If you know where you're going, then why do you need the maps? Sophie asked, taking a bite of bacon. Because you never know what sort of trouble you're going to run into. And those maps have dozens of locations the department has raided over the years, which might come in handy. Bo licked his fingers. What kind of places? Squatter houses, backwater distilleries, places where I might find shelter and supplies if I really needed them. I'll be leaving in a few days, I told them. You're welcome to stay here as long as you like. Ross won't need the place and he's not the type that would mind anyway. Thank you, Elle said quietly. We ate the rest of our breakfast without much more conversation, though Thea and Bo bickered back and forth when they grew too restless. I was lost in thoughts of Whitehorse and Ross. Elle and the kids were likely dreading their uncertain future, one I'd already come to terms with. I looked at Elle, staring into her coffee cup. She was still wearing her gloves, which was strange, but it wasn't my business, just like my quirks were none of hers. She stared so long, I wondered if she would blink. I imagined she was frantic inside, considering what she would do with four kids in a civilization that had only just begun to crumble. Conveniences would be gone. Safety would be fleeting. While my plate was wiped clean, hers was barely touched. Elle? Sophie said with a tentative smile. Elle stirred from her fog, her eyebrows lifting. Huh. Are you okay? Do you want more of anything? Elle's smile was forced and she shook her head. Nope, I'm good. My stomach must have shrunk since it's been a while since I've had an actual meal. Everyone seemed to buy that explanation, and it was probably true to some extent, but I saw the same fear in Elle's eyes I'd seen the night before. She was on the brink of a breakdown. I couldn't imagine my life six months from now, let alone what it would look like if I was 20-something and suddenly had four kids to care for. Traveling would be more difficult. Vehicles would have to be larger, which meant more fuel would be needed for their thousand-mile trek to Hartley Bay. Elle would have to provide enough food to feed five mouths instead of one, and she would have to find safe lodging for all of them, too. It wasn't going to be easy, and yet I knew she was going to do it. I could see it in her false smiles and forced optimism as she tried to convince them and herself that everything would be okay. Alex got up to get more orange juice for the kids. I'll grab the coffee, Sophie said, and my mouth was moving before I could stop myself. I can't promise you'll all be safer with me, I told Elle, just above a whisper. I had to get the words out before I changed my mind. And it's not going to be an easy journey, but you can come with me as far as Whitehorse. Elle's eyes shot to mine. I swallowed the rest of my coffee down and set my mug on the table. Hannah would want me to help them, and watching Thea stick her finger in the syrup 
and grin at me with reddened cheeks because she was caught playing with her food meant I was a sucker already. It pulled at my heartstrings, and I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do what I could to help them get to Hartley. I cleared my throat. You'll be on your own after that. Elle's chin trembled, and her eyes filled with tears that twisted my insides. A woman, crying. The hardest thing to see. I stood up and pushed my chair from the table. Thanks for the breakfast, everyone. I've got work to do. Elle reached for my arm, her gloved hand resting on mine. Thank you, she whispered and wiped a rogue tear from her cheek as quickly as it fell. Thank you. 20. L. December 14th. The vertical blinds were cracked on the sliding glass door, allowing sunlight to filter in over the dining table during the first break in the snow. Jackson and I pored over unfolded maps and lists strewn across the table. He was right. There were squatter shacks all over the backcountry, and while some of them were noted on some maps to have been torn down on public land, others had been identified and forgotten. I looked down at my ever-growing list of supplies we needed to accumulate before we headed out of the city. Yukon Territory was nearly an 800-mile journey on good roads, not accounting for weather or unplowed road conditions. According to the maps, the towns we'd pass heading east would be few and far between, and very, very small. While the thought of running into less people was inviting, the uncertainty of being so far away from what conveniences were left was disconcerting. We needed a few days' worth of supplies at least— and I tried not to dwell on what would happen once we got to our destination. Thea hummed behind us on the stool at the counter, oblivious to our consternation, as she turned the printer paper she'd found in the office over to start a new picture. She seemed to be the most adjusted of all of us, like she'd already forgotten Whiteley and the cannibals from the bus depot. Her cries still haunted me, and every time I closed my eyes, I saw the three flesh eaters grinning at me, and could smell Kathy's stinking breath and see the mannequin strategically placed to provide survivors with a false sense of safety. I envied Thea's ability to shut it all away and draw pictures of her family, even if most of them were dead. I'll try the AM stations again, Sophie said from the living room. She and Alex had been searching the radio for a Hartley update all morning. We needed a crank radio if we were going to receive updates during our journey, I realized. The last thing we needed was to miss an announcement that the sanctuary had fallen apart and a warning not to come. I added it to the second page of my list, below flashlights, extra matches, first aid kits, and candles. The kids should have their own packs, Jackson said, taking a drink from his coffee mug. I was glad to see he was doing a little better than the night we'd met him. No longer lost in dark thoughts that had him swimming in bourbon and only the necessities. You don't think all of these things are necessities? I asked, looking down at my list, which included the prepared food and clothing we needed to stock up on. I didn't know much about children and teenagers, other than they were always hungry and grew quickly. Jackson shook his head. There's a difference between stock and necessity. When we have to hide or run, which you already know may be the case, We'll have only what we can carry, the kids included. Thea looked up from her coloring and glanced worriedly between us. And, he continued, their bags better have what they'll need to survive. I cleared my throat. Thea, why don't you go see what Bo is doing upstairs, I said with a smile. Make sure he's not getting into any trouble. He probably is, she said and rolled her eyes. With a giggle, she climbed down from the stool and skipped into the living room. When I looked at Jackson, he was staring at me. You can't protect her from everything, he said. They need to understand how different life is now and how to be prepared if they're going to survive. His words were grim, but true. And while I appreciated them, Thea and Bo were still only children. It seemed like delicacy was needed all the time. They already know what the world is like, I told him. It doesn't have to be on their minds every waking hour. Why not? It's on yours. My eyes narrowed. 
Yes. Well, that's different. Why? What if you're not around to worry about them? They need to be just as alert and aware of what's happening as you are. I understand we all have a big learning curve, Jackson, I said, taking a gulp of water. Fleetingly, I remembered that soon there would be no power or running water, and that was only the start. But it will all come in time. It's only been a few days of craziness. I don't want them to be too horrified to close their eyes, like I am. Jackson's ever-present frown deepened. Then a flash of something softened his face, and he looked back down at his maps without saying another word about it. While I understood his reasoning, I needed time to process and plan so that I could keep them as safe as possible and keep my sanity, too. Having to worry about the kids freaking out more than they already were was an added stress I didn't need right now. I've been thinking, I said, folding my arms on the table. We have the pilot and you have the Tacoma, but maybe we get another vehicle for Sophie or Alex to drive. We could take more supplies that way. Jackson didn't bother looking up from his map. That's more fuel we'll have to find along the way. He drew a line with a sharpie across the page, a straight shot from Eagle River to Whitehorse across the border. I looked at him, praying he wasn't planning on stopping in Eagle River on our way out of Anchorage, but was too afraid to ask. So, you think three vehicles is a bad idea? He took another swig from his mug and circled a town called Slana. If we're heading northeast on the highway, these are the towns we'll be passing. He ran his index finger along the road, tapping on Nelchina, Tulsona, and Mentasta Lake. They're unincorporated villages, most with no fueling stations or even stores for that matter. Everything is going to be few and far between. If we're going to take another vehicle, we'll need to bring as much fuel with us as we can, which means less of everything else. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it's something to consider. Is that your nice way of telling me no? I lifted an eyebrow. He'd made it clear he wanted to bring necessities only, and it was his show. I'd already promised him that. Jackson glanced up at me, his hazel eyes shifting over my face. All I could think about was how much I didn't know about living off the grid or survival, whatever we were calling it. And it was all a reminder of how grateful I was to have him sitting across from me, even if he was the gruffest man I'd ever met. Not for the first time, I was curious to know more about him. What was it like? I asked him, knowing I'd learn nothing if I didn't at least try. What was what like? Being a trooper. I used to cringe when I'd see them around town, wondering if I might get pulled over. And I've never been in trouble with the law. Well, not really. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms over his chest. Not really? I shrugged. I ran away when I was 17, I told him. A rebel, he murmured. Intrigue danced in his eyes. I can't say I'm surprised. Oh, and why is that? How often did you go to the shooting range? He asked. I answered him with a question. What makes you think I went to the shooting range? The way you hold your gun. Stiff, like you've only ever used it routinely. And hunting with a handgun is illegal, so I know you don't use it for that. This time, he stared at me, expectant. Do you? Well, you said it yourself. I'm a rebel. Let me guess. You used to go shooting with your dad. A father-daughter thing? No, I blurted, shaking it off with a laugh. Definitely not. Jackson didn't smile, though and the silence stretched longer than I was comfortable with. I opened my mouth to speak. Well, because of him, he asked. His words shocked me, though I wasn't sure why. Jackson was trained to read people. I glanced back down at my list. Something like that. But we're getting off point. I lifted my sheets of paper. Maybe you should look over my checklist and tell me what you think the necessities are. It will save us more time, don't you think? Then I can start scrounging them up. 
While I said it with more sass than I'd meant to, it was probably the best idea I'd had all morning. His dark eyebrow lifted. Seriously, I said. Help me make a list you're comfortable with, and I'll go to the mall and gather what we need. You're not going to the mall. Jackson leaned forward, adamant. Every person left alive has had that same idea. And trust me, that's not something you want to worry about. Okay, well... Shouting echoed from outside, followed by rapid gunfire, and Jackson and I crouched at the table. The instant I heard the first panicked murmur from the other room, I shot through the house. Jackson pulled his gun from his holster and jolted after me into the living room. Get out of the window, Jackson shouted. Sophie and Alex whipped around, the blinds rustling back into place. Jackson stilled them the best he could and peeked out of one of the slits, eyes wide. Bo and Thea ran down the stairs, eyebrows drawn together and fear glistening in their eyes. It's okay, I told them, pulling Thea into my arms. Alex grabbed a baseball bat by the door as another spurt of rapid fire, somewhere around the back, rang out outside, and I reached for Bo. Jackson motioned all of us into the office to hide as he ran back into the kitchen toward the backyard. The rapid fire continued, my heartbeat keeping time, round for round. Who's doing that? Thea whined as we ran into the office. Sophie pulled her into her arms. I don't know, but we have to be quiet, okay? Her voice was as unsteady as my legs, and I closed as quietly inside the room. Shots went off again. It had to be a scare tactic. There weren't enough people alive to be shooting at the masses. Bo whimpered and grabbed hold of Alex's legs, wrapping his arms around them like he thought he might leave. Alex clung to him tighter. I peered around at the office. It was small, and the five of us were cramped against the desk. The rapid fire ceased. Heavy breaths and rustling seemed to echo in the room as I listened for movement in the other room. The sliding glass door opened, slow and nearly silent, and I pulled the pistol out of the back of my pants. I cracked the door open, looking for Jackson. He came around the corner before I heard his footsteps. We're going, he said, now. I hurried the kids from the room as a blood-curdling scream reached my ears from outside, followed by a screeching plea. I felt the color drain from my face. I could imagine whoever was out there begging for their lives on the promenade that weaved its way through the townhomes. We stopped at the door and I reached for the kids' jackets. Come on, I said, tossing Alex and Sophie theirs. I helped Thea slip into hers while Alex helped Bo. I hadn't realized there was anyone in the neighborhood left besides us. Now I wondered how many there actually were. I'll get the bags upstairs, Sophie said. No, Jackson shook his head. There's no time. Out, now. He glanced out the front window again, then opened the door. He peered around the carport and down the walkway before he stepped back inside. Get them in quietly, he told us, then looked at Alex. Get ready to start the car. Don't start it until the kids are in and you see Elle coming out. I don't want the gunman to hear you too soon. Then, you drive. Drive where? Sophie asked. Voice frozen in a whisper. Jackson looked from me to Alex. Get on Turnbull Street and follow it to the park at the edge of the city. Don't stop or turn back for anything. Park behind the ivy-covered fence. I'll meet you there. I took a step toward him. Jackson. I'll keep an eye out back, he said. Get them out, he told me. One at a time. No noise and keep your heads down. These crazy fucks don't know we're here yet. Let's keep it that way. I nodded as Jackson headed toward the backyard again to keep watch. Heart racing a million miles a second, I peered out the front door and edged my way out to see down both sides of the walkway. There were vehicles in the carport, but no one was rushing out like we were. There was no movement. Thea stifled a scream, and Bo wrapped his arm around her. With a nod of understanding, Alex went out first, timid but unwavering as he made his way a few spots down to the pilot, and he opened the driver door as quietly as he could. He slid into the front seat, 
and closed his eyes as he slowly pulled the door shut after him, careful not to latch it too loudly. Rapid fire rang out again, and a cacophony of men shouting filled the afternoon air. It echoed in the world silenced by layers of snow. Sophie took Thea in her arms, burying her face in Sophie's neck and trying not to cry aloud for the lunatics to hear. I crouched down to Bo as he took Sophie's proffered hand and looked him in his gleaming blue eyes. We'll be right behind you, I promised. Make sure your sister is all right when you get inside, okay? You'll be fine, I promise. We're right behind you. I had no idea if I could or should promise such a thing because I had no idea what was going on. But getting out of the complex was clearly paramount, and I wasn't going to question Jackson. I nodded to Sophie. Go. Quickly and quietly, she made her way to the car, her feet crunching the snow as she took wide steps, Bo rushing to keep up. Once they were inside and all their heads were down, hidden from sight, I glanced behind me toward the kitchen. I didn't know if I should run for the car or wait for Jackson, but before I could decide, he hurried toward me. They're lighting the buildings on fire, he said, smoking people out. My eyes widened. Get in the car and go. I'll meet you at the park. I didn't want to leave him, but I saw the decidedness in his eyes. I saw the fear. Go, he mouthed, and darted up the stairs, taking them two at a time. I wasn't sure what he was doing, but I had four terrified kids waiting for me. Peering out into the cloudy afternoon, I could smell the smoke in the air. I knew in that moment we would never be completely safe, ever again. Twenty minutes later, we sat on the curb in the alleyway on the far side of the park, hidden by the ivy wall. Alex had navigated the snowy, desolate streets well enough, and now we waited in suspended silence, watching the sky turn gray with smoke as the complex went up in flames ten blocks down. The gunfire had ceased, but there was no sign of Jackson yet. Where is he? Sophie whispered from the back seat. Shouldn't he be here by now? Thea began to whimper. Is he dead? She squeaked. No, he's not dead. He could not be dead. But the tightness of my throat and the dread riddling my voice said otherwise. What the hell had he gone back for? What could possibly have been so important? He hadn't been the most stable person since we'd met him, but he wasn't crazy. He wouldn't go out there after them, would he? What was all that about anyway? Alex asked from beside me, his voice quiet as the horror settled in. I wasn't sure of the answer, other than more crazy assholes terrorizing innocent people. There he is, Bo shouted, and pointed over the console as Jackson's charcoal gray Tacoma came around the corner. There was a collective sigh, and tears filled my eyes as he got out of the truck, glancing furtively around as he lifted a rifle from the back and hurried over. I climbed out of the car. What were you doing? You scared the shit out of us. He lifted the rifle, grabbing this and the maps. Now what are we going to do? Sophie asked, opening the door. Jackson looked from her to me. We're going shopping and getting the hell out of this city. He met Alex's gaze and offered him the rifle. Do you know how to use one of these? Alex nodded. Not a rifle specifically, but I can figure it out. Why? I gulped. Are they coming this way? Jackson shook his head. We're going to the mall, he said, and looked at me, clearly apprehensive. He handed Alex the gun. Time for Gun Safety 101, the brief version. 21. Jackson, December 14th. I was only half surprised to see a vacant parking lot when we arrived at the mall. Though it didn't mean no one was inside, we parked the vehicles down the street so as not to bring too much attention to ourselves and made our way around the detached tire shop in the back. In and out, I told everyone as we made our way around the main building's boxy exterior. I glanced over my shoulder at Elle bringing up the rear, her pistol in hand. While she seemed hesitant using it at the bus depot, she knew how to handle one, which was comforting. 
and her hesitation was understandable. I might have been worried if killing people came easy to her. The mall was one story, the oldest one in the city, and definitely not the nicest or most popular, but we didn't want flashy. We wanted forgotten. At least, I hoped. The adrenaline still surged through me like an electrical spark in a combustion chamber, and my heart hadn't stopped pounding since the house. There were at least five shooters, and they'd been out for blood. I wasn't going to take on five of them, half with semi-auto tactical rifles and a penchant for fire. And a very small part of me hoped they would eradicate every last crazy fuck that still breathed though I knew there would be no hope in convincing them I wasn't one of them. The elderly woman I saw them shoot in the back of the head was proof of that. At least we were far enough away we couldn't smell smoke anymore, even if we could faintly see it billowing from the other side of the city. I stopped at the corner of the building and peered at a snow-covered front lot. There were two cars, one in the middle, the other at the furthest end and both were covered in several days' worth of snow. There were no new tire marks that I could see, which meant the place wouldn't be crawling with survivors or completely ransacked. Waving on the others behind me, I headed around to the front. In less than a week, the world had been ruined, and I'd seen enough blood and havoc to know whatever this world was coming to was only going to get worse as desperation spread. That's why we needed to stick together for the time being and we all needed our own supplies. We couldn't be caught unprepared again. I held my hand up outside the door of Pete's Pet Shop, a storefront just shy of the mall's main entrance. I peered through the window, cupping away the glare from what little sunlight peeked through the clouds. The outline of cages was all I could see, so I hurried past the window and continued toward the main entrance. We have to go in, Bo said, and as I spun around to tell them to keep moving, he jiggled the door handle. Bo, I bit out. L reached for him and he glared at us both. We have to go in. We have to let them out. He locked eyes with me, single-minded and resolved. Alex tried the door again first, trying to kick the lock open with his foot. I wasn't about to shoot it open and draw unwanted attention, so I shook my head. Let's keep going. There was a side door, Bo said, and he backtracked and disappeared around the building, out of sight. L looked at me, torn, and followed the others after him. Damn it, I muttered. Quickly scanning the road and sidewalks for onlookers, I jogged after the rest of them, my jaw clenched. Now was not the time to wander off. A side door hung open behind L as she stepped inside. Biting my tongue, I gripped my gun and scanned the room as I followed. I was about to remind them of my only rule, to do what I say when I say it, if they were going to stay with me. The last thing I needed was one of their deaths on my conscience. But my curses fell short when I saw Bo and Thea crouch down next to two rabbit cages. Both rabbits, one black and the other gray and white, were dead. The darkened store smelled of feces, and there was little noise given the twenty-by-twenty-foot space. Cages lined the walls, but given the cold temperature of the room, the power had been out in the shop, probably the entire building, for a while. They starved to death, Bo said, with tears in his eyes and anger pinching his features. He stood and began opening every cage on the wall, animals dead or alive. Thea stared at him from her crouched position by the bunny cage, the rest of us also watching him as he became frantic. We have to let them out, he cried. When one of the mouse cages wouldn't stay open for the live ones to climb out, he began to cry. Hey, 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 Elle said softly, grabbing a bungee cord off of one of the dead rabbit cages that held the water bottle in place. She tied the mouse door open for him. We'll make sure they get free, okay? She rested her gloved hand on his shoulder, and her green eyes were wide with promise. Even if Elle didn't think she knew what she was doing when it came to taking care of the kids, it came naturally to her. Bo sniffled and stuck his hand into the mouse cage, wiping the tears from his eyes with his other hand as a tan mouse ran up his arm. 
Its tail curved for balance, and it trotted up to his shoulder. With another sniffle, Bo cupped the mouse in his hand and set it on the floor to freedom, then did the same thing with the last mouse alive in another cage. It was more heartbreaking than I'd expected. The rabbits had no food or water in their cages, yet the aisle beside me was lined with it. The feeder crickets were dead, and so were the iguanas on the top shelf with no heat lamp. The similarities weren't lost upon me. The world was stocked with surplus goods and supplies now, but staying alive long enough to use them would be the hard part. At least we had a fighting chance. The animals locked in buildings and cages around the world did not. Though the store seemed empty, save for us, there were a half dozen aisles to be cleared, so I left the kids and Elle to mourn for the animals. I swept one aisle and then another finding nothing more than cat and dog toys, bags of pet food, empty aquariums, some fish that needed food, and a row of chemicals and shampoos. There was little left we could do, and the looming list of supplies and food we needed to find, including a place to stay tonight, settled back into place. I noticed movement against the far wall and a long-haired gray cat jumped down from the top loft of its cage behind the glass wall of the cat kennel. It meowed when it saw me and pawed at the glass. Bo, I called. The pitter-patter of feet approached me, and Thea grabbed my hands as she jumped cheerfully up and down. Kitty! I stared down at her, surprised by the strength in her little fingers wrapped around mine. Bo ran over, his eyes lit up. She's alive, he said, opening the door to the cat room. How do you know it's a she? I asked, but all the kids filed into the back room after him. Bo's smile widened as Sophie opened the cage, allowing the cat to jump out. The cat purred and rubbed its gray body against Bo's leg with another meow. He reached down, more than happy to pet her. Alex scooped a handful of kibble from a small bin and poured it on the floor at their feet. I watched the kids through the glass realizing it was the first time I'd seen any of them really smile. Strangely, it gave me a slight glimmer of hope. Elle walked up beside me, a stack of slow-release fish food capsules in her hands. She watched the kids with a softness that made her look younger, more innocent. Thank God for that cat, she whispered. It just made the day a bit more manageable, she sighed and I watched the way her mouth curved up in the corner. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, I said, but they can't keep her. Realistically speaking, anyway. We didn't even have a place for us to sleep tonight, or know where we would be tomorrow, let alone have the capacity to carry around a cat and its food. She'll be better off on her own. Elle watched as Thea giggled at the cat rubbing up against her, and she sighed again. Yeah. I know. The old mall was dark, and some of the stores looked looted, but not as much as I'd expected. It was either forgotten about like I'd hoped, too far out of the city proper, or there weren't enough people left to care what it had to offer. Unexpectedly, at ease, we headed straight for O'Reilly's rucksacks and sporting goods. The chances of it having been ransacked were nearly certain if the boutique wine store was anything to go by, but the chances of gathering what we needed looked better by the minute. Still, we kept to the shadows against the storefronts, checking the darkened windows as we went. Elle and the kids' footsteps followed quietly behind me. The air was stagnant and chilly, but other than the scent of stale grease that clung to the cool air from the food court across from us, there was no foul human smell which put me even more at ease. The music store was untouched. So was the sunglass hut. The cell phone and as-seen-on-TV kiosks in the center of the walkway were still covered, like everyone had closed up for the night. Assuming the next day would be like any other. The cigar shop looked looted. So did the hair salon. There were small shops and easier to break into. Or maybe someone had just left in a hurry. I knew we might potentially walk into the worst situation yet. But somehow, deep down, 
it felt like it was going to be okay, and I pushed on. My gut hadn't steered me wrong before, and it wasn't the booze talking this time. So when I saw the rolled-up gate to O'Reilly's, I held up my hand, hoping the five of them would listen this time and wait outside while I went in. It was a large store, manageable but dark, and I clicked my flashlight on as I examined the shadows. Boots and tennis shoes lined the furthest wall. A tent was displayed in the center of the room. Fishing and camping gear on racks and shelves lined up beside it. Guns and hunting gear were in a large display case to my left, and as I stepped closer, I noticed the case was open and the key in the door, though the cabinet wasn't empty. In fact, it looked like nothing had been touched. I scanned the coats and sweatshirts on racks scattered across the rest of the store. Camouflage, colorful sports jerseys, and North Face alike. Some of the clothing was discarded on the floor, but the place wasn't in shambles. I wasn't sure which terrified me more, that there weren't enough survivors to raid the surplus of supplies they would absolutely need to survive the winter and protect themselves, or that there weren't enough sane people left to think of survival in the first place. Moving closer to the gun counter, I nearly tripped on something sticking out from under a clothing rack. When the flashlight lit up a khaki-covered leg and a boot, I stepped around the carousel of down jackets, expecting to find a body and froze. My heart dropped into my stomach. My gun lowered instinctively. It was a family. A dead man lay on the floor, russet face grayed and mouth open with days old vomit on the ground around him. His dark hair was longer and matted in areas like he hadn't showered in a while but even through his dark scruff and gaunt cheeks, I recognized him. Calvin Ayala, Drago's human counterpart, was dead. And beside him, his wife was slumped against the wall, hugging an infant swaddled in pink and white striped fleece against her chest. Calvin's rucksack was open and only half full of supplies. They hadn't made it. I'd figured he and Drago had gotten separated amidst the confusion, but... I hadn't thought about Calvin after that. He'd been on paternity leave. The week of the virus was his first week back. The baby and the wife died first, I guessed. Otherwise, they wouldn't be entombed in this place for all time. Calvin would have stayed with them, knowing he was going to die anyway, and he likely welcomed it. I would have, anyway. Jackson. My name was a whisper in the still air. Calvin and his family. Hannah and Molly, my dad, Elle's sister, the kids' parents, and maybe even Ross, were all dead. Good people who'd met horrific ends, while so many wicked survived. It wasn't fair, and it didn't make any sense. I stared at the baby girl, grateful I couldn't see her. But my eyes burned and my chest ached all the same. I forced myself to swallow, to blink. I stared at the woman's solitaire wedding ring and thought of Hannah's, simple and classic. I didn't want to forget those things. I couldn't, and yet somehow it felt like I already was. Jackson. Elle's voice was both a beacon and a blaring horn. Being with her and the kids was a distraction I'd begun to welcome, and yet... It felt disloyal to begin letting go so quickly. Jackson, Elle said again, her voice soft and uncertain as she stopped beside me. I wasn't sure which had come first, the tears or Elle covering their bodies with the blanket. But even as their faces disappeared, I could see Molly in my arms and Hannah in the hospital bed. And I wasn't sure how I could have forgotten the chokingly bitter taste of misery. 22. L. December 14th. After distractedly sweeping the rest of the sporting goods store, Jackson had left me, Sophie, Alex, and the children to fend for ourselves. He hadn't said a single word, but I knew it was probably for the best. For his sake, at least. I worried about him, and wanted him to be okay, but the look on his face had been a desperate sorrow, 
and I knew there was nothing I could do or say that could mend that. I'd never seen a man look so stoically undone. Having warned all the kids to steer clear of the gun counter, without mentioning the bodies covered beside it, they perused the store in search of fur hats and beaver mittens, clothes that would keep them warm in the coldest situations. I, on the other hand, couldn't stop thinking about the family still hidden behind the coats and how gut-wrenching their final moments must have been. Had Jackson known them, or had the sight of them hit too close to home? I couldn't move them or lay them to rest, so I had to stay focused. I stared down at the six backpacks lined up on the ground in front of me, one for each of us, assuming Jackson wanted one. I wasn't sure he cared about anything at the moment, but it was the least I could do. Whatever our journey, and wherever we were going next, was going to be dangerous and cold. Windstorms, snow, and the unexpected were the only three things we could bank on moving forward, and we needed to be as prepared as we possibly could. Hangers scraped against the racks, zippers whizzed up and down, and Sophie and Thea muttered as they looked for boots that were small enough to fit Thea's feet. I leaned back on my heels, the thinly padded floor unyielding against my knees, and took a mental note of the kids' backpacks, safety whistles with built-in compasses, hydro packs, fleece blankets, granola bars and an MRE, utility knives, headlamps, chapstick, and travel toiletries. All the contents were evenly divided, and that was only half of what we still needed. I set the rope, mini stove, butane, batteries, first aid kit, four additional MREs, and the matches aside for Jackson and I to carry. We had maps and ammo we'd have to carry too. Running my fingers through my hair, I tugged slightly on the ends like it might jostle thoughts loose, and I let out a deep breath. I was forgetting a dozen things. I just needed to take a step back and think. This morning, we'd planned out the next three days. Now, we were scrambling and off kilter. I felt off kilter. Even if staying here the rest of the day was risky, it felt necessary. We had to land somewhere and had a trip to properly stock up for. Jackson's heavy footsteps preceded him as he returned to the store and stopped outside the entrance. Without ceremony, he plopped down. I could only see his shoulder and the bottle in his hand. He was in no shape to go anywhere either. Sophie and Thea came around a shoe aisle, a pair of small, fur-lined boots in Thea's hands. She sat them by her pack as Sophie handed me two canisters of 36-hour survival candles. Here you go. I smiled, stunned. I was thinking about grabbing these, I told her. Hopefully they'll help you sleep better. Her eyes were intent on mine, and she smiled sympathetically, almost knowingly, then tore open a pack of woman's wool socks to divide up among our bags. Soph, do you think these fit him? Alex asked as Bo shuffled toward us in his untied boots. She crouched down in front of Bo as my mind spun a little. Had I been talking in my sleep again? How did Sophie know I wanted the candles? No, that I needed them to sleep better. Even though Dr. John had been further from my mind than ever before, there were other monsters that still crept closer when the world was still and my mind was quiet. I thought too much of Thomas and his final breath. I thought about the men in the bus depot and how differently things could have ended. I peered over my shoulder at Jackson. He sat in the same position, his head back against the doorframe, only he'd begun to rotate a liquor bottle beside him. Once again, the bottle looked mostly untouched, like he was battling with himself over how much he should drink. Thea stopped beside me, looking at Jackson quizzically. He'll be okay, I told her, but I might have been lying. I didn't know Jackson much at all. He seemed strong, but it was what I couldn't see that worried me most. First impressions could be deceiving, if I was any example, something Jackson would eventually learn. He would know the truth about his father one day. It just couldn't be now, not when the kids and I needed him. I hated myself for thinking it, but I had no other choice. Maybe he needs a nap, Thea said through a yawn. 
Grabbing two thinly rolled blankets from beside the packs, she shuffled down the aisle toward him. I didn't have the heart to stop her as she waddled with a bundle under each arm. Her boots were a little too big, I noted, but they would have to do. Tentatively, Thea stopped beside Jackson, staring at him briefly before she set the blankets on the ground and precariously scooted his bottle out of the way. Jackson looked at her, his prominent features shadowed in the unlit hall. It's a little scary out here, I heard her say, peering around the empty building. Ignoring her fear, Thea unrolled one of the blankets and draped it over Jackson, and then she unrolled one for herself and sat on the floor, leaning her back against him. Using the crook of his shoulder as a pillow, she pulled the blanket up to her chin and shut her eyes. I wasn't sure how long Jackson stared down at the top of her head, a few breaths at least, before he finally wrapped his arm around her. Squeezing her closer, his shoulders began to heave. 23. Jackson. December 18th. The wind was blistering cold. It felt like negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit and seeped through each layer with a 40 mile per hour bite. It stung any sweat dampened skin, and each step was a struggle through the endless field of four foot snow as we made our way toward the shack. The storm howled and whistled as we stepped into the trees, their spindly tops complaining against it. All of us needed shelter, and I prayed the shack was still there. I peered behind me through frozen lashes, beyond the veil of snow toward the Tacoma and Explorer I could no longer see in the thickening storm. We'd gotten a bigger vehicle, but that was the first mistake in a slew of many. The Explorer would be no good to us if the engine continued to overheat, so we'd left it behind for now and continued our trek in the middle of a blizzard to the cabin we hoped was still standing on the fringe of the wilderness. Sophie followed my footsteps as best she could, making each of my imprints her own. L came behind her in our single file line, Thea wrapped in her arms. Alex brought up the rear, the snow meeting his knees with every step, and Bo clung to me, growing heavier by the second. The wind chill was numbing, and the packs on our backs might as well have been made of stone, weighing us down as we trudged through the tree line. I'd been too busy worrying about ghosts and crazy people to have considered the possibility of freezing to death. But I could imagine it now. Winter was relentless and didn't care that the week had been fraught with one hurdle after another. Food scavenging, finding safe shelter, snowdrift road closures, car issues, the list went on. For all we knew, the shack, our final saving grace, was buried in ten feet of snow untended and left to the elements since the squatter's removal two years ago. Or, maybe, someone else had the same idea I did, and they might not take kindly to visitors. Either way, there was no turning back now. The storm worsened and I closed my eyes, imagining the map tucked inside of my pack and Copper Creek that snaked beyond the patch of pine trees jutting from the surrounding snow. We just had to make it another quarter mile. A few more steps, a dozen more heartbeats. Bo gripped onto me tighter, and my arms strained. It had been nearly 48 hours since we'd set off for the Yukon, and we had only gotten as far as Copper River Valley, somewhere around Chistachina, an unincorporated village only halfway to the Canadian border. Despite what happened next, we couldn't continue like this. Modern man hiking in the savage north without the proper equipment or know-how was suicide. My muscles burned and ached with exhaustion as we stepped over a fallen trunk. I told myself everything would be okay. It was freezing, but we were insulated well enough, even if the situation wasn't ideal. No one would die, even if it felt like we already were. I told myself we were close, that we just needed to get over the crest of the hill and the cabin would be right there, abandoned and worse for wear, but it would be there and we would be fine. We would be fine. Glancing back, I took in three bobbing, hooded heads, slowly coming up the hill behind me. They would be fine.
The trees groaned from above, and snow clumps fell to the ground like falling bricks. Everything creaked. The scanned branch canopy above, my bones brittle with cold. When the frozen river came into view, my looping reassurances fell short. I scanned the bank, finding only pines, spruces, and an unending white. Was the cabin gone, or had my navigation been off? Was it still a quarter mile north? My heart, pounding from exertion, dropped into my stomach. Is that it? Sophie asked, her voice muffled by the wind. She pointed further downriver to a thicket of leafless trees surrounding a shack no bigger than an ensuite. I could barely see the rooftop, but it was all the fuel I needed. My feet moved with renewed purpose as I schlepped down the hill. The snow crumbled beneath each step, but I barely noticed it. The exhaustion in my bones was only a distant ache. The numbness of my face would soon wear off. We would be fine. The time it took to get to the cabin felt painstakingly slow, even if our pace quickened. As all the possible scenarios of what might be awaiting us played through my head, each felt possible. Not even the most dire possibilities frightened me. They were more bothersome than anything, taking up space in my mind when I needed to find solutions instead. If I had to dig, I would dig. If we had to pull whatever dangers were inside the shack out, I would. If we couldn't get in and I had to attempt a snow cave, I would do that too. As the cabin, a patch fork of wood and scraps of metal came back into view through the trees, I noticed a small steel pipe chimney and searched for a door. It was faintly outlined and half buried in snow, but it was there. I set Bo down, unzipped the folding shovel from my pack, and dropped to my knees in front of the door. L plopped down beside me, wisps of her dark hair whipping around her face as she used her gloved hands to rake the snow away. Sophie and Alex did the same, Alex using the boiling pot for a scoop. Bo and Thea also scooped and dug until we had finally moved enough snow for me to be able to pull the slatted wood door open. It nearly fell off its hinge in the wind, and L grabbed hold of it as I peeked my head in. I held up one hand to caution everyone, leaving the other on my gun as I stepped inside to be sure it was safe. The interior was dark, save for the fleeting dull light leaking in from the doorway and inconsistencies in the poorly constructed walls. It was a drafty, oversized shoebox, but it was empty and the wooden chair and broken table would suffice as firewood for now. I waved the others inside. Heaves and sighs followed a bustling of footsteps and nylon arms and legs rubbing against each other as everyone crammed inside. Come on, shut the door. Al said breathily. The air was so still and suddenly quiet, it echoed every breath. Sheet metal sliding blocked most of the wind, and I opened the rusted wood-burning stove to find it was full of ash. I need matches, I said, forcing my fingers and legs to work in tandem as I broke the wooden legs off of the rickety old chair. Thea, your coloring book. I nodded to her pack. Sophie helped her wiggle out of it, and within seconds, the pages were crumpled beneath the broken chair legs, and a burgeoning fire lit the room. Crouched in front of it, I blew more life to the flame, urging the fire to catch faster and the smoke to clear. I silently pleaded the rusted chimney pipe would hold out as long as the storm, and I took my gloves off and held my hands up to the flames. I allowed the heat to seep into my bones as the fire grew. It was warm against my wind-burned skin, and my nose and fingertips began to thaw. Sophie and Alex pulled their hoods back and took a deep breath for the first time, like they were coming up for air. Can everyone feel their fingers and toes? L asked, and when the four kids said no, I almost smiled. Let me rephrase that, she said, still catching her breath as she peeled off her coat. Does anyone have frostbite? The kids pulled off their gloves as they shivered in place. White puffs of air filled the room. No, Alex said, checking his hands and then the rest of them. Good. Now, put your gloves back on until this place warms up a little, she said. 
brushing the snow off Thea's hood and shoulders. Sophie did the same with Bo. I blew more life to the fire as Elle glanced around the shack. Thank God for this place, she muttered. You were right. Barely, I thought. When the fire was roaring, I stood aside, waving them over to gather around it. We'll stay here until the blizzard lets up, I told them. Stay close to each other, though, and keep warm. I nodded to their blankets rolled up beneath their packs. Soon, they'd be dripping with melting snow. The fire will take the chill out of the air, but... I stomped on the plywood floor. It's not going to be a sauna or anything. Dry your blankets first, then we'll dry any wet clothes. Shoulder to shoulder, the kids knelt around the stove with their hands so close to the cast iron, I worried they might burn. Thea removed her gloves first, a smile tugging at her lips as she basked in the warmth. It's going to be like this all winter, isn't it? Elle asked quietly as she stood beside me. She stared into the flame. It was as if she'd been telling herself once we got out of the city, we'd be okay, and finally realized it wasn't that easy. This really is our lives now. I looked at her, seeing that silent fear in her green eyes I'd come to recognize. Yes, I told her. For now. But soon you'll be in Hartley, and none of you will have to worry about this. It was a reminder to myself of the solitude that awaited me and the structure and community these kids would have if they were ever going to feel normal again. But you'll have to wait for spring. Elle blinked from her haze and looked at me, incredulous. Spring? Unless we want this to be our reality for the next month, we need to find somewhere to hunker down and wait out the winter. I crouched down and fumbled with puffy, gloved fingers before pulling the map from my back. This is where we are. I told her as I unfolded it, rising to my feet. Somewhere here, off Glen Highway, still nearly 500 miles from Whitehorse. I looked into her eyes, waiting as the implications of continuing our journey to the border sank in. Finally, Elle nodded. Stay where, though? I have an idea, I told her. It's not going to be easy, but it will be better than this. Without hesitation, Elle nodded again and pursed her lips. Whatever you think, she whispered. I just... She glanced at the sat phone sticking out of my open pack. I know you've been trying to meet up with your friend Ross and... That has to wait, I told her. It was a constant battle to remind myself that he and I made a backup plan so I couldn't completely lose hope until spring. He wouldn't travel in this, and I was stupid to try it. It's not like we could have stayed in the city, she said, tucking her hair behind her ears. It was wind ravaged and wild around her face. Even with chapped lips and rosy cheeks, Elle seemed to glow in the firelight. Maybe it was her forced optimism, or maybe it was the fact that she had four kids to worry about and didn't have the option of looking back, only to keep moving forward. But I admired her for that. For me, it felt impossible for me to move forward most of the time. Everywhere I looked, at Elle, at little Thea, at the Glock I always carried, and my hands that stacked every stone, I saw Hannah and Molly and memories that kept me tied to the past. We have a choice now, I told her. There's no one chasing us. We can find a temporary home, or we can do our best to chug forward. We stay she said easily. We plan and bide our time. I hadn't expected to feel relief in her words, but I did. As I rested against the wall, a haunting, lonely howl pierced through the wind. The wolves are out, Bo whispered, barely above the wind. Collectively, we held our breath to listen. So far from civilization, madmen were the least of our concerns. Nature was queen of the wildlands, and we were unwelcome. Ensuring my rifle was loaded, I rested it in the corner of the cabin, and with an exhausted sigh, I sat down beside it. Our problems would still be there after the fire went out and the snow let up, but with the wind buffered and the sting of the cold at bay, 
I allowed myself to revel in the comforting heat of the shack and the crackling fire. All of us hungered down to wait and listen as the wolves cried in the distance. 24. L. March 29th. Thomas came at me, eyes red-rimmed and face sweating, in the muted light of the room. The inexplicable hatred in his eyes twisted my insides, and he grabbed at my neck. His fingernails dug into my skin as I gasped and clawed at his hold. He was too strong. I could feel my windpipe crushing in his grasp and the blood draining from my face. This wasn't happening. I would not die. Not like this. Not at the hands of a stranger. After everything else. My fear turned to rage, which fueled the burn inside me just beneath my skin. A fiery tempest ignited and swirled through me as I willed my body to obey, my arms to lift and grab hold of Thomas's neck. Squeezing my eyes shut, I screamed. It was satisfying, and a power both fearsome and intoxicating surged through me. I clutched his neck harder, feeling his heart beating in the palms of my hands. I squeezed and squeezed to prove that I would survive, that I wasn't weak. As the struggle left his body, I opened my eyes, and I gasped. The heat drained away, a corroding terror flooding me in its wake. Jackson's hazel eyes stared lifelessly back at me, his face red and mouth agape. His body fell limply onto mine as I tried frantically to get free. His skin was blue, his neck was singed with impressions from my fingertips, and burnt veins spread through his jaw and up his face like a toxic leak. He was dead. Jackson was dead, and I had killed him. My eyelids flew open. Sweat dampened my temples despite the cool air that filled the room. Inhaling a steadying breath, I sat up in bed and peered around the room. It was just as foreign as it was comforting. The paisley wallpaper and cluttered dresser and desk. A box of someone else's things lay on the carpeted floor. It was my temporary home, and I was safe in a warm bed, but in a house that held a history I would never know. The fire burned low in the fireplace, and the candle on my bedside had long since burned out. I opened the side table drawer to grab another, but all I felt was the soft leather of my calfskin gloves and the cold handle of my gun. Flinging the comforter back, I shoved my sock-covered feet into my slippers and reached for the robe draped over my bed. It had been over four months since the outbreak. I no longer kept track of the actual days we'd been in Copper River Valley. More like how many nights the six of us had made it without freezing and how many days it had been since we'd seen other people. 98 and 84. Jackson had been right. Slana, our off-the-grid safe haven in a borough northeast of Anchorage, had been mostly untouched. During our semi-short stay, we learned just how scarce everything was and what it meant to travel the distance needed to retrieve it. Scavenging trips had to be strategically planned so that we could beat the weather and preserve fuel. Simple tasks, like brushing teeth, going to the bathroom, and bathing, weren't so simple without running water or electric heat. Everything was a process. Every outing or meal was preceded by a list of rules and processes never to be broken. Generators were an extravagance we only used when necessary or when the sound could be drowned out so not to attract attention. Sometimes candles and fires felt like the last two luxuries we would ever have, and even they were never guaranteed. Opening the bedroom door, I peeked down the upstairs hall. Shadows from the living room fireplace danced on the stairwell, and a rush of cold kissed my face. The floor creaked as I made my way down the hallway toward the stairs. I stopped at the kids' room and opened the door to peek inside. Sophie was asleep in one bed, Alex, Bo, and a sprawled-out Thea in the other beside it. Crammed together in one room, even if it was a four-bedroom house, was better than being apart. Safety in numbers had become our second nature, to always walk in pairs 
and never go outside alone or without a weapon, especially after dark. Never after dark. The wolves like to linger in the woods, especially at night. Shutting the door, I continued to make my way down the staircase as quietly as possible. I wasn't sure why Jackson slept in the living room instead of the comfort of one of the beds, but he never did. Even after Anchorage and the mall, after the shack and the journey to Slana, Jackson still felt separate from us. Maybe he didn't want to get too attached because we'd be parting ways in Whitehorse after the snow melted. Or it could have been that deep down, a part of him didn't trust me. And maybe he was right not to, even if the idea of him hating me plagued my thoughts each and every day. I stopped at the final step and eyed Jackson. He stood in front of the fire, pulling a thermal shirt over his bare chest and painted arms. He was a curiosity to me, a mystery despite the months I'd known him. What do they mean? I asked. Jackson spun around, oblivious to my standing there, and his eyes met mine. The tattoos. They were Hada-looking creatures with curved edges and wide eyes, puzzled together in ancient black and red symbols of a heritage I knew little about. I knew an old fisherman in Seward who had them on his hands and up his neck. I'd never learned his name. He would sit on the pier every morning, drinking his tea from his canteen. He was almost always the first face I saw when I arrived back at port. I smiled, remembering his wide, toothless smile and sparkling jade eyes. He told me their sacred markings, and each image means something special to the person wearing them. Ah. Jackson peered down at his arm, like he could see the images through his long sleeves. Moon is the protector and guardian of people on Earth. It seemed fitting when I became a trooper. He tucked his dark, longish hair behind his ears and picked his dirty clothes off of the ground. I gripped the railing. And the others? Wolf is strength and sun is peace, he said briskly over his shoulder. They were my wife's idea. You never talk about her. I'd wanted to ask him about his life so many times I'd lost count, but it never seemed like the right time. I know. He draped his jeans and flannel over the back of the couch. Did I wake you coming in? I tried to be quiet. No, I said. You didn't wake me. His wife was still off limits, which I understood. I didn't want to talk about my life before, especially with him but a part of me desperately wanted to know something that would show me who he might have been before he became the person he was now, other than a quiet, brooding protector that lost himself in a bottle of bourbon on bad days and preferred seclusion the rest. Jackson did chores and tasks around the property, mostly planning and prepping for our approaching departure, but his mind was always somewhere else. And where did he go off to when he was on his own? I'd never followed his trail toward the mountains. Who was I to question him when there was plenty I didn't say myself? On my worst days, I worried he might wander off and never come back, making me uncomfortably grateful when he returned. Is everything okay? He asked, staring at me. I stood dumbly on the staircase. Yeah, I was just getting more candles. I continued toward the hutch on the other side of the room. Sophie and Thea had been gathering them up for me, a kindness I appreciated more than they'd probably ever know. I slid a few candlesticks into each of my robe pockets, enough to get me through a few more nights. Is it the dreams? Jackson's voice was tentative. Is what the dreams? When I looked at him, he nodded to the tapers sticking out of my pockets. Among other things. I admitted. It's pretty silly, huh? A grown woman needing a nightlight. No, not silly. He leaned forward, his elbows resting on his knees as he sat at the end of the sofa. It was a moderately sized living room that fit the six of us well enough. A couch, recliners, side and coffee tables. But it always felt smaller when it was just the two of us alone. We all have our own ways of coping after everything that's happened. It used to just be things from my past, I told him, 
and shook my head, baffled by how different things had become. If Dr. Rothman could see me now, I muttered. Dr. Rothman? My therapist. She used to tell me I let the past have too much control over me. It's like I barely remember the faces that haunted me before. It's more like the faces of... I stopped myself from admitting the full truth. I was so close, and he was right there. I could have uttered a few more simple words, liberating me forever. But I didn't. I just... don't like the darkness, I guess. Jackson's eyes lingered on me, like they sometimes did, but he didn't press me for an explanation. I could always see the questions, though, playing in his hazel eyes, the uncertainties behind his permanently furrowed brow, riddled with apprehension. It was one of his few expressions I could read. Jackson wanted to ask me more, and sometimes I wished he would, because he deserved the truth. But it was a well-rehearsed dance between us, the closest thing to intimacy we shared. He would nudge me with a question that I would only half answer, and I would nudge him back with another. Neither of us dared probe deeper, terrified of the outcome. It was an unspoken understanding, one of many. I closed the drawer of the hutch and turned for the staircase. Jackson sat quietly as he stared down at the sat phone on the floor at his feet. Will you still stay in Whitehorse if you don't hear from him? He peered into the fire. Yes. Though I assumed as much, I hated to think about us parting ways in a few weeks. No matter how much I tried to prepare myself for it, I would miss him. This place in Whitehorse, I started. What makes you think it's even still there? You said it's been years since you went, and with all that's happened... It has to be, he said stubbornly and scratched the side of his face. His beard was a few weeks unshaven. Can I ask why it's so important to you? I couldn't help nudging the line of things we didn't discuss on nights that my mind was restless. Reluctance was Jackson's other expression I knew all too well. The way his jaw clinched and he took a deep breath before offering a vague answer. It's where my wife and I went on our honeymoon. It's really the only thing I have left of her at this point. A memory. And there it was. The truth. Awkward, only because we usually went out of our way to avoid speaking about her. I understand. I'd assumed it was sentimental to him. Otherwise, why be so dead set on going there instead of a safe zone that boasted community and protection? A place with other children, doctors, and people of skill and consequence. I'm glad you'll be able to have a small piece of her back then. Maybe it would give him the peace he'd been unable to find. I continued to the stairs. Night, Jackson. Night, he said, barely audible, followed by the sound of a screw top. I told myself his drinking would only worsen if he knew the truth. And then I hated myself even more. 25. L. March 30th. My back and arms strained as I split the wood that had been drying under the tarp beside the house. It felt good to be active and always moving. It kept my mind busy and my energy spent to something I could control. Swing. Thunk. Swing. Thunk. My goal was a half heap before lunch. With longer days and increasingly better weather, we were able to get more done. Swing. Thunk. Swing, thunk. Day 99 was like all the rest. Sophie woke up before all of us, her nightmares preventing her from getting much sleep, even though she never wanted to talk about what they were. I'd snuck outside to watch the sunrise, before my run, wishing I still had my Nikon and equipment to snap a few shots. Then I ran to take the edge off, grateful to have found a way to keep the heat coursing through my veins at bay. I'd made a few failed attempts to discern whether anyone else felt the fire in their blood the way I did, but was met with inquisitive looks and the sickening feeling to leave it alone before someone started getting too curious about my ramblings. 
Sophie remarked that she wished she were always warm, because she was sick of being freezing cold all the time. Alex joked that he often got shocked when he touched me, and that it must have been my electric personality. And if he could laugh it off, that meant he was oblivious to what I could do, and I gave up prodding for inexplicable, fire-related abilities altogether after that. No one ever questioned my gloves, adopting the false reality I was just a quirky germaphobe, one of my many lingering issues from before the outbreak, and I didn't correct them. And while I wasn't necessarily at ease with what I could do, I was more comfortable controlling it. Plus, I had little choice. There was so much we still didn't know about the virus, including the physical changes and levels of insanity left behind in the aftermath. For all I knew, I was just a little crazy, like the other less sane survivors. After my morning run, the kids and I ate oatmeal and thawed frozen fruit, which Alex typically threw together. Alex was used to simplistic, creative meals after a childhood of relying on his street smarts to get by. For Sophie, whose father was a chef, cooking was too closely tethered to her past, which is why I think she spent more time with Jackson working on cars and at target practice than she spent with Alex in the kitchen. I was a useless klutz when it came to the kitchen, so I stuck to busy work around the property. I did the chores I didn't want the kids to do, and Jackson remained our handyman, resident prepper, and, for all intents and purposes, our teacher. I straightened from the woodpile and wiped the back of my arm across my forehead, debating whether or not to remove my windbreaker in the 32-degree weather. I already looked strange enough, maniacally finding back-breaking work to do, so I decided running around in a t-shirt might reach too far out of everyone's comfort zone. Blowing a loose strand of hair from my face, I peered around the snow-covered road that stretched through Slana, barren on both sides, save for a sprinkling of trees and a few commercial buildings. The town was barely a blip on a map, but Jackson had known about the ranger station a mile down the road, and that it wasn't a big enough community to garner any attention. I hadn't seen anyone else since we'd arrived, though Jackson had been less lucky during his multi-day excursions on the snowmobile into the nearest towns and cities. Despite the occasional excursion, we had a lot of what we needed within a two-mile radius. A general store we pilfered as needed, a mechanic shop Jackson used as a daily workshop, a clinic we'd raided during our first week here, and the solar company Jackson planned to pillage before we left. And aside from our residence, there was only a handful of other houses scattered along the road. We'd chosen one a ways down, hoping anyone who happened to stop in would scour the most convenient places first. We got dinner! I whirled around with an armful of firewood as Alex lifted his backpack from a dozen yards away. White puffs of air surrounded him and Sophie as they trekked through the snow in their puffy coats and neck gaiters. Alex had one of Jackson's rifles slung over his shoulder, which was another one of the rules when they were around town. Dinner and lunch. Sophie added as they crunched closer through the snow. She pulled her gator down and under her chin, despite having eaten two hours ago. Alex grinned, the evergreen flecks in his eyes bright in the sunlight. What can I say? I'm hungry again. Me too, I added. Starving, actually. Although they walked side by side, both of them smiling, Sophie's grin never reached her eyes like Alex's did. At first, I thought it was grief that kept her a little distant, just like Jackson, but sometimes I wondered if her withdrawal was getting worse, along with the dreams. So, I said, brushing the wood chips off of my hands onto my pants. How was the market? Crowded? Alex shrugged. Not too bad. I had to fight a lady for the last bag of tater tots, though. Alex's smirk grew big and white, and even Sophie allowed herself a genuine smile. Is that what's on the menu? My stomach rumbled imagining it. Tater tots, with perhaps a sprinkle of salt? That does sound delicious, but not tonight. Alex nudged Sophie. She convinced me to make everyone's favorite. My stomach rumbled, even more excited. Yum, spaghetti. He nodded with garlic bread and veggies, 
She's going to make her dad's special sauce. I stacked an armful of wood. Can we just skip lunch and have dinner? I teased. Everything was frozen, boxed, jarred, or bagged. So I got excited when they decided to go all out and make a meal as home-cooked as we could get. No, Alex said. I need to thaw the elk meat. He lifted the bag again. I better get to it. Let me know if you need any help, I said. Alex chuckled as his footsteps crunched toward the house. I think we're good. I'd like there to still be food enough for everyone by the time I'm finished. I stick my finger in the sauce one time and you'll never let me live it down, I grumbled and walked toward the firewood stack I'd started on the porch. Oh, wait, I straightened. I thought the kids were with you. I looked at Sophie, her long blonde hair hanging around her shoulders. Where are they? She shrugged. With Jackson at the shop, I assume. We were putting fuel stabilizer in the carriers when Alex said he was going to the store. I needed to pick up a couple things, so they stayed with him. You make more trips to the store than any of us, Alex said. What could you possibly need so much of? He nodded to her backpack. Tampons she bit out, the way awkward teenagers do. Would you like to see? She lifted her pack. His eyes widened, and he hurried into the house. Rolling her eyes, Sophie followed after him. I'll tell Jackson to wrap things up in time for lunch. Okay, Alex called, and Sophie closed the door to keep what little heat was in the house inside. I circled back for another armful of wood. If Bo and Thea were with Jackson, it meant they would be covered in grease by the time they got back to the house. After stacking one more armful on the porch, confident I'd gotten a decent amount of energy out for the day, I trotted down the front steps and headed down the road to the mechanic shop. I followed little footprints trailing behind bigger ones and smiled to myself. Even if Jackson wasn't very paternal, the kids liked him. Thea, especially, who liked to ask him weakly if he was going with us to Hartley Bay, as if she thought he was going to change his mind. Mixed among their trail, I noticed another set of prints in the snow, and I paused mid-step. Animal prints. Wolf prints, specifically. Jackson had pointed some out to me twice before. At first, I thought they were old, but that the prints were in the neighborhood at all was unnerving. Feeling a niggling unease, I jogged toward the shop. Jackson would calm me down by reassuring me they were old, then he'd chide me for not listening when he was teaching the kids about game tracking. He'd say I was completely overreacting, and I'd feel foolish and all would be well with the world. I hoped. A couple minutes later, I skip-walked through the abandoned junkyard of cars next to the shop and walked in through the roll-up doors, stopping to catch my breath. Hey, I said, my footsteps echoing in the warehouse. Jackson straightened from bending a piece of metal in a clamp, his nose red and icicles on his mustache. I tried not to smile as I glanced around for Bo and Thea. Where are the kids? Jackson only stared back at me, and if I wasn't mistaken, his eyes were too glassy for this time of day. He peered around. They went to play. They're probably building a snowman or something. Or something? I turned on my heels scanning the snow-covered parking lot. Jackson, I saw wolf prints out there. I peered around at the empty streets beyond the shop. Slana was a sprawling, wannabe town before, but it had become a vast desert of white, with hiding places and dark corners everywhere. There were no fences to keep things in or out, and no noise to scare predators away if they got curious or hungry enough. Thea? I called heart pounding in the onslaught of dread. They didn't just wander off, Jackson uttered behind me, but I called for the kids again, and when they didn't answer, I flung open the side door to the other side of the building. Bo? I stopped in the doorway. Bo and Thea were sitting on a felled tree trunk, staring into the distance. Ah, oh, good. I was about to sigh with relief, when I saw two wolves standing in the woods a couple yards from them. Wolves! Jackson! I ran toward the wolves on instinct, my arms flailing, 
hands clapping as I shouted as loudly as I could to scare them away. Despite the potential for my plan to go terribly wrong, the wolves retreated deeper into the trees. Thea, Bo, come here, I ordered, my eyes never leaving the tree line. Bo, I said, reaching for his hand as I pulled Thea against me and hurried back to the shop, their little legs struggling to keep up. Jackson stood tall and formidable with his rifle, but it was too late. The wolves were already gone, no thanks to him. When we were safely inside, I crouched down to look them in the eyes. Never wander off on your own again, I told them. Do you understand? You know how dangerous it is out here, how many bad people there are, and those wolves are hungry. Do you hear me? I could finally see the fear registering in their wide eyes. Do you hear me? I said more calmly. Thea's lip trembled and she nodded. Then Bo dipped his chin, if a bit reluctantly. I pulled them both against me and squeezed them close. I don't think those wolves would have hurt them, Jackson said. I jolted up and whipped around to face him. Oh, really? And that was a risk you were willing to take? Wild animals, pack animals that hunt, hanging around the kids. You don't think that's something we should be a little worried about? His lack of concern made my blood boil. What the hell were you thinking, Jackson? Letting them go off on their own like that. We've survived flesh-hungry lunatics, a fucking virus that killed just about everyone else, so wolves are no big deal? When he said nothing, I took a step closer. You're drunk, aren't you? Shaking my head, I took Thea and Bo's hands in mine. I already knew the answer. I could smell it on him and see the blur in his eyes, even if he thought he was an expert at hiding it. I'm not one of the kids, though. You don't get to scold me. I didn't care if his voice was loud and angry. I glared back at him. Then stop acting like a mopey teenager all the time. Hey, he shouted. I didn't ask for this. He pointed to the kids and then to me. I didn't ask for any of it. I said we could travel together. I didn't say I would play house with you. Play house? Unsolicited tears burned the back of my eyes. You're such an asshole. That's right, I am. I told you from the beginning I was no role model, and you still came, so screw your self-righteous bullshit. I nodded, too livid to say anything else, and too wounded by how easily he could disregard us. Come on, you guys, I whispered to the kids. It was all I could manage. Thea and Bo looked up at me, then back at Jackson, but they didn't protest as we marched back to the house. Before Anchorage, I'd never hoped for anything. I lived in an existence where life sucked, and you did what you could to get through it with a scrap of sanity. Now, hope was like a drug I couldn't shake, and I needed to come to terms with reality, not what I hoped would happen. I couldn't worry about the kids, myself, and Jackson on top of everything else. Once we got to the Yukon, we would go our own way without looking back. It would be for the best. I repeated it over and over until I believed it was true. 26. Jackson. March 30th. Months ago, I felt like a shit stain on God's boot heel, and I'd wanted to die. Hell, I thought I was dying. But here I am. The edge was a precarious place. If you paid too much attention to everything in front of you, you risked the view. But ignore the dangers and you could fall. If your intention was to fall, like me, the catch was whether or not you could. I had my days, days where I couldn't imagine going further. But there were better days when the void without Hannah and Ross, the memory of Molly, and even the knowledge that my dad was no longer breathing could be tempered with a little help to dull the pain. With Ross alive, it had felt like I had a purpose, someone to wade through the fallout with, someone to commiserate and figure shit out with after it all fell apart. Without him, I was alone, 
or at least I would be eventually, and it was a daily struggle to remember why being alive was considered lucky. Especially when Thea looked at me, her big brown eyes held a thousand questions and possibilities, and it was impossible not to wonder and imagine what could have been. Even if I knew being stuck in the past was making everything worse, I didn't want to forget, though. Why would I? The longer it took for Ross to call me, the easier it was to assume the worst, even if a voice in the back of my mind kept telling me he was still alive. Ross had always had my back, and I always had his. He didn't know how to fail at anything, which helped prevent me from a complete tailspin. But time was corrosive, and it was hard to find the smallest remnant of possibility amongst a minefield of shrapnel. It grew harder to breathe, especially the longer I was with Elle and the kids, and all that I tried to keep close drifted further away. Slogging down the abandoned road toward the house, with toes numb in my boots, I inhaled the harsh, cold air and peered into the utter darkness. There were no stars in the sky, and gratefully there was no wind either. All I had were my thoughts and the sound of my shoes crunching in the snow. Arctic nights had a scent, the sharpness of evergreen and a freshness so pure and indescribable it numbed the inside of your nose and lungs with each inhale. I'd come to appreciate it while the others slept, a routine I'd fallen into each night, a walk or trudge in some cases, and occasionally a half bottle of whiskey. There was a reason I hadn't taken a drink in eight years, until the night I did, but I never wanted to think about that night again. And yet, that's the thing about haunting memories. They were like shadows. They moved around, impeding your view, other times, light warmed the dark places, and basking in it felt like a betrayal. El, Alex, Sophie, Bo, and Thea were not part of my life before, and the memories I cherished, they were part of the reality, and it felt wrong. Tonight, my bottle remained heavy and untouched. I resented El for making me feel guilty when I'd promised her nothing. I stopped in the driveway and peered up at the house. I sometimes wondered about the family who'd lived in it. They weren't here when we'd arrived, but all of their things were. Two kids and a father, from what I could gather. Had they built their home in a conventional neighborhood, it would look like any other house with windows and doors weathered by time. But in Slana, with only a handful of houses scattered across acres of woods, it stood out from all the rest. Five hearts beat inside people I'd known for only a fraction of time compared to those who were gone forever, strangers in the grand scheme of things. And yet, I was with them. Shaking my head, I walked to the back porch. When my mind was clear, it wandered, asking questions I couldn't answer. Were we alive because of our genetic makeup? Was it pure luck? Or was it some form of twisted fate that two siblings survived when none of the rest of us had family left? Were those who died the lucky ones or were we? If Hannah had survived, would she be like me? Or like the woman at the outpost who'd lost her mind and lived off human flesh? Nothing was certain. Everything felt wrong and I was tired of feeling lost. One of the wolves howled off in the distance and as I opened the back door, another howled back in answer. I peered behind me, out at the mountains surrounding us. Packs hunted together. They protected one another. I couldn't protect my wife and child, so how would Elle and the kids be any different? I didn't want the responsibility, and as hell-bent as I was to drink the bottle in my hand to prove it, I hadn't taken a single sip. The floor creaked as I made my way through the house through the kitchen that rumbled with voices when everyone was in there together, into the living room where everyone nestled in and kept busy in the evenings until bedtime. Everyone but me. We'd been prepared to leave since we arrived, knowing the day would come when the snow would stop falling and the ice would melt. I could leave tomorrow and Elle and the kids would have what they needed to stay here a while longer and what they'd need for their journey to British Columbia. 
the Explorer was running again, and they would be okay without me. I lifted my rifle strap over my head and leaned my gun against the mantel. I didn't bother lighting a fire or taking off my boots and jacket as I sat down on the sofa in the darkness. If I was lucky, I might get a couple hours of sleep, but I doubted it. Sometimes Hannah was in my dreams. Sometimes I saw Molly and got to hold her in my arms again. Chubby cheeks, rosy with life. Other times, I was burying them in the cold, hard ground. Every dream ended with an aching loss, but I would awaken to a house teeming with life. Like grief, sometimes it overwhelmed the senses. I closed my eyes, imagining a life where I slept in silence and woke up to it, too. If I left, Bo would wonder where I was when he came downstairs to help me with my morning call to Ross, which would inevitably go unanswered. Sophie might make an entire pot of coffee, not realizing I wasn't here to drink most of it. What had I been thinking? Letting the kids play with wolves. I had been so certain they were fine, and it was beyond careless. Elle wasn't just furious with me, she was disappointed. But along with fury and disappointment, her green eyes had glistened with fear, and I hated that it was because of me. I scrubbed my hands over my face, wanting to laugh at the irony. Every reason I needed to go my own way was exactly why I wanted to stay. And I had hours yet to think about it. 27. L. March 31st. I relied on the sharp sting of morning air in my lungs and the chill it left in its wake to keep me going. It wasn't just a salve that soothed the fire, but a welcome burn in my muscles that made them ache with exhaustion. I felt like at least one thing might still be in my control. Life's harsh, Eleanor, Jenny used to tell me. Hoping and wishing are pointless. Suck it up and do something instead. That was the last thing she said to me before she ran away ten years ago. In my youth, I thought her advice was simple cruelty. And yet those same heartless words continued to pop into my head, and I wished she was here to say them again, to help me feel stronger in each moment of weakness. I pushed harder through the snow, running until my thighs and chest screamed for me to stop, and I felt the fire subside. But I wasn't running only for temporary relief. I ran for clarity. I ran to expel the gnawing uncertainty of what the next 24 hours would bring. I hadn't seen Jackson when I woke, but that wasn't entirely unusual. I wouldn't be surprised if he left in the middle of the night, though, either. He wasn't a man of many words, and it would have been easier for him to leave that way. My eyes watered from the cold, and the house came blurrily into view. Out here in the remote villages, there was nothing. There was no help if we needed it, but no lunatics either. At least, none that had found us yet. Slana's seclusion and proximity to our final destination was why Jackson chose to make it a temporary home. House, I corrected. It wasn't a home, and we weren't a family, at least not one that included Jackson. Imagining my life without the kids seemed impossible after only four months. For Jackson, I knew it was different. As much as I wished things were the way I wanted them to be, neatly wrapped and packaged with a post-apocalyptic bow, they weren't, and Jackson didn't owe us anything. He'd promised us nothing, and yet he'd done so much. It wasn't Jackson I was disappointed in, despite what I told myself. I just wanted a partner in all of this. An equal and friend to help me manage this new life with four kids so I wasn't in it alone. Suck it up. Jenny's voice was still clear as day. I slowed as I made it to the front porch, stopping just shy of it. My chest was so tight from exertion and cold, I had to drag in every breath just to fill my lungs. Hands on my hips, I paced the driveway and took stock of what felt like a single spark inside me. It was nice to feel more in control. 
I considered experimenting with it. But what if I couldn't stop? What if exploring it unraveled what little control I had over it? The control I worked so hard to manage. I imagined the floodgates opening. The potential of what would follow scared me most of all. I turned on my heel and nearly walked into Jackson. Jeez! Sorry, he grumbled and fiddled with a case of batteries in his hand. I hadn't heard the crunch of his footsteps in the snow with my heartbeat racing in my ears. I wanted to catch you before you went inside. I wiped my brow with the back of my hand. About yesterday, he said, looking up at me. His eyes were warm pools of uncertainty and sincerity. No, Jackson, you were right. You didn't ask for any of this. Neither did you. His words surprised me. You're right, I said quietly. But it's different for me. I want to help them, and I... I know it's not your problem. Oh, will you stop pretending you don't think I'm an asshole for a minute so I can say something? I don't think you're an asshole, I said, pulling in another breath. I brushed the loose tendrils of hair from my face. You've already done so much. I shook my head, glancing everywhere but at him. Oh. His voice was more commanding than I expected and forced me to look at him. I didn't mean what I said yesterday. Whatever shit I'm dealing with doesn't give me a free pass to be a dickhead. I don't mind watching the kids. I nodded, uncertain if this was an apology or something more. He dropped his hands at his sides. I was going to leave last night, he admitted. Oh? Blinking, I stared at him. That he'd actually considered leaving didn't surprise me, but it did make me sad. Why didn't you? He shrugged. Because I'll have the rest of my life to be miserable and alone. I can hold out a couple more weeks until you guys head for Hartley. The chestnut and green flecks in his eyes were so crisp in the sunlight, they reminded me of the rich hues of the forest reflected on a still lake in summertime. I wanted you to know I'm sorry, and I won't be drunk like that again. His brow crinkled like usual, and he looked down at his hands. They were rough and battered and stained. No one could ever fault him for not pulling his weight or giving it his all, even if emotionally he was a mess. Believe it or not, I wasn't always like this. I believe it, I said easily. There are a lot of things I didn't used to be either. A liar was one. His eyes met mine, and a silent understanding passed between us. I was grateful he'd stay, and relieved to know he wasn't so different from the guy I thought I saw in him, even if that would only make things harder in the end. I had a partner again, for now. I left you coffee, he said, and the tension between us dissipated in the brisk morning air. It's getting cold. Buttering me up, huh? I smirked. Jackson's mouth quirked in an almost smile, which I didn't get to see often enough. He nodded to the mechanic shop. I'll be loading things on the trailer if you need anything. I nodded and shoved my hands in my back pockets as I watched him walk down the road. He was wearing clean pants and a jacket I hadn't seen before, one that wasn't covered in grease. Before hope could weasel its way into my thoughts, I headed into the house. I just needed to let things be as they were without overthinking it, and I was resolved to do so. Walking through the door, I stopped in the entry and smiled again. The whiskey bottle beside the couch was full, and my heart swelled more than it should have. Maybe things would be different, and just maybe, he would decide to stay. April 28, L, April 8. Our routines had become less rigorous as spring set in. We no longer raced against days with limited sun, and there was an unexpected excitement in the air. In a matter of days, we'd head to Hartley, where there were other survivors like us. 
Unlike myself, who always hated birthdays, Alex was a different story. He'd been keeping track of every day in the beginning, waiting for his 18th birthday so he could be his own man, exiting a system he never asked to be in to begin with. But the longer the power remained off and law and order went ungoverned, his excitement to turn 18 waned, openly at least. Alex no longer had to worry about the foster care system or what freedom would look like. He already had it, in a manner of speaking, anyway. I'd been tracking his birthday ever since. Just because I wasn't a fan of mine didn't mean we couldn't celebrate his. What are yammies? Thea stared at a can further down the aisle. I dropped the last three cans of pink salmon into my bag to add to our trip inventory. I wanted to make sure we had enough food to last us a few months if possible, since life in Hartley was a giant question mark. It's yams, stupid, Bo corrected. Hey, I nudged him. Give the girl a break, would you? She's learning how to read. From time to time, Bo forgot he was three years older than her. Yams are like potatoes. I explained, but they're sweet. Like candy? Thea chirped. Bo rolled his eyes, but I didn't take it personally. I'll get the crackers, he grumbled, and went down another aisle to mope. Nine was an age of impatience and confusion, I realized. Or maybe it was just Bo adjusting to all he'd been through. Yummy, Thea eyed the purple label. Can we have these for dinner? They would be good with our casserole, she explained. Would they now? I chuckled. Okay, put two cans in your bag. She dropped the cans in with an oomph, weighing her bag down quickly so that it just brushed the floor. Bo, I called, peering over the shelf to the other aisle. His blonde head hovered by the cookies. Grab Oreos for Alex, would you? The double stuffed kind. We'll give them to him as his present. I couldn't let Alex's 18th birthday come and go without celebrating it. We still had a couple days, but I'd been prepping for it for nearly a month. It was the perfect excuse for everyone to focus on something other than packing and what was to come. Plus, it was time to have a little fun. Okay, he grumbled. Bo didn't do well when he wasn't busy with purpose, like the rest of us. And with Alex, Sophie, and Jackson working on the snowmobiles to take to Whitehorse, he was stuck with me and Thea. The three of us continued our perusal of the market, each with a list of items to fill our bags with. It was a mundane task, but a necessary one, and it passed quickly. The market was neither large nor fully stocked, not like a grocery store would be, but it had fed us well over the past few months, and I'd stocked up plenty of the necessities, should something unexpected happen. Do you think he'll like his beanie? Thea asked, dropping a package of gum into her bag. She looked up, found me watching her, and grinned. You can have gum, I told her. Just don't get it in your hair or we'll have to cut it off. Her eyes widened, big, round, and brown like saucers. Would you like it if Alex made you a gift? I tugged gently on one of her braids. She nodded then I think he'll love the gift you made him, too. We tried our hand at crocheting, and while it was a work in progress, it would serve its purpose and keep Alex's head warm. Go grab a package of toilet paper to take back with us, okay? Then we're heading out. Thea skipped down the aisle happily and disappeared around the corner. One saving grace in so much change was the cost of living. It was low, and there were never any checkout lines. I would have needed a second job just to buy enough teepee and paper towels for a family of six before the outbreak, and more time in the day to shop for it. I made my way down the shampoo aisle and plopped a few bottles into my bag. Plumbing, on the other hand, had proven less convenient. The lack of electricity and frozen water pipes had become a major issue, making hot showers a thing of the past. No one wanted to bathe in cold water when it was already freezing outside, except maybe me sometimes. A lukewarm bird bath was all we could manage on most days. Come on, you two. Let's head back before the sun sets. It grew exponentially colder as the sun dropped behind the horizon, 
and the wolves had been coming out earlier, howling throughout the night. Whether it was because of spring or the scent of children, their nightly howling contest became more incessant, making me uneasy. Bo made his way past me and out the door, his canvas bag full and heavy over his shoulder. Set your bags on the sled. We'll pull them back to the house. While the Explorer would have come in handy for our two-mile trip, I took every opportunity I could to keep moving and save fuel. The kids seemed to have an endless well of energy like I did, so I used them as an excuse to go for as many walks as possible. I dropped chocolates and marshmallows into my bag at the last minute, assuming s'mores would do in place of a birthday cake since we didn't use the oven, then I shut the door to keep the weather and animals out in our absence. The distant sound of snowmobiles caught my ear, and, shielding my eyes with the cup of my hand, I peered down the highway. Had both snowmobiles not been completely white, I would have been apprehensive, but I recognized Jackson's height and Alex's mohawk helmet immediately. Looks like they're working! Bo practically jumped with excitement as they drove closer. Snowmobiles were somewhat of a surplus supply in these parts, a necessity for winter travel, yet finding ones that actually worked proved more difficult. Maybe they'll take you for a ride now that they're working again. That's okay. I need to pull this for you girls. Oh, really? I asked, more than happy to have him do all the work if that's what he wanted. You don't think Thea and I can handle it? Bo shrugged. Jackson wanted me to be helpful, he drawled. Alex and Jackson slowed the snowmobiles as they pulled into the parking lot, winding them down a few yards in front of us. We got you something, Thea sang, looking at Alex conspiratorially. Alex removed his helmet. You did? What for? Your birthday, silly, she giggled. Will I like it? Yes, she chirped with an enthusiastic nod. Alex winked at her, then looked at me. We're going to take the machines for a spin and get some target practice in before the sun sets. Really? Bo yipped. Ah, uh, can I come, please? Bo looked at me, but I deferred to Jackson. He was the one who'd issued the help the girls order. Thea skipped up to Jackson and opened her bag to show him Alex's surprise Oreos. Yum, that's the good stuff, he said. She put her fingers to her lips. If Jackson says it's okay to go, Bo, then it's fine with me. He ran over to Jackson, who was hulking compared to Alex's thin frame on the snowmobile beside him. Can I come with you? Bo asked. Please? Jackson looked at me askance, and I gave him a consenting nod. He was very helpful today, I assured him. All right, bud. Put this on first. Do you guys want to come? Alex asked, glancing at me and Thea. We can come back for the food. That way you can get some shooting practice in. Are you kidding? Elle's a better shot than all of us. Jackson winked at me. Ha, <laughs> that's a lie. But I'm okay for now. What about Sophie? I thought she was with you guys. Alex couldn't hide the downcast expression that washed over him, but he tried to shrug it off. She said she had stuff to do. When people get secretive around birthdays, it's best not to ask too many questions, I told him. I wasn't sure if that was Sophie's excuse, but I thought it might make him feel a little better. He smiled, but it wasn't real. Not the heart-stopping smile I knew he had in him. Okay. Well, you boys have fun. Hit all the targets and be safe. But I want to go too, Thea whined. Yeah, you need to work on your aim, Bo said, climbing on the back of the snowmobile. Nuh-uh, Thea taunted. Yeah, huh Bo froze when a snowball hit him in the helmet. See, Thea taunted. I'm a better aim than you. Bo swung his leg over and climbed off the snowmobile, breaking into a run after his sister. She shrieked and threw a wad of snow at him, hitting him in the shoulder, and he stumbled back. Oh, damn, Alex hooted as they went at it, the two of them throwing half-formed balls of snow at each other. Within seconds, Alex joined in, the three of them having an all-out snowball war. 
Thea ran toward me, and I began to back away. She ran behind my legs, her head butting into my backside as she tried to shield herself. Hey, don't bring me into this, I shrieked, and moved out of the way too late. Snow hit me in the leg, and I spewed empty threats as the kids ran in the opposite direction. Jackson climbed off his snowmobile and came to stand beside me, both of us amused as we watched the kids play like normal kids used to. So much for target practice, he mused. What do you mean? They're practicing as we speak. Jackson glanced at me, then out at the kids. Whatever you say. I gave him a nudge. Trust me, this is more important right now, I told him. I swooped down and grabbed a handful of snow. Don't throw that at me, he warned. I'm serious. Yeah? I took a few steps away, putting plenty of distance between us. I'm a really good aim, he answered. Seriously, you'll regret it. Even if I did regret it, it would be worth it to see Jackson actually smile. Balling the wad of snow in my hand, I chuckled as he shook his head in warning. Don't do it, Elle. Eagerly, I tossed it at him, hitting him directly in the face. My hand flew to my mouth as the snow fell in chunks from his beard. I swear, I was aiming for your chest. The longer his head continued to shake, the more nervous I became. Jackson, I didn't mean to hit you in the face. That's what they all say, he said, and crouched down to grab a handful of snow. I'm glad your shooting aim isn't as bad as your throwing arm, he jested. And with a rumble of laughter in his chest, Jackson threw a snowball right at my stomach, and the game was officially on. 29. Jackson. April 9th. This is Huck Fulton from Hartley Bay for the daily broadcast. Fulton's voice was slower than usual and seemingly deflated, but still grating over the radio against my pounding headache. It's been a few days since our last broadcast due to radio transmission issues. Having since found a cache of military radios, we're back to broadcasting. That being said, are there any uh, electrical engineers out there interested in joining us? He laughed, though it sounded more brittle than amused. Today, I'm happy to report that we haven't seen outsiders in nearly two weeks, which is fortunate and troublesome. We're still in need of another doctor after the militants robbed our scavenging party just outside our walls three months ago. We lost Doc Chen in the raid. Without giving too much away, we learned our lesson and we've become more strategic. It's been quiet, though, ever since. As always, I urge survivors to come this way, especially if you have any medical skills. We're nearly a hundred strong and could use your help. We have weapons and plenty of food, and in the months since the outbreak, we've been able to find a semblance of community and a new normalcy within our walls. I glanced up from my maps of Canada fanned out across the table to Sophie. She sat on the couch, listening intently to the broadcast. I wasn't sure why, but she seemed less eager to go to Hartley the closer the time came to leaving. Alex sat with Bo on the floor, staring at the radio as well. As long as you're willing to pitch in, we'll find a place for you, Huck Fulton continued. Then he rattled off their coordinates as he always did. Who wants snacks? Sophie asked, uncurling from the couch. Thea jumped up from her book, organizing on the rug in front of the heater. I want circus cookies. Come and get them then. The two of them disappeared down the hall. Alex and Bo were oblivious to snacks as they cleaned the rifle I'd lent Alex for target practice the day before. His thoroughness and attention to detail made me proud, and while Elle was capable of protecting them, it never hurt to have someone to share the burden with, especially once I was gone. I took a gulp of water from my thermos. Being cooped up indoors during a whiteout was different when you were stone-cold sober. Everything was borderline distracting, and the heater was turned up so high I thought I might melt. But I wouldn't say anything. It was an extravagance for the kids, one they rarely enjoyed. 
I angled the lamplight on the card table and zeroed in on my maps as the clan stirred around me. Focus was something I was fairly good at. I was just out of practice. Don't tell Al I gave you cookies, Thea, Sophie said as they walked back into the living room. I heard my name. El shouted from her room upstairs, and Thea's eyes widened. Shoving another cookie into her mouth to get rid of the evidence, Thea wiped her hands on her pants, checking for crumbs before she grabbed one of our Alaska survival books and flipped through the pages. Here, Sophie said, handing me some jerky. The circles under her eyes were darker than usual, her demeanor more withdrawn. I reached for the jerky. Thanks. She bypassed me and set the rest on the table, her eyes shifting away from mine just as quickly. Sure. I must have looked more haggard and harried than I thought if I was scaring the kids now. What are those? She asked, pointing to the dots on the map. More squatter shacks in case we need them. She looked at me, incredulous. I thought we were waiting for spring so we don't have to worry about hiding out. It's only a day's drive. A lot can happen in a day, I explained. You know that. I didn't have a good feeling about leaving Slana. It was a combination of a lot of things. I didn't know what I would find in Whitehorse or if I'd meet up with Ross again. And Hartley Bay claimed to be safe, but they'd had enough hiccups outside their walls to make me wonder what their definition of safety was and how exactly they could guarantee something like that. Which route are we taking? Sophie pointed to two different paths. I haven't decided. She sat down in the chair next to me. She'd been eager to learn more about cars and how things worked, so her interest didn't surprise me, even if I was still trying to figure her out. Bo and Thea were easy. Kids who bickered, asked a lot of questions, and had a hard time sitting still. Alex was equally straightforward with his street smarts and innate will to survive. Elle was a mama bear when it came to the kids, even if she was still trying to figure out her place with them. They'd pretty much become her life now. But Sophie was struggling, and while I was struggling too and could understand why she would be, I wasn't exactly sure what she was struggling with. The loss of her family? All the horrors she'd seen? Did she not feel like she was part of the team? Every time Elle or Alex tried to talk to her, she brushed them off. Whatever it was, I worried about the toll it was taking on her. Want me to help you decide then? She leaned onto the table studying the map closely. Sure. I sat back, arms crossed over my chest. A straightforward route on the highway would be fastest, but it would also expose us and everything we're hauling with us, the trailer and supplies, food, a snowmobile, that sort of thing. Her gaze shifted from the map to me. You're worried about other survivors stealing from us? I nodded. Or worse? We're not the only survivors with a plan like this either. At least, it's not likely. Especially with the announcements continuously circulating about Hartley. People will be heading there, especially with the weather changing. And the other route, it follows the river? I figure it'll keep us off the roads. We'd need to get more snowmobiles, though. We'd be close to a water source, but have to brave the elements. She finished for me. Yes. Hence, the squatter shacks. The weather is getting better, but it's still Alaska, so nothing's certain. And the wolves have been out in force, she added. And that. I scrubbed my beard and sighed. Like I said, I haven't decided. Sophie stared at the map, her gaze tracing the curves of the river. It seems so easy on paper. It sure does, I mused, eyeing the journal her hand rested upon. You look like you've been doing some planning of your own. Sophie blushed and picked up her journal. My favorite subject in school was biology. Well, science in general. When you were telling us about beard lichen and where to find it, I was thinking I should write that kind of stuff down. For when you're not around anymore, I mean. She'd been listening more than I thought she was, and it made me feel a little better about separating in Whitehorse. She opened her journal and showed me a sketch of a spruce branch, draped with lichen. I wrote down all the things you said we can use it for. Versatile. Dye, deodorant, toothpaste, salves. 
Her notes were written in big round letters across the bottom of the page. Does it look right? The sketch was long and stringy, just like an old man's beard. I know all lichen looks similar, but I figure I should be as specific as I can in case Elle or someone else needs to reference it. They'll know what they're looking at. I think it's great. I was actually awed by how much work she was putting into her journal. And all this time, I thought you'd been writing about boys. You have your own survival guide in here. Sophie closed her journal. How do you know all this stuff anyway? I mean, is it all from your job or? My mom. I told her. A lot of it is, at least. She taught me about nature and the ways of her people before she died. They used to live off the land, so it was all second nature to her. And you remember it all? No, but it helps that I've had to use some of the knowledge she gave me over the years through my work. There are things I've forgotten, but there's a lot that's stuck with me, too. The stairs creaked as Elle came down. Something draped over her shoulder. Finished, she sang victoriously. With what? Thea sprang up from the floor. Elle grinned, pleased with herself, and held out a net of black string. It's for fishing, catching, trapping, strapping, lugging. She appraised one of the knots more closely and shrugged. Not too shabby for my first time. I was wondering what you were doing up there. I pushed my chair out to stand. May I? With a nod, Elle handed me her pride and joy. The net was taut and lightweight, perfect to put in one of our packs in case of an emergency. This is great. I handed it back to her. I want to make one, Thea chirped, jumping in place as she craned her neck back, peering up at us. Please? Sure you can. The corner of Elle's mouth lifted, along with an amused eyebrow. You can use my pile of practice knots to see what not to do. She tickled Thea's neck, making her giggle. Elle winked and handed her the net. I liked it when Elle winked. It reminded me that not everything was always so bad, which I forgot sometimes. It was that forced optimism she had that I'd grown to appreciate. I want to see, Bo said, plodding over. He gave the net a once-over and nodded in approval. It looks pretty good, he said. You definitely got better at it. L pushed his shoulder playfully. Thanks, bud. It was a lot of effort. You left me high and dry up there. I needed to help Alex clean the rifle. She brushed Bo's blonde hair from his face. It's sort of a one-person job anyway. Her stomach rumbled, and Thea giggled again. I guess I'm starving, she said. Anyone else want lunch? Elle glanced around the room. Yep, Thea shouted and zoomed past me, practically pushing me out of the way. I backed up, knocking into Sophie. Shit, sorry. I reached out for her arm as she lost her balance, but when I touched her, she shrank away. Immediately, I let go. Sophie took a faltering step back, and her wide eyes shimmered. Did I hurt you? I asked, worried I'd grabbed her too tightly. Her cheeks reddened and her gaze darted toward the stairs. Soph? She took another step back. Yeah, I'm fine. She looked fearful and brokenhearted at once, and a concerning ache filled my heart. Just, please, don't touch me. I nodded, uncertain what else to do, and she hurried up the stairs to her room. When the door clicked shut, I fell back into my seat my heart thudding and my hands clenching. I'd seen that cowering look from other women a few times before. For the first time, I was grateful so many people were dead. The chances were good if someone had hurt her. That bastard was one of them. 30. Jackson. April 10th. Standing at the workbench in the warehouse, I stared down at my chicken scratch. Recalculate fuel supply. Sat phone battery replacement. Check solar warehouse for generator parts. Replacement snowmobile clutch. Double A, D battery stock for scanner and CB. I skimmed the list, trying to remember what else I'd wanted to get done before we got back on the road. The time was nearing quickly, 
and I didn't feel as ready as I'd expected to. Rifle for Alex. I picked up the hardwood bolt-action rifle from the work table, appreciating its weight in my hand. It was lighter than a shotgun perfect for hunting, and with the strap it would be easy enough to carry with him wherever he went. The new world was a savage place, and Alex was ready for his own gun. He'd proven that much in the last few months. Sophie had wanted to learn initially, was even pretty good at it, but she'd stopped joining us as the months went on. With the ice melting, predators were on the move, hungry and hunting, but it was the human variable I was most worried about. With Alex's hard work, a gun would become an extension of him easily enough and would help ward off anyone who might consider taking advantage of them in the months to come. I set the rifle down and tugged my fleece cap off, rubbing my fingers through my hat hair. Even without a day job, ticking clocks, and everything scheduled out on a calendar, time was flying by. It was hard to imagine what I'd be doing another four months from now, and with whom. I peered out the window as the sun sank behind the white-capped mountains to the east. Taking a deep breath, I inhaled the sharp scent of gun cleaner and lubricant. It was familiar and tethered me to my past life, which was slipping further away from me each day. With one last thing to do before I called it a day, I grabbed the handheld radio off the work table already programmed on channel 7 and turned it on. When there was no sign of Ross, I scanned the other channels, waiting for the static to fade and his familiar voice to come over the airwaves. There was only static. He wasn't likely close enough, but I had to try. Daily. I tried to call him on the sat phone, but that went unanswered as well. Fucking Ross. I shook my head. Where the hell was he? He was a state trooper in one of the darkest, coldest, most dangerous cities in the United States. A damn Eagle Scout, an infantryman, for God's sake, and the only family I had left. I refused to believe he was dead. Yet, the relief I'd felt seeing him alive had become a distant memory, and I struggled to hold on to it. I turned off the generator and charging cradle, double-checked that the ammunition and weapons from our afternoon target practice were locked away, and made my way for the door. I could feel the onslaught of nighttime temperature as the sunlight dimmed and caused me to uncurl my woolen collar up to my ears. Slinging my rifle over my shoulder, I headed for the house. It was a short walk down the road, but provided some calm before the storm. The second I stepped inside, the house would be full of noise. That was still hard sometimes. I ran my hands over my face, feeling the effects of ten days without a drink. The past four months hadn't been a complete drunken blur, but I definitely had my moments. And it was hard not to crave the numbness that dulled my mind when it was too restless for its own good. The door opened as I walked up the porch steps, and Sophie stepped out. Oh, hey, she said. Hey. She barely looked at me as she dumped a bucket of dirty water into the snow. I held the screen door open for her. Hey, Soph, I'm sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable yesterday or... No, it's totally fine. She rolled her eyes, forcing a smile. I was just being weird. I haven't been sleeping. It's okay. Seriously. Before I could ask her anything else, she turned back into the house. Dinner's just about ready. You better get cleaned up. Sophie picked up a couple of empty glasses from the coffee table and placed them in the bucket, her long blonde hair swinging against her back as she straightened. You're in for a treat, she said, turning for the kitchen. Ellen and I made something special tonight for Alex. Should I be afraid? I joked. L being in the kitchen had resulted in a few questionable meals. Don't worry, I supervised, Sophie said, flashing me a real smile this time. Maybe I had been completely off the mark yesterday, and it was a teenager thing, or hormonal. My gut told me that wasn't true, though, and shaking my head, I stepped inside. The scent of garlic and something sweet hit my nose and the sound of children laughing in the kitchen and pots and pans clanking together filled the house. I divested my coat and cap and hung them on the coat rack, then removed my rifle and leaned it against the wall by the door. 
Thea and Bo had seen what guns could do firsthand. I didn't have to worry about them getting curious. I didn't have many rules, but not touching the guns was one of them. One cue, the kids chirped and bickered in the dining room as I made my way in. Okay, L said. It's time to play the giraffe game while we finish getting everything ready for dinner. Get in your seats. What's the giraffe game? Bo asked. Yeah, Thea echoed. What's the giraffe game? Well, think about it for a minute. Elle winked at me as I walked in. What sounds do giraffes make? The room fell silent as the kids sat thoughtfully in their chairs. Elle hustled around the kitchen. Potholders, she said, peering around. Aha! She blew a loose strand of hair from her face and lifted the casserole from the counter. Her verdant eyes flashed to mine as she headed to the table. How is it you're always just in time for the food? My stomach knows, I told her. Sophie, Bo said, what sound does a giraffe make? His brow furrowed deep with thought. You know, I don't know, she said. But think a little longer, you'll figure it out. I sidled up to Elle at the counter. What sound do they make? I whispered. She shrugged. I have no idea, but I figured it would keep them occupied for a few minutes. She smiled, her full lips exposing white teeth. I liked Elle's smile. Aren't you clever? I muttered and washed my hands in the wash bucket. The water was beyond cold, nearly freezing, so I lathered them up, dipped, and dried them as quickly as I could. Elle took a collection of water glasses to the table. I can't open this, Thea said, trying to hand her something. Ask Jackson, Thea. My hands are full. Thea climbed out of her chair and walked over with her hand outstretched and an inquisitive look scrunching her face. She offered me a mangled band-aid wrapper with a pink cartoon panther on it. I can't open this, she said. Her big brown eyes were expectant, and my heart squeezed. Can you help me, please? I cleared my throat and took the wrapper, tiny in my hands, and peeled it open. Then, Thea held up her middle finger. I have an owie. It was the smallest prick of red. I could barely see it. What happened? I was getting sticks for the fire with Bo and got a splinter. A splinter? Well, did you already get it out? She shrugged. Maybe you should get it out before you put a bandage on it. I glanced at Elle, knowing she was better at these things than I was. There are tweezers in the bathroom, she said her eyes glinting with amusement. In the medicine cabinet. Will you get it out for me? I looked down at Thea's freckled cheeks, rosy with warmth. Her big brown eyes stared innocently up at me. She was a cute kid. I'd give her that. Let's do it quick. It's time for dinner. Okay. She took my hand in hers, the way Thea randomly did sometimes, and I nearly stumbled. It was small, and precious, and she squeezed my fingers as she peered up at me. I nodded to the bathroom. We need the flashlight, I told her, so I can see better. Thea pulled a small one the size of a keychain from her belt. We can use mine, she said, taking her hand from mine so she could click it on. You have a tool belt? I hadn't noticed it underneath her oversized sweatshirt, or maybe it was because until recently I hadn't wanted to notice things. Thea tilted her head, absently studying her finger. That was what life had become for a six-year-old kid, utility belts with survival tools, so she could go about her normal day. It's the perfect size for you, I mused. Where did you find it? Elk got it for me at the tool store. I grabbed the tweezers from the medicine cabinet and sat down on the toilet lid, closer to Thea's height. Does your brother have a tool belt too? Yep, we have the same one but he hides dog treats in his. I don't do that. Really? I lifted her small finger closer and looked for the tiny splinter in the middle of a tiny red dot. Why does he have dog treats? In case the wolves come closer, she said. I looked at her, eyebrows raised in warning. You stay away from those wolves, Thea. Both of you, okay? She stared at me, then nodded, hesitant. Promise? 
She licked her lips, taking too much time to answer, but finally, she did. I promise. I eyed her for a second longer, then squinted at the tip of her finger. After my third attempt, I plucked the splinter from her finger, earning an ouch, but I didn't have time to apologize before she pressed her hurt finger against my lips. Will you kiss it? I blinked. I must have done something resembling a kiss because she grinned gratefully, shouting a thank you as she skipped out of the bathroom, taking her tiny flashlight with her. I blinked again, took a deep breath, and put the tweezers away in the darkness. Kids were an emotional whirlwind, I decided, and being around Thea warmed my heart and made me miserable at the same time. Clearing my throat, I went back into the dining room to join the others. Thea settled back into her seat beside Bo and handed Elle the bandage wrapper. You got her splitter out. Elle glanced at me from the end of the table, smiling as she fumbled with the bandage wrapper. I didn't know you had such advanced medical skills. She teased and wrapped the band-aid twice around the fingertip of Thea's finger. Well, troopers get a lot of owies in the field, I told her. <laughs> I bet you did. With a sigh, she surveyed the table. Bo, will you do the honors, please? It's officially getting dark in here. She handed him a lighter. It was a grown-up task he took seriously, and he leaned forward carefully and flicked the lighter on. Did you see giraffes when you were a wildlife trooper? Thea asked. Do you know what sounds they make? No, no giraffes, I told her. Mostly bears and moose. There aren't giraffes in Alaska, stupid, Bo said, holding his mouth just right as he lit the tapers in the candle holders. The entire table began to glow. We're not using that word, Bo, remember? Elle chided. Sorry. He grumbled and sat back down in his chair. Good job, Elle said, admiring the candles. High five. It looks like you've outdone yourself tonight, I told her, eyeing the dressings on the table. A vegetable medley, a basket of garlic bread, a casserole baked golden brown, yams, and even a pecan pie. She set crystal goblets out, even for the kids, making the table sparkle in the candlelight. As Alex would say, it's all about the frozen section. Elle was good at playing off her hard work, but she'd put a lot of thought and effort into the dinner, wanting it to be special for Alex's birthday. And she wasn't much for cooking, so the effort was all the more noteworthy. Good job supervising, Sophie, I told her. She grinned knowingly. Alex told us about a casserole recipe his grandma used to make. Elle started. Then she paused. I just hope we did it justice. She eyed the dish skeptically. It will be perfect, Sophie reassured her, laying a clutch of extra napkins on the table. Elle pulled her chair out from the table and nodded for me to sit down in mine. I found some, Alex said as he stepped out of the walk-in pantry. He lifted up two dusty bottles. What is it? Thea asked. Sparkling cider. I had it once when I was a kid. I think it was at Thanksgiving or something. Alex didn't talk about his family all that much, but I got the impression family gatherings were rare occasions. What I did know was he could boost cars and had a decent-sized scar on his right temple from who knew what. And more than anything, he was kind and grateful. He was always thanking me for teaching him how to do things big and small like build a proper fire and keep a gun from freezing. Sparkling? Thea said with awe. Like soda pop? Can I have some? It's better than soda, and I'll pour, I told them, unscrewing the cap. Once everyone had a glass of something, Sophie lifted her fancy goblet. To Alex, she said. A great partner in crime and... Her lighthearted words became heavy. I don't know what I would have done without you she said in more of a whisper. Alex nudged her arm with his elbow, smiling bashfully, but Sophie's smile faltered and she quickly leaned away. Sorry, Alex said, and took a drink from his glass. That was the second time Sophie had shied away from someone's touch, a male touch, as far as I could tell. But she smiled it off again. Happy birthday, Alex. I looked at Elle. She had to have noticed. Yay, Alex! 
Thea cheered. Happy birthday, L echoed the sentiment. But her perplexed gaze finally met mine, and I could see her worry too. Now wasn't the time to discuss what had just happened, but at least I wasn't the only one. 31. L. April 10th. We sat at the fire pit behind the house, watching the northern lights sailing across the sky, our marshmallows toasting in the hot flames of the campfire. It was nice to enjoy one of the few harmless Alaskan wonders. It almost felt like things were normal, or as normal as they could be. Sophie stared into the flames, watching them dance. I wanted to ask her what was going on with her tonight at the dinner table, but we hadn't had a minute alone. Something was wrong, we all knew it, and it was getting worse. She woke up each morning earlier than the last, and retreated to her room almost immediately after dinner to work on her survival book, or because of her minstrel cramps. It was always something. As withdrawn as Sophie was becoming, I began to wonder if she was depressed. The more I watched her, I began to recognize a familiar look of fear in her eyes, and that's what worried me the most. I knew that fear. It was haunting and made you desperate. What was Sophie so afraid of? Her sapphire gaze met mine across the fire, and she straightened in her Adirondack. I'm getting tired, Thea. Are you ready for bed? Thea licked the chocolate off her fingers and shook her head as she sat back in her seat, yawning. No. It must have been nearly ten o'clock. Bo was already curled up in his chair next to Alex, trying and failing to stay up past his bedtime with the rest of us. And Jackson, I peered around at the darkness and then at the back door. I wasn't sure where he'd run off to. Thank you, Elle. Alex said, leaning back in his chair with his hands shoved in his pockets. I had a pretty awesome birthday. Bo held up a corner of his wool blanket in offering, but Alex shook his head and ruffled Bo's hair instead. Did you really have a nice birthday, or are you just saying that? You won't hurt my feelings. Birthdays were so personal, it was difficult to tell. The casserole was just like my grandma's he said with clear sincerity in his voice. Less burnt, thankfully. She'd forget about it warming in the oven most of the time. I'm glad you liked it. I smiled, admiring the affection in his voice when he spoke of his grandma. You don't talk about her. Were you too close? Alex pried his gaze from the fire and looked at me. I stayed with her between families sometimes. I slept on her couch and she'd make me breakfast, on her good days. She had emphysema and other health stuff. He pulled his blue beanie off his head and turned it around in his hands. She made me one of these once too. They evicted me, we'll say, from a family I was living with, and I had to leave it behind. I don't know whatever happened to it. Alex was only 18 and yet an entire lifetime shone through his shimmering eyes. I'm sorry, Sophie breathed. Alex stirred from his thoughts and looked at her. It is what it is. I got a new one, though. He smirked at Thea and tugged the beanie back over his head. He had a charming smile, especially when he was deflecting. We practiced first, Thea told him, yawning again. Alex's eyebrows rose. Did you? I know, I said. It's hard to tell. It's perfect. I like things that are unique. <laughs> it's definitely unique. I watched him as he helped Thea clean off her marshmallow skewer, patient and natural at being an older brother. He had a sketchy past, exotic-looking tanned skin, dark, broody eyes, and a killer smile that probably made all the high school girls swoon. But he was stoic and sweet, too. He was a tough kid, and despite a life of constant disruption, Alex was solid, more than I was at his age, and I much admired that about him. 
a wolf howled off in the distance, and Thea straightened. They're back, she whispered. When another wolf howled in response, Bo looked at me. It was like he wanted to say something, but he looked back at the fire instead. I told myself the wolves weren't any closer than I'd heard them in the past. Their howls were just louder in the still night air. Good thing we built a fire, Alex muttered, staring out into the darkness. My eyes narrowed on Bo and Thea. You two haven't been taunting the wolves, have you? I'd heard Jackson and Thea's discussion about dog treats. Or tried to lure them closer? They're dangerous animals, remember. You understand that, right? Both of them looked at me. That's my cue, Sophie said, unfurling her legs. She climbed to her feet. I cleared my throat, waiting for a reply. Finally, Thea nodded. Then, Bo. We know they're dangerous, he said, though I wasn't sure he believed it. I had half a mind to start tying them up each day so they couldn't get into any trouble. You ready for bed yet? Sophie peered down at Thea. Thea scooted out of her chair in answer. I'll go too, Bo said, and pulled his blanket back. They were both guilty of something, I just didn't know what. And even if it was harmless, I needed to find out. For peace of mind, if nothing else. Putting discover all the kids' secrets on my list of things to do tomorrow, I raised an eyebrow, watching them as they filed past me, shamefaced. Good night, I said as the three of them disappeared into the house. Good night, they echoed from inside the kitchen, and the back door shut behind them. It was true. I was likely the biggest secret keeper of all. But my secret was kept to protect them all. At least, that's what I kept telling myself. I didn't want the kids getting hurt, no more than they already had been. I wasn't sure how parents did it, especially with four of them. Do you have any secrets? I asked Alex, more rhetorical than anything. He glanced up from the fire pit. I have a bunch, he said, more serious than I'd expected. Nothing exciting, if that's what you mean. No, it was sort of a joke. You don't have to share them, I said. I was just thinking out loud. Alex's dark eyes shifted from my face to my gloved hands, then back at my face. The longer his gaze lingered, the quicker my heart began to beat. You shock me a lot when I touch you, he said. I didn't think it was a question, but I wasn't sure how to respond. So you said. You don't ever feel it? It's probably the gloves. I folded my arms over my lap. Static cling and all of that. I didn't know if that was an actual thing with the gloves or why it only seemed to happen with Alex. It doesn't hurt, does it? I thought suddenly. He shook his head. It's uncomfortable, but no, it doesn't hurt. No more than pulling clothes out of the dryer. Oh, well, that's good, I guess. Alex looked back into the flames, their crackle punctuating the silence. What about you? He started. Do you have any secrets? My gaze shifted to him, tentative and curious. What? The back door opened again, and Jackson stepped out. I could hear his heavy footsteps. Did everyone go to bed already? He asked. When I peered back at him, he was a dark shadow in the doorway. Then he stepped out into the firelight. His hair was loose and hanging around his face, dark and wavy. His goatee and beard still darkened his jaw, but were groomed. He'd become the quintessential mountain man, and I liked the way it looked on him. You just miss them, I said. I guess it's pretty late. Jackson walked toward Alex. This is for you anyway, he said, stepping around the fire pit. Jackson lifted the rifle strap off his shoulder and handed it to him. Happy birthday. Alex's eyes opened wide, his mouth gaped. Seriously? Seriously. 
You're shitting me. He stood up, taking the rifle in his hands like he wasn't sure it was real. I'm not shitting you, Jackson said, a smile in his voice. He looked at me and winked. You deserve it, kid. You've been beyond helpful, and I know you'll appreciate and respect this. Oh, this is so cool. I will, he said, and took Jackson's hand for a firm shake. Thank you. You're welcome. Jackson came to sit in the chair beside me. Your gift is cooler than mine, I told him. I'm jealous. What are you talking about? Jackson shook his head. I wish it was my birthday so you'd make me a hat. I laughed. Sure you do. I'm serious. My ears get cold sometimes. You already have that fleece cap you always wear. So? Alex already has one, too. I wagged a finger at him. Touche. I huffed out a deep breath, conceding my gift was a hundred times better than his, and we settled into a comfortable silence. The crackle of the fire was soothing, the rainbow of lights above mesmerizing. Sometimes, I wondered how a place this beautiful could be so perilous at the same time. We'd had whiteouts and blizzards, and worried about freezing to death once during our trip. But we'd been lucky that was it. I'm gonna head to bed, Alex said with a long stretch. Thanks again. He stared at his rifle, admiring it with a smile. Then at us. Tonight was fun. You're welcome, Alex. I tugged the collar of my coat up higher around my neck. We still on for tomorrow? Alex looked at Jackson. Yep, when the sun comes up. I looked at Jackson, a sense of unease washing over me. I'll leave you the chocolates, just in case, Alex said with a wink in my direction. You know me so well, I grinned. Sleep well. He pulled the strap of his rifle over his shoulder and grabbed Bo's discarded blanket off the chair. Night, kid, Jackson said, leaning forward to warm his hands over the fire. Night. Alex climbed the porch steps and quietly went into the house. As soon as the door was closed, I looked at Jackson. You're leaving tomorrow? I knew he'd planned on a supply run to Delta Junction, a town much larger than Slana, to find a slew of things on his list, especially since we were leaving in a couple weeks. But I hadn't realized he was heading out so soon, or that Alex was going with him. Yep, Alex wanted to go with me, get a feel for the roads and learn what to look for when you all head to Hartley. Plus, he knows cars better than I do. I could use his help finding replacement parts for the Explorer and Snowmobile. He scratched his beard and leaned his head back against the chair. I didn't think it was a half bad idea. Then what's wrong? He seemed as excited to have Alex tagging along as he did apprehensive. Jackson shrugged. You mean, aside from the ordinary? Nothing, I guess. I just, I want you guys to be as prepared as you can for whatever comes next. It was still a bit depressing to think about leaving him, but I was grateful for how much thought he'd put into all of it. Thank you, Jackson. But we'll be fine. His eyes drifted to mine. I know, he said. But you should still be prepared for the unexpected. There's no telling what might happen from one day to the next. Trust me, I know, I sighed, leaning my head back to stare at the sky. I've been thinking about all the possible ways this could go wrong. You can't think about it like that, he said. No, you do. He glowered at me, but I knew he was right. What happened to all that forced optimism that's so annoying sometimes? He teased. I wasn't sure if it was because he was leaving, Alex was going with him, or he'd reminded me that soon we'd be parting ways. But I felt sulky all of a sudden. It's failed me tonight, I guess. Jackson ran his hands down the wood armrests. You'll have a tribe again soon not just a band of misfits. I sighed, strangely content with things the way they were. I kinda like our band of misfits. Jackson smiled. Me too, he murmured.
His voice was a baritone in the still night. It was really nice what you did for Alex tonight, El. The kids needed something to celebrate. That's the only reason? He asked with a sidelong look. The flames jumped in the fire pit. The wood crackled. Jackson's gaze heated the side of my face, waiting for me to say something. I picked up my cold cocoa nestled in the snow, my mouth suddenly parched. I've always hated birthdays, I admitted, and took a sip. I tried to pretend it was chocolate milk instead of clumpy snow water and packaged chocolate powder. They were always a disappointment. You didn't get what you wanted? I shook my head. It's not that. Birthdays come with too many expectations. Expectations that someone needs to care about your birthday to begin with. There's the inescapable disappointment when they don't. And you never know what strings are attached. Jackson's brow furrowed. There aren't supposed to be strings attached at all. Not for a birthday. That wasn't the case in my family. I took another sip. I guess I needed to prove that's not true anymore. His eyes glittered in the firelight, and as Jackson's gaze trailed the contours of my face, my insides warmed a little. A hopeful feeling that scared me burned just below the surface. Jackson looked away, clearing his throat. You're a good person, Al. Alex and the kids are lucky to have you. Thanks, I whispered, pleasantly surprised to hear the words. Jackson didn't bestow compliments often. I know it will be hard, but I feel lucky to have them. I failed my sister, and yet, somehow, I inherited a bigger family. You didn't fail your sister. He looked up at the sky, his fist clenching on the armrest. There was nothing we could have done differently. He could barely say the words. Are you reminding me or yourself? Jackson let out a deep breath. Both. I pried my gaze from him, and we sat in silence for a few charged heartbeats. Both of us lost in thoughts we didn't share. I thought about Jenny's last hours, and I thought about Sophie's mom, who died without saying goodbye to her daughter. I thought about Bo and Thea, who watched their mom kill herself by jumping out a window because she'd lost her mind. And somehow, we'd all found each other. We were all okay. When I didn't want to think about any of that anymore, I stood to put out the fire. You'll be okay here with the kids? I looked at Jackson, waiting for him to continue. While I'm gone, I mean. Since Alex is leaving with me, I want to make sure you feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable with it. Not because I didn't think I couldn't handle the place for a couple days on my own, but because I knew what would come after they returned. We'll be fine, I promised. Besides, I need to get used to running things on my own anyway. Soon I won't have a choice. Jackson blinked, opened his mouth to say something, then stopped. For a moment, I thought he might invite us to stay with him in Whitehorse. But then he conceded. I guess you're right. Nodding, I exhaled my unwarranted disappointment and shoveled a pile of snow onto the fire. You've got a long day tomorrow. You better get some sleep. 32. L. April 11th. Thea and I hung laundry on the line outside the house, enjoying the sun on our faces and the woodpeckers looking for grubs in the early afternoon. Like last night, the skies were clear, and despite the cool temperatures, the sun was warm, a welcome break from the clouds and cold. Do you think Alex and Jackson are on their way back yet? Thea asked, clipping her seventh clothespin on her jacket. I don't think so. They're staying in Delta Junction for a couple days. I put my hand out. Can I have another pen, please? She scooted closer, her boots like miniature plows in the snow. She stuck her chest out so I could remove a pen from her jacket. This wasn't what I had in mind when I asked you to help me, I muttered. And as Thea often did, she giggled in reply. 
Will you at least hand me the rest of the wet socks from the basket? Yep, she tweeted with a bounce. Thank you. L, Bo said tentatively as the front door opened. He stepped out of the house, the hinges squeaking as the door swung shut behind him. Yes? I glanced over my shoulder. You're letting all the heat out, bud. He balled his hands in front of him and he glanced into the house. His chest was heaving like he was going to cry. I dropped the socks in my hands. What is it? I walked toward him. Something's wrong with Sophie. She won't stop crying. I took Thea's hand. Come on, let's make sure she's okay. I already knew she wasn't. Sophie wouldn't even come out of her room this morning for breakfast. I hurried into the house. Letting go of Thea's hand, I swung the door shut and ran up the stairs. I could hear Sophie's body-racking sobs from the hallway and opened the bedroom door. Soph? I stopped in the doorway, taking the sight of her in. She looked broken, completely undone. Her face was blotched with red, her cheeks wet with tears as she shook her head. Taking an urgent step forward, I kicked her backpack, hearing a familiar sound. I looked down to find a pill bottle. I reached for it, finding another one beneath it. I grabbed that one, too. Sleeping pills? I turned one around so I could see the front of it. Modafinil. I looked at her, blindsided, though I knew I shouldn't have been. Sophie. <laughs> I can't do this anymore, she mumbled through a thickening sob. Can't do it? The entire world seemed to stop. Soph. My voice was less than a whisper as I climbed onto the bed next to her. What does that mean? I reached for her, wanting to comfort her. You don't understand, she cried, pulling away from me. You can't touch me. No one can touch me. You're right, I don't understand, I pleaded, searching her face. I trembled beside her with fear and uncertainty. What happened? I stared into her muddy blue eyes, bloodshot and heavy with exhaustion. Please, tell me what's wrong. I can feel it inside me, in my head, she cried. I see it when I close my eyes. See what? I can't help you if I don't understand. I couldn't help the desperation in my voice, the rising panic. Deep down, I think I knew what she saw, what she felt. Fire, like me. What do you see? I repeated. I didn't recognize my own voice, the unbridled fear, the shock. What do you see? It was a tentative whisper this time, horrified by what she might say next. Sophie inhaled, a jagged, rough sound that tore at my heart, and she looked at me. Everything. She bawled herself against the wall, desperate to be left alone. My vision blurred with tears, and I ran my fingers through her hair. I don't know what that means, Sophie. I felt helpless as her body quaked, and there was nothing I could do. I know, she bleated, and looked at my gloves. I saw it this morning when you came to check on me. I know why you wear them every day, and what you've done. I nearly fell backward. You saw? My head was shaking of its own accord. That made no sense. I couldn't see things. I could only feel the fire. I could only feel the unquenched ache deep down. <laughs> I've seen it all, she whimpered, closing her eyes. Like the fire burns inside you. Something twists inside when people touch me. Sophie, I had no words of reassurance. All I could do was gape at her and stare at her hands and her sleeve-covered arms. Touch? It was only a breath of a word, 
but all I could manage. I couldn't imagine the implications of what she was telling me, but I could see her hopelessness like it was my own. You don't feel the fire? No, she said, sniffling. She blinked with swollen eyes. I only feel what you felt. I see what you've seen. Remembering my fear and my pure will to live no matter the consequences, I knew exactly how terrified she must be of me. Finding my voice, I forced myself to gather my wits and be strong for her. I balled the blankets in my hands to keep them from shaking. I would never hurt you, Sophie, I rasped, barely able to speak. I promise you, I would never hurt any of you. But just like Sophie knew what I'd done to Thomas, she knew I couldn't promise something like that either. I hadn't realized it until now myself. I could promise nothing because I knew nothing. Please don't be afraid, I implored. But Sophie was a million miles away, staring through me, at nothing. I'm not afraid of you, she breathed. But I don't want to feel any of it anymore. She swallowed thickly, and her chin trembled. I know how Alex cut the scar on his eyebrow. I know what it felt like to be shoved through the glass. Each word was frail, but the weight was heavy. Jackson and the baby. She ran her hands over her face and through her hair, swallowing her sorrow as best she could. I don't want to see it anymore. I don't want to feel it. She broke into sobs again. Thea whimpered behind me, Bo whispering weak reassurances the way big brothers do. But I couldn't think of them. I could only see Sophie, broken and lost, the way I'd been. I didn't understand any more than she did. I inched my hand closer to lean in, and she stiffened. Don't touch me. I only feel it when people touch me. I won't touch you, I promised. I just want to understand. For months, I'd been hiding the strange thing inside me. For months, I thought I was the only one. How long have you been seeing these things? I mean, you should have told me. I would have understood. I would have tried to help you. They were dreams at first. She brushed the sweat-dampened hair from her face. Then, I thought I was imagining them sometimes. She looked at the pills on the edge of the bed. But I can't stop them anymore. Her voice was rising again and she buried her face in her hands. I just wanted to go away. I thought it would go away. We'll figure something out, I told her. We'll talk to the others. We'll figure it out together. Sophie looked at me, knowing all too well what that meant for me. I would have to tell Jackson what I'd done, and everything would change after that. I hated the reality, but there was no other choice. Not anymore. Sophie was changed. I was changed. All of it was impossible. Maybe he would understand that, even if he could never forgive me for lying to him. We'll tell them, and we'll figure it out, I repeated. And remotely, I thought we couldn't be the only ones. I hedged toward the edge of the bed. Soph, do you hear me? We will. Fire and telepathic memories, no, feelings and memories, were different. But in my gut, I knew it wasn't a coincidence that she'd suddenly become psychic, not when my own physiology differed so greatly from before. These are impossible things, I whispered. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. If I would have known, I would have been more careful around you. We all would have. I felt naked sitting beside her, a thousand question marks floating in the air between us. There were things I never allowed myself to think of, memories from my childhood I prayed I'd forget. Did she know them, too? Every memory? Every feeling? 
I hated to ask, knowing what it cost her to think about all of it. But I had to know. Even if I understood she needed space to process her own feelings instead of ours. Every feeling of every memory I've seen. Like I was there. She nodded to the pill bottles. I thought sleep would help. And when it didn't, I wanted to stay awake. She gritted out angrily. Jackson and Alex are gone, I said, trying to think it all through. We won't touch you. You won't have to worry about that right now. You just need rest. It was another plea. I looked at Thea and Bo, both of them frightened, eyes wide with worry as they clung to one another. They didn't need to know what we were talking about to understand the toll it was taking. I climbed off the bed and crouched down in front of them, tears streaming down my cheeks. I wiped them hastily away. Sophie will be okay, I told them. I reached for Bo's hand, and then I reached for Thea's, clasping their fingers in mine. Sophie and I, I told them, we haven't felt the same since we were sick. I didn't know how to explain it to them. Do you feel different? I asked, reminding myself we couldn't be the only ones. Thea shrugged. Do you feel it inside of you? I tried to explain. Something different? Something scary? They both glanced between us, eventually shaking their heads, and I sighed with relief. We should give Sophie some space. No, she said. I turned around as she wrapped her arms around her knees, laying her head down. No, she repeated, so quietly I barely heard her. Are you sure? She nodded with a sniffle. Bo led Thea to the bed, her hand in his. Are you going to be okay now? He asked. While he'd been strong and brave for his sister, I could see the damp skin beneath his eyes. I'll get better, she lied to him, patting the area of the mattress beside her. You can sit with me. I wasn't sure if she believed that, but I hope she did. Bo climbed up onto the bed, sitting up against the wall next to her. Thea climbed up into my arms, and we sat wrapped together on the edge. What's wrong with her? Thea asked nuzzling into me as she rubbed the tears from her eyes. She's sad, I explained, and afraid. Why is she sad? Thea's little hand inched closer to Sophie, like she wasn't sure she was the same person, but desperately wanted her to be. She's sad because we're sad. Thea and Bo looked at me. I knew it wasn't as simple as that. But if Sophie could feel our fear and sadness, she could feel our happiness, too. I have an idea, I said, scooting further onto the bed with Thea wrapped around me. Why don't we take turns sharing our happiest memories? Wouldn't that be nice? I have a lot of funny ones, Thea admitted. Good. Then why don't you start? Okay, well, Thea began, and she looked at Sophie. The first time I ever got a kitten, I named him Arnold, after my grandpa. Sophie's gaze drifted to mine, and she mouthed a thank you. I nodded, just happy to see the tears had stopped, but my mind wandered. If Sophie knew what I could do, she would know what others were capable of, too. It was a conversation for later, but either way, I knew the next time I saw Jackson would likely be the last. When he returned, I would finally tell him the truth. 33. Jackson. April 11th. The roads were still covered in snow as Alex and I drove to Delta Junction, but the snow plow hitched to the front of the truck helped us make decent time. With more daylight came more sunshine and a bit of warmth to take the sting out of the air. The snow became more compacted and drivable, adding a bit of ease among an unending list of all that could potentially go wrong. So as the city came into view, 
I let out a relieved breath and glanced at Alex, dozing in the passenger seat. We're here, I said, slowing the truck just outside of town. I pulled the Tacoma off the road and into the tree line. The truck was Ross's baby, souped up and weatherproofed, but the deep purr of a Magnaflow exhaust echoing through the town was the last thing I needed. Oh, do you think anyone's here? Alex asked through a yawn. He'd woken up even earlier than I had, after Sophie's early hour roaming through the house. Peering out at the neighborhoods and buildings surrounding the outskirts of the city, my gut instinct was to tell Alex no. I didn't think anyone was there. But instincts could be wrong, and our luck would likely lead to a big, fat yes. I guess we'll find out, I muttered and pushed the driver door open, then climbed out. We've got four or five hours of daylight left. I stretched, squinting at the snow-topped roofs that glistened in the sunlight. A hawk's cry met my ears as I surveyed the cottonwood and birch trees surrounding the town. Everything seemed quiet, but we'd find out if that was true soon enough. Let's get our things and make our way to the airlift first. It's closest. They'll have the medical supplies we need there. Then we can decide where to hit next. Alex heaved his backpack on. Where will we stay tonight? He closed the passenger door and walked around the front of the truck. He scoured our surroundings, gaze darting in all directions. I wasn't sure if he was anxious or just curious. Or maybe he was excited. We'll look for a lodge to stay at on the way. Something on the outskirts. I lugged on my pack and checked my compass, ammo, and secured the knife in my boot, the pistol in my belt, and the rifle on my back. Alex did the same, patting himself down as he took stock of the knife clip to his pocket, the rifle on his back, and the array of tools clipped into his utility belt. He looked legit in his cargo pants and long sleeves. With the weather mellowing a bit more, thermal layers sufficed without the bulk. Add the muted brown and green shades of camo, and Alex would look like he was ready for hunting season. Bear spray? I asked. Alex grinned easily, per usual. You never know. A white puff of breath filled the air as he chuckled. Isn't that the truth? I muttered and nodded toward town. Shall we? Alex fell into step beside me as we followed the road. There were bird and fox prints, even caribou beginning their trek for calving season. But there were no shoe prints or visible predators to be worried about. The tension in my shoulder eased a little as our boots crunched through the snow, almost echoing in the still air. If the weather stays this nice, Alex said, we might have a decent trip. Don't jinx us, kid. That's the last thing we need. He grinned. What's a little more adventure? Trust me, there will be plenty of it to come, and you might change your tune then. I pulled my rifle off my back. In fact, grab your gun. Keep the safety on, but hold it. I want anyone who sees us to know we're armed. Have you run into any other survivors on your other scavenging trips? I nodded. A couple, but I've stayed out of sight. I've only gone on two, though. There's not much in the way of supplies in these territories. Things get airdropped more often than not, and since that hasn't been happening, any sane survivors would hunker down and wait for winter to pass, like we did. Now, though would be the time they'd come out, like us, and I don't want to take any more chances than we have to. There are only six people I trust, you guys and Ross. Everyone else is dangerous. I pulled my sunglasses down off my head, covering my eyes. The sun glared off the snow-lined gutters, nearly blinding me. Did anyone ever shoot at you? When you were a trooper, I mean, Alex whispered. I glanced at him. He was alert, his eyes scanning the street and toward town. I thought back to the meth lab I'd stumbled across, one of a few I'd found by my fourth year on the job. An addict in need of a fix had nearly blasted me. I'd ruined his score by showing up in the dead of night, out in the middle of nowhere after someone in the house called in an assault and battery charge. Yeah, but only once, and Ross had my back. You worked together? We worked similar shifts. I surveyed the sporadic businesses lining the side of the road, mostly warehouses and junkyards, a sign shop and mechanic garage situated between them. 
If Ross was in the area, he'd show up if I needed backup. I did the same. Sounds gutsy, pulling a gun on you. I've had a few run-ins with the cops, and some of them even I thought I could take. But you, you're a pretty intimidating guy. I wouldn't mess with you. I chuckled. A few run-ins, huh? I glanced at him. Petty stuff, mostly. I stared at Alex, waiting for him to elaborate. He pulled his weight and helped out far more than I'd ever expected an 18-year-old to do. But he never got personal, which I understood. But that didn't mean I wasn't curious. Vandalism, he offered, and grabbed a couple pieces of jerky from his pocket. He handed one to me, but I shook my head. Burglary. But that was some bullshit, he added. I knew the guy whose house I was in. He'd just double-crossed me. He tore a piece of jerky off with his teeth. The charges didn't stick, thankfully. I had enough incriminating crap on him, they didn't care about me. Sounds like you had shitty friends. Alex squinted down the road, a white puff of breath floating in the air as he exhaled. They weren't really friends, just guys I knew. Sometimes you don't have a choice, you know? I understood what he meant. It was one thing to be given opportunities and make the wrong choices, but to have none to begin with, as I'm sure Alex often dealt with, your only choice was to take the lesser of the evils. He looked at me like he thought I had a speech coming. I've been a drunk most of my life. I'm not one to pass judgment. Besides, if bureaucrats still ran the world, your record would have been clean as of yesterday. The corner of Alex's mouth quirked up. I guess you're right. After a few seconds, he said, You know, you're not so bad for a cop. Thanks, I think. Alex nearly snorted. <laughs> you're welcome. A flagpole came into view. A dark blue flag with gold stars hung as the state symbol at half-staff, just like I'd seen on most flagpoles since Anchorage. It was a tribute from all the dying to the already dead, and they would likely hang that way forever. Do you want to check this high school? Alex stared at it, uncertainty in his voice. It was a sprawling tan building with light blue trim that looked untouched from the outside. They'll have a nurse's office. Maybe something we can use in the science class? I beamed with pride. You know, I never would have thought of that. I stepped aside. Lead the way, hotshot. Alex took a deep breath as we crossed the street. The baseball diamond was mushy, the batting cages wet with melted snow. Did you like your job? Alex tore off another piece of jerky. It's one thing to be a street cop, but out here... It's gotta be rough, but it probably has everything, though. The adrenaline rush, the brotherhood, the prestige. Oh, and suddenly you care about prestige. Definitely not, but the camaraderie sounds nice. Alex shrugged like he didn't care one way or the other, but I knew better. Everyone liked to feel like they belonged, and being a trooper made me feel like I was part of something bigger than myself. It was. Camaraderie was probably the main reason I lasted so long, I admitted. But it wasn't exactly like they made it out to be in the recruitment commercials either. It was a lonely job too, kid. It's not all honor and bravery and saving the world one kitten at a time, but yes, it was all worth it. Not only did it give me a purpose I didn't know I needed with a group of guys I could count on, it pissed my dad off. So it was a double win. I squinted toward the side entrance, watching for movement in the fenced-in courtyard, still covered in snow. I looked at the giant husky emblem on the side of the building. Dog mushing. Alex laughed. That's kind of cool. You didn't want to? I'm trying to picture you on the back of a dog sled. Eyebrows lifted. I glanced at him. What's with all the questions? I don't know. Just curious. As we reached the door, I put my finger to my lips. Alex nodded and pulled his rifle closer. I didn't hear anything as I leaned in, but that meant nothing. I reached for the handle and slowly turned it, trying not to make too much noise as I gripped my rifle more tightly with the other hand. The door was unlocked, which wasn't surprising given how suddenly the virus had happened, and I opened the door as quietly as I could. While the air outside was brisk, inside it was stagnant and almost humid. The hallways were empty, and there were no sounds or noticeable movements. 
I motioned for Alex to check the office area while I headed down a hall of lockers toward the classrooms. Luckily, movement in a place like this would echo, alerting us to anyone who might be inside. Unluckily, it would also echo our footsteps and give us away. The office door squeaked open behind me, and Alex froze, peering inside before he stepped in completely. I continued down the hall. The walls were dressed with colorful banners. Bulletin boards were cluttered with hockey game schedules and haphazardly hung flyers with club announcements and the January production of Fiddler on the Roof. Walking through a place so silent I could only hear my own breath, and my boots against the linoleum made the hair on the back of my arms stand on end. The halls were once teeming with voices, but they'd never be full again. It was one thing to think about billions of people dying. It was a gargantuan, sweeping number that painted an extraordinary picture. But thinking about the individual lives that ended in a matter of days and hours felt heavier than a simple number. Even one so immense. These kids were complaining to their parents about homework and planning what to wear and who to ask out for the turnabout. They'd had grueling hockey practices and tests to study for and all their sleepless nights and worrying was inane. Every argument with their parents was wasted breath, just like my arguments with my father had been. Neither of us got what we wanted in the end. We'd resented each other all our lives, and it was all for nothing. Alex walked up behind me. One body in the principal's office, he said, swallowing thickly. Though I wished I could protect Alex from seeing dead, decaying bodies, it would only be a disservice to him. I patted his shoulder and peered in through the window of a closed classroom door. Math formulas I didn't understand were scribbled on the whiteboard, and I kept walking. They must have canceled school, I whispered, looking in through another window. There weren't bodies everywhere, like I'd expected. Alex looked through a door and window across the hall. Hey, look, he said, opening it. I strode across the hall and stepped inside behind him stopping in the doorway. Alex and I both stared at the whiteboard. It must be a science class or something. He glanced around the room and nodded to the periodic table across the back wall. But it was the whiteboard that interested me. The sketch of a virus and its host with words most of which I didn't understand. Scribbled around. Nucleoside. Darwinism. Quasi-species. I lifted a genetic mutation handout left on one of the desks. Reassortment, responsible for major genetic shifts in the history of the influenza virus. Pandemic flu strains are caused by reassortment between different viral strands, avian and human, for example. H1N1 virus, responsible for the swine flu outbreak, was the result of an unusual mix of swine, avian, and human influenza genetic sequences. Ever-changing viral sequences lead to new or revived diseases, as well as natural selection. I'd never been an A student, and science definitely wasn't my strong suit, but Sophie liked it. I folded the handout and slid it into the textbook on the desk. Sophie's going to geek out over this, Alex muttered, and he followed me out the door. I set the textbooks in the hallway to grab on our way out and continued down the hall. Alex and I moved in tandem toward the other end of the school. Alex continued to check the right, and I checked the left. Look, a vending machine, he said. We could take a tree back for everyone. On the way out, I told him, eyeing the walls of an open classroom. Make sure we remember to grab a Milky Way for L, I said absently and stepped inside. Photos of students lined the walls, candid shots of them huddled around lab tables and posing with teachers. There were action shots of hunter green and off-white uniforms with hockey sticks in the air, mid-motion. The entire room was a time capsule, and for the first time I considered what the footprint of our existence would look like in ten or twenty years. Someone had written a production timeline on the whiteboard, and the yearbook was slotted for print this month. I eyed a camera on the teacher's desk, wondering what photos were still on it. Jackson, Alex hissed. I glanced behind me as he walked into the doorway. I found the nurse's office. It looks a little ransacked. I spun around and followed him out into the hall, rifle in my hands, and waited for him to go in. 
Alex was cool and collected as he made a sweep of the room, and I followed in behind him. The room was tiny, large enough only for a cot, a stool, and a cabinet of supplies for the typical fever and sore throat. Wrappers and torn boxes filled the wastebasket. Shelves were disorganized, and a tan blanket made the cot look like someone had slept in it. The supplies weren't as ransacked as I'd expected, but they'd definitely been gone through, and some of them used. Some over-the-counter antacids and anti-inflammatory bottles were open, and a disposable thermometer was out on the counter. The common flu they'd prepared for hadn't been so typical in the end, though. None of this had helped them. Get the first aid kit and the disposable thermometers, I told him, eyeing what was left on the shelves. I grabbed suture scissors, gauze, and a bottle of Advil and put them in my backpack. I smashed open a locked cabinet to find the special and more urgent treatments. Fortunately, none of the kids had chronic ailments or allergies I knew of. But I grabbed the two EpiPens, sample inhalers, and what I thought might be the nurse's pain pills. It wasn't a lot, but it was better than nothing. In all of our commotion, we heard a crash carry down the hallway from somewhere in the building, and Alex and I froze. I listened, hearing nothing more, but it was time to move. Swinging my rifle around to my back, I pulled my Glock from my holster. I nodded for the door, then swept the hallway again. There was a snarl in the distance, and animals. I wondered if Alex's bear spray might actually come in handy as I turned the corner met by a wall of windows that faced a courtyard. The scattered lunch tables were peppered with snow, and a dog's wiry tail wagged as he tore at a mound in the snow. The dog jerked again, catching a brown tweed jacket in its mouth. I held up my hand as Alex came up behind me. As the dog tugged, the body moved into view, and I turned away. I could have scared the scavenging dog away, but there was no point. These people had been dead for months, and their ice capsule was melting. Soon, every animal, both wild and once tamed, would know it. Alex didn't ask questions as we turned and headed back the way we came. Let's gather our things, I told him. We've still got a lot of ground to cover. 34. L. April 11th. The Constructive Web consists of strands that represent pathways of child development. Candlelight flickered across the page as I scrolled through the developmental science book I'd found in the bookcase. Scouring the house for anything and everything that might be useful in understanding what was happening to us, especially after what I'd learned about Sophie. Responsiveness to emotion and a support system determined by a child's capacity for resilience all of which depend on a variability in sequence, synchrony, and developmental range. Some children are more responsive and can process what others cannot. Many children can bounce back because their constructive web is still being developed. I considered the way a rubber band twists and bends under pressure. Then about Bo and Thea, who both survived the same outbreak yet had no symptoms. Sophie had felt nothing from them or Jackson. No strange powers, anyway. Why were they different than us? Why had my own twin with the same DNA died and I hadn't? Broken down even further, why were some of us still alive while others weren't? Even strong, young, healthy people hadn't made it. If we couldn't even answer that, then the rest would be impossible. Could the powers be gender or age-related? Were the lunatics that walked the streets a sign of what might happen to us in time? I didn't feel like I was losing my mind yet, especially knowing I wasn't the only one who was different. I pulled the gloves off my hand and stretched my fingers. Physically, there was nothing wrong with my hands, but I could feel it inside. And if the Coast Guardsman or Thomas or any other crazy son of a bitch, could have done what I could do, I would probably be dead. I closed the book and leaned back in my chair. Sophie and I could do impossible things, but the madmen we'd run into seemed to live on unchecked, 
instinctual human needs, not any type of power. What did Sophie and I have that no one else did? Nothing in an old science book would explain what the hell was going on. Exhausted from thinking about it, I dragged my hands over my face. The warmth of my fingertips against my skin was a pleasant change to the soft leather that had become an extension of me. I stared at my fingertips, seeing what I've always seen. Hands that had snapped thousands of photographs, adjusted shoulders, and fluffed hair. They'd nearly frozen in the snow waiting to capture the perfect sunrise over Harding Icefield. Now, they did otherworldly things, and the idea weighed heavier on me than usual, as it often did when I was alone too long with my thoughts. L? I spun around. Bo stood at the bottom step, his hair mussed from sleep. What is it, bud? I grabbed a blanket from the couch to wrap around him. Bad dream? I knelt down in front of him, careful not to touch his skin as I realized my gloves were on the table. He shook his head. I have to tell you something, he said. You do? After what had happened today, it could have been about anything. About what? It's about Thea. A distant sound caught my ear, and I shot to my feet. It was an engine, a truck, a big one. It rattled and rumbled, much larger than the Tacoma. Bo, I whispered as it drew closer. Go upstairs. Put out the fire and wake the girls. Be quiet, okay? I looked from the door to him. Stay in the room and don't come out. I'll be up in a minute. All remnants of sleep were gone, and fear quivered in his blue eyes. He wanted to protest. I could practically see the words forming on his lips. But he did as I asked and scurried up the stairs. I stared at the front door, afraid to breathe. It was likely the people outside had already seen the smoke from our chimney, but I grasped at a shred of hope they hadn't. Blowing out my candle, I hurried to the window and pulled back the blackout drapes. The night was clear. The moon cast a blue sheen across the snow, and I could make out two human outlines a few buildings down. It most definitely wasn't Jackson and Alex. Both silhouettes were those of men, big men, and they were searching for something. Another man stepped out of the shadows and stood a dozen yards down the street from the house, facing me like he could see me through the window. The familiar heap of dread settled in my stomach. They'd come with malintent. The man's grin spread from ear to ear, just like Donahoe's had at the bus depot. The hair on the back of my arms and neck rose, and a sickening chill shot down my spine. They were crazy. He eyed the house, appraising it, wondering who was inside, looking for a way in, plotting planning. Mind whirling, I grabbed all the coats from the rack and ran upstairs, taking the steps two at a time until I was in my room. My pistol was in my hands in seconds, and I ran down the hall to the kids' room. It smelled of fire smoke, and the three of them were awake. Soph, I said, urgent but quiet. What do they want? She rasped as I shoved the jackets at the kids. I don't know, but I need you to be calm and listen, okay? She nodded warily, her eyes opening wide and saucer-like in the moonlight. You know where the shotgun is. Get it. Load it. I want you to arm yourself and put on your jackets, because we will have to leave. I looked at the three of them, needing them to understand. Grab your bags, and when you have your things and the gun... I want you to barricade yourselves in this room until I come for you. I wasn't sure if Sophie was nodding or shaking. Sophie. I got it. Soph, I said, willing her to hear the gravity in my voice. If something happens to me, you take the kids down, over the balcony, be careful, and take the explorers straight to our meeting place, okay? Jackson will know to look for you there. L, please, listen. 
We'd discussed it all before, but in the moment's urgency, I needed her to focus. Follow the map, just like we've gone over and over. It's imperative, Sophie. It's the only way Alex and Jackson will find you. She nodded again, her eyes glistening, and my throat tightened. On light feet, she ran out of the room for the shotgun, and I hurried to the window, peering out at the road. The man was still standing in the middle of the street, staring at the house. What the hell was he doing? Suddenly, he disappeared into the shadows. I know you're in there, he shouted. I could smell you a mile away. Get your boots on, I told Thea, whirling around. Soph, I bit out as she ran back into the room, gun in hand. Keep that gun fixed on this window and shoot any of them that come into view. I didn't know what they were planning, but a slug to the leg or chest would slow them down enough for me to get a decent shot. Her eyes widened, but she nodded without hesitation. I ran down the hall and descended the stairs, using the kids' terrified whimpers to fortify my resolve to kill the motherfuckers who'd clearly come to taunt us and then do worse. I needed my eyes on them first, if I had any hope of taking them down. I snuck out the back door, quiet and careful, and rounded the house, listening for the approaching sound of footsteps in the snow. It was biting cold out, but I barely noticed as my body felt aflame with adrenaline. The men laughed beside their trucks, as if they didn't care if I knew where they were or if I could hear them. It was likely a trap, and I refused to take the bait. Using the station wagon in the driveway, blanketed in months' worth of snow, and the foliage grown in around it, I hid from view and held my breath to listen. You can go back and tell the others about it, one of them muttered. I could barely make out their outlines through the trees. It wasn't enough to get a shot without having to leave the cover of the station wagon. There are women in there, and children. Mr. Smile stepped out of the shadows again, closed his eyes, and inhaled. I can smell their fear. Yeah, but how many are there? Whispered another. You almost got us killed last time. That old woman was armed. This is different. Mr. Smiles' voice was low as he peered around. There's a weak one, sick maybe, and the children. And the pissed off mother, another bit out. You're going to get us killed, Tommy. Not if you stop them first, Tommy bit out. We're here to practice, so fucking practice. Use your senses and stop being a little bitch. He smacked the man upside the head. Senses? Like powers? My worst fears assembled before me. Insane wielders of inhuman powers, hunting for victims, ready and willing to use them, even on children. But in this scenario, I wasn't helpless. In fact, I was fuming, loathing every crazy asshole left in this world, wanting them to burn. The anger stirred, vehement stoking the flame. I needed the rest of the men to step out of the shadows so Sophie and I could take our shot. How many of them are there? One of the men rasped. I could see pacing shadows through the trees and hear the uncertainty in his voice. Tommy's flunkies were wobbling, and I could use that to my advantage. Tommy shook his head. I don't know. Why don't you come and see? I said as loudly and confidently as I could. We won't hurt you. Tommy's sneer was visible in the moonlight, and his eyes glistened as he searched the outline of the station wagon for me. I wondered why the scent grew stronger. That he could smell me made my skin crawl, and the burn in my veins turned to a boil. If you drop your weapons, we won't kill you, I lied. Tommy held up his hand as he slyly motioned for the others not to move. Then he stepped back into the shadows with them. You promise? He asked, and I could hear the smile in his voice. 
That was one thing I was learning about the crazy survivors. They tended to think they were so smart, but were overzealous, and that left room for error. The people in the bus depot had been the same way, and all it took was a little unexpected disorder for them to lose their footing. Of course I promise. I heard him inhale in an exaggerated manner, like he wanted me to know what he was capable of. You're not like the others, he realized. I wasn't sure what that meant, but I used it to egg them on. Is that why you're hiding in the shadows? Because you're afraid of a woman? I heard the click of a gun magazine as one of the men growled. I'm going to fucking kill her, Tom. I'm going to. You're hiding like little boys because you're scared. You don't know how many of us there are. You don't know what we can do. The fear I smell tells me it's not much, Tommy bit back. Then come closer. How about I shove my pistol in your mouth, bitch, and shut you up, the aggressive one shouted. Get your shit under control, Bill, Tommy ground out. Low voices were pointless on a still night. You hear me? Your strength is no good if you get shot in the fucking head. There was a rustle, and while I couldn't see what they were doing, I didn't care. Strength, smell, whatever their abilities, I wasn't waiting around to find out what they could do. Without hesitation, I aimed through the trees, knowing I'd injured them if nothing else, giving myself time to get closer. There was a creaking of a door like they were pulling something out of the truck, planning something I couldn't see. I needed to make my move, now. Before I could pull the trigger, the shotgun upstairs went off, and I heard a man curse in pain as he fell to the ground. Heart pounding, I crouched and ran around the station wagon, praying I would get a clear shot before one of them did. When I saw one of them stand up, I pulled the trigger the man's body instantly falling to the ground with a thud. I strained to listen over my heartbeat for movement, for noise. One growled in pain on the ground, but I heard no one else. Only two shots, and while two men might be down, there was still one unaccounted for, hiding on the run, crouched in waiting for a decent shot. I squinted into the darkness, pressed against the shadows of the trees lining the yard, hoping for the slightest movement. Another gunshot rang out through the house, and I ran to the back door, not caring who could see me. Sophie! I screamed and fumbled up the steps and inside as quickly as my feet would move. My pistol was raised, and I moved so fast I felt like I was flying. Then the kids screamed. Thea! I shouted again, reaching the landing to find a lifeless man on the floor. Sophie's jacket was hanging off her arm, and her shirt was ripped, but she was okay. I leapt over the body on the floor and into the kid's room. They were crying, huddled in the corner, terrified, but alive. They were alive. Bo held his sister in his arms, both of them shaking as tears streamed down their cheeks. Sophie stood facing the doorway, staring at the man's body. I hesitated. It's okay, Sophie. You saved Bo and Thea. They're okay because of you. I dropped my gun, and with shaking hands, I pulled her into my arms and choked a sob. I could have gotten them all killed. We should have gotten to the car and left, I breathed. The four of us might have been shook up, but the kids wouldn't have had to see another man killed. We should have just left, I repeated. Bo screamed, and Sophie shouted my name, pointing behind me. I turned around as the dead man clamored to his feet, but he hadn't been dead. The gunshot was in his leg. He had my stupidly discarded gun in his hand. You stupid bitch, he seethed, rubbing the back of his head. There was blood on his hand from where he'd hit the wall, I could see it on the pale paint. He glared at Sophie, then at me, limping to a stand. 
Sophie's shotgun was on the floor, reachable, but not without him shooting one of us first. I stepped in front of Sophie instead, anger, terror, and hatred coursing through me like the breath that sucked in and out of my lungs. I am not helpless, I reminded myself. The adrenaline fed every part of me. What the hell do you want? I ground out. You to die, he said, and he aimed the pistol at me. His leg almost gave out on him, but he didn't need both legs to shoot me. No, I told him and shook my head. I outstretched my arms like a protective shield. Next time, make sure I'm dead, he seethed, and I knew what was coming before I heard his finger on the trigger. I could feel it in my bones, the imminent future, and I would not let him hurt us. No, I growled this time. Raw power whirred through my veins, and for the first time in months, I gave in to the incessant heat. A burning energy lit my skin, turning to roiling red flames, and the man's sneer faded. A raging, blinding power enlivened every part of me, and without moving, I reached for the intruder with finger-like flames. They wrapped around his neck, dropping him to the ground as his eyes bulged and he clawed at his neck. Then he began to scream. An indescribable force leached from my every pore as the man's life force flared with desperation. I could feel his energy coursing through me, feeding the fire to blazing. And with his final breath, the inferno was snuffed out. Everything grew dark again, and I dropped to my knees. My chest heaved and I gasped for breath. My molten insides cooled with each pool of crisp air, and my eyes adjusted to the darkness. The man was more than dead. I scorched him nearly to ash, smoke steaming from what remained. L, Bo whined, but I couldn't respond as I tried to find myself again. L, Sophie said close behind me. I peered back at their blurred visage. Are you all right? I croaked. They climbed to their feet to run over, and I shrieked, backing away. Don't, I warned them. Don't touch me. My body had been aflame. Don't touch me, I reiterated, still trying to catch my breath. I stared down at my clothes, realizing they were partially singed and smelled of smoke, but my hands were my normal hands once more. I turned them over and over, and I patted my chest, making sure I was in one piece. Bo was crying behind me while Sophie tried to ease him away. Give Elle some space, bud. I could only hear her remotely, somewhere distant, as I stared at the burnt man's remains, remembering the night I'd killed someone for the first time. This time, I allowed myself to feel gratitude for what I could do, even if I didn't understand it, even if it was dangerous. Gather your things, I said rising shakily to my feet. They have a larger group, and they could be here any second. We need to get out of here. I picked up my pistol and handed Sophie the shotgun. You might need it. We could dissect whatever had happened later. More men would come looking for these ones. I'll be right back. Sophie took a hesitant step toward me. Where are you going? I didn't tell her one man was still alive outside. There was no reason to. He was right, I said as I gripped the railing to the stairs. I should have made sure he was dead. I won't make that mistake again. 35. L. April 11th. I brushed a loose strand of hair from my face, finally feeling the coiled tension in my body ease the further we drove from Slana. I changed my clothes, but my hair was a knotted mess and smelled of burnt cotton, making it difficult to lock the past three hours away somewhere deep in my mind for a little while. At least if more men showed up, we'd be long gone. 
For the first time in my life, I hoped for a snowstorm to cover our tire tracks. I prayed Jackson and Alex would see our note. Jackson hadn't picked up the sat phone when I tried to call him. Now, it was what would happen after they saw the man upstairs that I couldn't get off my mind. Jackson would see what was left of the charred body in the hallway. He could put two and two together and would know I was the one who killed his father. And while he might not fault me for saving myself, he would hate me for lying to him. I hated me. He deserved the truth, and yet I hadn't been able to give that to him. It was self-preservation and selfishness, just as much as it was fear. My gloved hands gripped the wheel, the leather protesting. Succumbing to thoughts of the unknowable future, I continued down the dark highway. The ever-present thing inside me had brought as much horror as it brought protection and peace of mind. Knowing there were others that could do impossible things made driving with the lights on a risk, but it was one I had to take if I would get us to our meeting point in Tetlin safely. In our haste, we'd crammed the Explorer full of what supplies we could and hitched up the trailer only half-loaded. But we had the essentials, which was enough. It had to be. Sophie stared out the window. The car was awash with silence, and I cleared my throat. How are they doing back there? It was the first and only thing anyone had uttered since we'd gotten on the road. Sophie glanced in the back. They're sleeping. Good, but I don't know how they can sleep after what just happened. Remembering Sophie's torn shirt, I cleared my throat. Sophie, I said as carefully as I could. In the past 24 hours, she'd had a breakdown, confessed her biggest secret, killed a man, and I wasn't sure what else. She looked at me. Did he touch you, Soph? She shook her head. I'm fine. That's not what I asked. I knew the look on her face. It was one of shame and disgust. Even if I knew he didn't get far, the thought of his hands on her at all made the bile churning in my stomach creep its way up my throat. I don't think that's what he wanted. But either way, we stopped him. Really, I'm fine, Elle. I promise. That she'd likely seen his intentions when he touched her might have been the worst part of all. Thea stirred in the back seat, and Sophie leaned her head back with a sigh. When I was little, I loved riding in the car. It was soothing. I always fell asleep. Now, not so much. Leaning over, she rifled through her pack and pulled out a bag of sunflower seeds. Want some? They help me keep my mind busy. No, thanks. I glanced in the rearview mirror, relieved to see there was still only darkness behind us and the faint red hue of our taillights. My stomach's in knots. I'd probably just throw it up. Sophie tossed a handful into her mouth and aimed the heater vent at her. I wonder if I'll ever be cold again, I thought aloud. Sophie eyed me a moment, then a slight upward curve formed on her lips. Lucky. I allowed myself a small smile. In a way, I guess she was right. Sophie brought an empty water bottle to her mouth and spit in a few shells. Hey, Elle, he said he could smell us. My jaw ached as I gritted my teeth together. Yeah, he did. He could smell us. That's crazy, right? I mean, if... She leaned her head back against the headrest. If we can do what we can do, and we're not crazy, and he could do what he could do, and he was. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I'm not sure how to tell who's what, fanatical or just plain mad. What else can people do? I mean, how much danger are we really in? Her gaze was adhered to my face, waiting for answers I didn't have. Sophie rolled her shoulders and stared out the windshield. Predator and prey. I glanced at her. What? In nature, there's a balance to everything, an evolution. 
like a moth with large eyes painted on its wings to scare off predators, and frogs with alluring toxic skin. Jackson said we're not the top of the food chain anymore. She popped a few more seeds into her mouth, trying to put the pieces together, but I had little insight to offer. If natural selection reset the scales, those of us left have to find a new balance. You're saying what's happening to us is Mother Nature? The thought hadn't occurred to me. That seems a bit rash. That doesn't mean it's not true. I blinked at her. I feel like evolution takes a bit longer than a couple days of being sick with the flu. Mother Nature can be extreme. Just look at where we live. What matters is that we're not defenseless. If the bad guys can use their powers for evil, we can use ours for good. So, we're not superheroes. No, but we're different, and you saved us tonight. If you hadn't fried that guy, we'd wish we were dead. I gripped the steering wheel more tightly, hating that she had to know it was true. There may be bad guys out there who've become more powerful than they were before, but Mother Nature, or whatever this is, hasn't left us defenseless. Not all of us can do this kind of stuff, I reminded her. So how does that rate in your theory? Some of us are defenseless against superpowers? That seems rigged. I didn't wake up from the fever like this. Maybe it takes time and not everyone knows they have a superpower yet. Soph, can you stop calling it that, please? It's weird. What do you want me to call it? A gift? She said dryly. I shuddered. No, it's not a gift. Then we'll stick with power for now. I sighed, too exhausted to argue. Theoretically, Sophie's points were valid, but the how of it all was still a mystery. What does that mean for you? Your superpower is to be miserable by seeing and feeling people's memories? I guess, she grumbled. I didn't want to criticize her for something completely out of her control. But if someone less obvious and sinister than Mr. Smiles had bad intentions, she wouldn't know until he already had his hands on her. I'm just trying to understand, Sophie whispered, her voice deflated to utter exhaustion. I know, Sophie. I'm sorry. I'd like to think I'm superhuman and can save the world, but it doesn't work that way. What I can do is dangerous. I am dangerous. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Sophie didn't argue further and turned her attention back out the window. Jackson will freak when he finds out what happened, she muttered. I rested my elbow on the door and rubbed my temple. Yes, he will. And that was putting it lightly. Not because of the bodies, she clarified. He will think he failed us. He'll blame himself. What? No. He might worry for a minute, but he'll be occupied with other feelings. Trust me. You don't know him like I do. The certainty in her voice gave me pause, and I glanced at her. He couldn't save his wife and child, and he'll feel like he failed us, too. The last thing I wanted was Jackson to bear the weight of guilt for something completely out of his control. But we're fine, I told her, like she could somehow channel that to Jackson. He'll see our note, and he'll know we're fine. Sophie nodded slightly, probably just to make me feel better, but she said nothing else. I peered quickly back at the kids, heads lobbed to the side, faces smushed with sleep. They're going to need so much therapy, I muttered. Sophie chuckled even if it was true. I thought about Dr. Rothman. I used to know a pretty good therapist, I said, but Sophie probably knew that already. I'm sorry you have to know everything, I told her. My baggage was heavy and drowning. I couldn't imagine carrying the weight of everyone else's baggage, too. Not everything, but yeah, I know about her. Sorry. I reached for Sophie's hand, an instinctive offer of comfort, 
and she didn't shy away when I clasped my hand over hers. Don't be sorry about what you can do, Soph. I wouldn't wish my bullshit on anyone. I'm sorry you have to feel the things you do. I honestly can't imagine. Sophie stared at my hand. Sorry. I tried to pull away, but she clasped her other hand on top of it. It's okay. When I glanced at her, she smiled. It's not all bad. I see the good stuff, too. It's just harder to remember sometimes. I nodded and pulled my hand away. It's nice to have someone like you, to know how much you care. The road blurred as my eyes began to shimmer. I would do anything for you, Soph. I know, and Dr. Rothman would be really proud of you. I blinked, licking my lips. I imagined Dr. Rothman would tell me I'd finally found my family, even if it had been in the most impossible sort of way. Thank you. I wiped my eyes and cleared my throat. Sophie spat her seeds into the bottle, both of us ready for a change in subject. Let's see if there's a new transmission from Hartley, she said, and switched on the radio. She scanned the static until it stopped at a familiar voice. I rolled my eyes, following the bend in the road. They're calling them safe zones, said Mr. Conspiracy Theory over the radio. I swear, this guy is haunting me. Look out, Sophie screamed as three caribou ran out of the tree line and onto the highway. I slammed on the brakes and the explorer swerved. My arm flew out to cover Sophie as the car collided into one of them. The car crunched and rolled, and everything was silent. Well, you made it through the first part of The Darkest Winter, Elle and Jackson's adventure. I hope you enjoyed the ride, but it definitely is not over. So. The link for part two should be in the description. And don't forget, it's a seven book series. Make sure you subscribe so you get notifications when the rest of the books are posted. Without further ado, I'll see you over there.